Robles, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Great, thank you. Spanish interpreter, can you hear me? Hi, good morning. This is a Spanish interpreter. Sound check is good. Quick question: Does my voice sound low, or is it um, high? Good volume. Good, good volume. Thank you. All right, thank you.
Good morning, Supervisor Kuehl. Can you hear me? Good morning. I can hear you just fine. Great. Can you hear, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. <laughs> All right, good. Good morning, birthday girl. I just sent you a text on your personal phone. Would you take a peek at it for me? I certainly can. Let me look at my personal phone. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Sheila. Happy birthday to you. Thank now that's love if I sing, because I don't sing. Well, that was pretty good, KB, considering. <laughs> and of course, tomorrow is the big day. And um, it's funny to have uh, all these birthdays, you know, with COVID, uh, because it's kind of like, I always had like giant parties and, you know, ice Coffee cream and ice cream. cream. Yep. Yeah. Out on the balcony or sometimes yep. churros and hot chocolate. Remember? Yep. Oh, no. It was, yeah. I hope I can do that one more time before we, before I leave. You're not leaving. I'm leaving. Well, right. Happy birthday, Sheila. Felicidades. Feliz Thank cumpleaños. <laughs> Thank you so I, much. Yeah. Or do I have to sing? Estas son las mañanitas que cantaba <laughs> Rey David. A las muchachas bonitas te lo cantamos a ti. That's all I know. <laughs> I'm impressed. That was pretty good. Was pretty good. <laughs> Thank right. you so much. You guys are really so no. I just, this is really fun. Who thought a board meeting was fun? Are you, no? <laughs> Certain portions are. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> what a wonderful way to start the board meeting by hearing the fabulous birthday song that everyone loves to hear at least once a year. Again, Supervisor, happy birthday. So good morning, everyone. Welcome to the regularly scheduled meeting of the LA County Board of Supervisors, which is being held remotely. Today is Tuesday, February 8th, 2022. I'll now take roll call to confirm attendance. Everybody ready? Supervisor Solis. Present. Supervisor Kuhl. Here. Supervisor Hahn. Here. Supervisor Barger. Here. Deja Davenport, Chief Executive Officer. Present. Rodrigo Castro Silva, County Council. Here. Celia Zavala, Executive Officer of the Board. Here. Supervisor Hahn, would you do us the honors by leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Yes. Thank Please you. Please stand if you're able. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all, someday. Thank you very much. As indicated on the posted agenda, we'll be taking telephonic public comments during today's meeting. The Executive Office of the Board received over 4,600 written public comments 
for today's meeting, and as those written comments were received, all of them were available to the supervisors for their consideration, consistent with the Brown Act requirements. We'll continue to receive written public comments throughout the meeting, which will become part of the official record. Executive Officer, please call the agenda. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the board. Today's agenda will begin on page two, set matters one and two. Set matter one is a report by the Chief Executive Officer and the appropriate department heads as necessary on the status of the American Rescue Plan funding and consideration of necessary actions. Set matter two is a discussion and consideration of necessary action on the public health order related to COVID-19 and the status of COVID-19 vaccine. These items will be held for discussion. On page three, consent calendar, Board of Supervisors, items three through 21. On items five and six, Supervisor Hahn requests that these items be held. On item seven, this includes a revision as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On item nine and 10, Supervisor Solis requests that these items be held. On items 12 through 16, Supervisor Mitchell would like to revise these motions to find that the crimes committed were heinous and therefore increase the reward for each item to 20,000. On item 17, Supervisor Kuehl requests that this item be held. On item 18, Supervisor Kuehl requests that this item be held. Also, this includes a revision as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On page 14, administrative matters, items 22 through 71. On item 22, the Chief Executive Officer requests that this item be continued to April 5th, 2022, as indicated on the posted agenda. On item 31, County Council requests that this item be continued to April 5th, 2022, as indicated on the posted agenda. On item 37, Supervisor Mitchell requests that this item be continued one week to February 15th, 2022. On item 43, Supervisor Mitchell requests that this item be continued to March 15th, 2022. On item 58, Supervisor Kill requests that this item be held. Um, I'm going to do a correction. Supervisor Hahn is holding items four and five and not six. On page- Thank you, I was going to offer that correction. Thank you. On page 44, this includes miscellaneous additions to the agenda that were posted more than 72 hours in advance of the meeting as indicated on the supplemental agenda. On item 69C, Supervisor Mitchell requests that this item be held. On page 45, ordinance for introductions, items 72 and 73. On page 46, special district agenda. This is the agenda for the Los Angeles County Development Authority. On item 7D is an addition as indicated on the supplemental agenda. The requests for continuances through 7D are before you. Thank you very much. Moved by Supervisor Kuehl, seconded by Supervisor Hahn to approve these items. Such will be the order. That completes the reading of the agenda, Madam Chair. Next, we will hear from Sheriff Bill Nueva, who has requested time to address the board with regard to motion, excuse me, item 18. Good morning, Sheriff Bill Nueva. You will have three minutes. Please begin, sir. Uh, good morning, Supervisor Mitchell. Item number 18 is going to be a death blow to public safety in Los Angeles County. Right now, we are facing 897 sworn vacancies, 893 professional staff vacancies as of April 1st, assuming no further people will call um, sign up for retirement. We're already at impairments of over 1,500 personnel due to long-term IODs and so forth. And uh, right now we've lifted the cap on overtime so each employee can work, not just 96. Now we've raised it up to 120 hours of overtime a month, which is an astronomically high level. We can now, we've had to lift the cap on working uh, consecutive days off and, and uh, regular days off. So now an employee can work 30 days. And I say can is that we're forcing employees to work these days. And that is with our current vacancies. And the imposing of item number 18 would mean a loss of 4,000 sworn staff members on the department alone. And that would be just a death blow to public safety in LA County. 
We have uh, fully vaccinated, we have 9,881, and in the last 30 days, 342 tested positive for 3.46% positivity rate. We have 5,766 not vaccinated, and we had 221 test positive for a 3.83% vaccination rate or a positivity rate. So your your motion is going to seek to basically uh, cause us to uh, actually lose 4,000 employees for a grand total of 0.4% improvement in uh, positivity rate is not exactly a benefit to public safety. We're coming off two years of a historically high 94% increase in homicide rate. 64% increase in grand theft auto. And this is just not, it's not sustainable. The current situation is not sustainable. The hiring freeze is not sustainable. And this is really, it's, it almost amounts to a suicide pact, which if you care to join it, I think you should leave public safety out of it and leave that to the other county departments. But I have to speak on behalf of the community and on behalf of the men and women of the sheriff's department. and. I'll let you know this is ill-advised, illogical, and probably in the long run, illegal. And uh, by the time you figure out the legality of it, we're gonna be past the pandemic, which will make the result irrelevant. So this is gonna be your choice. And uh, I just urge you to uh, de-escalate and dial back the rhetoric and let's find uh, some common ground, testing or vaccination. And we're doing that right now, thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate your uh, calling in. And again, for members of the public, um, item 18 will be held and we'll have a presentation on it later uh, in today's meeting. Thank you very much. We will now take public comment for all agenda items. Executive officer, please read the call in information that was also provided on the agenda and explain the speaking rules to those members of the public who are calling in to address the board. As indicated on the agenda, members of the public wishing to offer public comment should call 877-336-4437 and use participant code number 136-6786. To repeat, please call 877-336-4437 and use participant code number 136-6786. Do not call that number if you only want to listen to the meeting. To listen only, please call 877-873-8017 and follow the instruction. To members of the public calling in, when it's your turn to speak, please state your name and which agenda items you wish to speak on. We will allocate 90 minutes for public comment on all the items posted on today's agenda. You will have one minute to speak on one agenda item or two minutes to speak on two or more agenda items. In addition, those who would like to address the board with general public comment will be provided one additional minute for a maximum total up to three minutes. We will continue to accept all written comments that come in during the meeting, which will become part of the record. When speaking on the agenda items, you must be on topic. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. If you're not speaking on topic, or if we cannot tell if you're speaking on an agenda item, you will get one warning from county council or the chair. If you do not immediately or clearly get on topic, or if you stray off topic again, you will forfeit the rest of your time, and the chair will move to the next speaker. Please note, if you're also listening to the board meeting on a computer or speaker phone, you will need to turn down the volume on those devices as soon as the moderator calls on you. If you do not turn down the volume, there will be an echo. Moderator, may we have the first speaker, please? As a reminder, to address the board, if you have not already done so, please press one then zero at this time. Do not press one and zero a second time or you will be removed from the queue. We will now hear the Spanish interpretation of this reminder. Como recordatorio, para dirigirse a la Junta, si aún no lo ha hecho, presione 1 luego 0 en este momento. No presione 1 y 0 por segunda vez o será eliminado de la fila. Gracias. Thank you. May we have the first speaker, please? Our first participant is Andres Kwan. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. 
Under this Kwan ACLU speaking to items 1864 in general public comments. Uh, on a personal note, I was not expecting to hear uh, Supervisor Solis in Las Mañanitas this morning. Uh, it, it made my day. Uh, happy birthday, Supervisor Q. You inspire so many of us to stand strong uh, for civil liberties. Um, esteemed supervisors, we are facing crisis yet again under Sheriff Villanueva, whom we at the ACU of Southern California have deemed a single greatest threat to our civil liberties here in LA County. Uh, from his repeated violations of law and complete obstruction of oversight, and a special police unit intended to intimidate and harass oversight officials, to the scores of deputy gang violence and that he has enabled, and the dramatic increase in deputy shootings and record level deaths in the jails under his watch, we have the Trump of Los Angeles. In 2021, we witnessed death rates in the jails of at least one person dying every week. More than 90 people died in the jails in 2020 and 2021. On deputy gangs, Villanueva has gone from denying the existence of deputy gangs to claiming that they are harmless fraternities and then adopting a policy that is not only meaningless but does not comply with new state law, all the while defying lawful subpoenas and violating laws and transparency and oversight. And now related to item 18, his refusal to follow the county's vaccine mandate is yet another, yet another one of his little insurrections, behaving as if it's above the law. But we firmly believe and assume you do so too, that no sheriff is above the law, not the current sheriff or whoever comes next. And we must, we must act now. What we really need is significant structural change. Supervisors, the buck stops at you. Pursuant to state law, this board has an independent duty to supervise the sheriff. And we cannot wait for the attorney general to seek a consent decree, which will still be limited. You can do more. And in fact, yesterday, ACU Isoka was a proud member of a coalition of more than 70 community organizations and labor unions. And we're urging this board to propose to the voters a charter amendment that will strengthen sheriff accountability and create a common sense structure of checks and balances. The last time the board brought a charter amendment directly relating to the sheriff or the sheriff's department was 20 years ago. A generation later, it is past time for the board to bring the voters a charter amendment proposal that would maximize the power of civilian oversight over the paramilitary office of the sheriff. Uh, and this proposal, this proposal is not only not undemocratic, it actually strengthens democratic accountability. For one, uh, the US Congress has a duty and authority to impeach and remove an elected president when necessary. Even more so should the civilian board have the power to impeach and remove an elected sheriff, a paramilitary official akin to an elected general. Uh, and this is not just for the current sheriff, but for sheriffs to come, uh, if don't elect me system of sheriff accountability every four years has proven wholly inadequate and a recall election is virtually impossible in counties county as large as LA County. So uh, we're urging you uh, to immediately propose to the voters a charter amendment. We've submitted a letter to, uh, to detail what we propose. Uh, we have the Trump of Los Angeles. We have a crisis underway. We all together need to check. Excuse me, your time has expired. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next speaker will come from the line of Daniel Gonzalez. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hi there, my name is Daniel Gonzalez and I will be speaking on agenda item 69A. Uh, I'm a policy advocate and community organizer at the Los Angeles LGBT Center. And I want to say I'm very appreciative of the Board of Supervisors report for the removal of the ban that prevents many gay and bisexual men from donating blood. At this time, there's currently a severe blood shortage across the nation, which is worse than the nation has ever seen before. And we have a willing population looking to donate. I support the Board of Supervisors removal of this discriminatory ban. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant will be Candace Zena. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hello, can you hear me? Can please begin. Hello, are you able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please begin. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm commenting on number two, specifically for my daughter. She is at LAUSD and she has been wearing a mask for this entire year, seven hours a day. I'm giving you a best case scenario for a kid who's mentally and physically strong and healthy, yet she comes home with a tick. Every minute she's blowing air out of her nose. She has rashes all over her face where the mask is. She comes home out of school, walks a block and a half to meet me, 
and she still has her mask on. She's not taking that opportunity to take it off to breathe. This is her one chance after seven hours. She's alone. She's allowed to take it off. But she's programmed to keep the mask on. Her cognitive ability to realize that she is alone and she's not a threat to anyone is not processed through her. She can't take the mask off to breathe because she thinks she has to keep it on. She's not afraid she's going to get COVID. She's healthy. She's done everything she's supposed to do. This is not a childhood disease. We cannot continue to keep our children masked. Outside, when she's doing sports at school, she can't breathe. She tells me, she me your time has expired. She can't find May we have the next speaker, please? Lunch because she's yelled at if she takes her mask off and then doesn't put it right back on after she's done drinking or eating. She is a healthy child, and this is the best case scenario for kids like her. Excuse me, your time has expired. May we have the next speaker, please? And everything. Yet still. Thank you. Yes, one moment, please. You. We need to end it, please. I'm begging you. Thank you. Our next participant will come from the line of N.J. King. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning and happy birthday, Supervisor Cool. This is MJ King and I'm a resident of District 1, speaking at agenda items 1164 and general public comment, please. <clears throat> I strongly support item 11. The goal of GI is to supplement, not replace access to existing welfare programs. For item 64, I strongly oppose it. In July of 2020, the board voted unanimously to increase the transparency and accountability of the LASD, including removing LASD patrol from county parks in October of 2020. That same month, the Sheriff's Civilian Oversight Commission voted unanimously to demand sheriffs be in the way of his resign resignation. And in May of 2021, the board voted unanimously to protect surviving families from retaliation and harassment by the Sheriff's Department. The board is well aware that we need to divert funding out of the Sheriff's Department rather than emboldening this toxic department with more funding to harm our communities. What the Sheriff's Department is asking for is two military grade tanks that together cost over a million dollars. No municipal department needs an armored vehicle. This is excessive and would be a huge waste of county resources. The board must not approve these requests. We must acknowledge the county's already existing disparities in budget priorities. I urge the board officers to think about a million, what could a million dollars change the life of a community-based organization? Throwing another million at the Sheriff's Department who already receives over three billion a year to purchase unnecessary military vehicles is a misuse of county funds. The Sheriff's Department must account for their mismanagement of funds before receiving any more funding for equipment. For, uh, for general public comment, two things. First, I support an LA County charter amendment to keep the sheriff accountable. Specifically, the board should propose to the voters a charter amendment that will, one, establish an impeachment process to allow, allow removal of the sheriff for serious misconduct, two, reinforce the board's policy making authority over the sheriff's department, and three, establish permanent and independent civilian oversight. Second, I'd like you to, ur I would, I urge you to move forward with measure, measure J funding. All this talk about the sheriff and their over $3 million budget, and we can't get 300, I'm sorry, um, three million, three, geez, the budget is so huge, it trips me up in my words. We can't get 300 million working for the resources that this very board has acknowledged our community so desperately need. The community was heavily engaged in over dozens of planning meetings last year, and you only passed 187 million for the first year. I really urge you to uh, move forward to fully fund the 10% that the voters that we voted for and urge the CEO to thoughtfully engage our community uh, to make to fully fund these measures. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next speaker will come from the line of Roy Humphreys. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. I'll be on items 9, 11, 31, 52 in general public comment. And number nine, repurposing of the USC General Hospital for housing and mixed use. Uh, but my purpose. Uh, my proposal for the repurposing of the men's jails has fallen on deaf ears, a profound waste. 11, suspension of the general requirement for a guaranteed income. Transients will love that one. Uh, annual litigation costs. The Me Too group would uh, terminally bankrupt uh, the county and the state of California if all jail and prison sexual assaults were compensated. 52, thank uh, 
Supervisor Hahn and Solis uh, for excluding Roland Heights from the traffic safety and perpetuating the ghettofication of my community. You're the best. A general comment of the your evaluation of the department head should include the sacking of uh, regional planning for refusal to force Zoom on demand links for the uh, community standards district meeting, which as a matter of fact of a duty and inclusion and bring transportation pain uh, to Roland Heights a la ghetto style. The county roads department on Baldwin Park has taken is taking one year to do a six month project on uh, Otterbein. And uh, Supervisor Solis ring doorbell public uh, safety response is unique in a $72 billion budget excess environment. But what the heck, we have a million dollar dog park. What, what's to ask for? And again, you failed to take action with the state and so forth to get the separation of uh, the jails from the uh, county sheriff's department. And you failed to come forth with a, a camp Pain to establish transient campsites to get the uh, the gentrification out of Roland Heights and, and get these transients off of our commercial properties. Uh, and you can see Deputy Denver's little video on my YouTube channel to give you a little insight on that. Okay, and we all realize that the Sheriff's Department uh, is in need of a remake, but hey, we put up with this and failed to deal with it for decades. Thank you. You. Next speaker, please. Our next speaker will come from the line of Tim Hepborn. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you will address on general public comment. You may begin. I will be addressing on general public comment regarding the DJJ Secure Youth Final uh, Home. And also I wanna thank, uh, good morning to uh, Chair Mitchell and to supervisors and happy birthday, Sheila Kuehl, supervisor. And uh, I would respectfully ask that we remove Applebaugh page from consideration for the SYTF secure youth facility and instead use the uh, Barry J. Nidor and also Kilpatrick as they are already housed there. When our community was faced with the windstorms and damages, Applebaugh page was, were evacuated and put into uh, Barry J. Nidor. So obviously the, uh, we have this, the facilities there, obviously need money to repurpose it and make it a better facility and make it like the Kilpatrick LA model. I thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant from the line of Roxanne Hogue. He states the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning and happy birthday um, to the birthday girl. Uh, Yo puedo uh, cantar las mañanitas, but it's not going to be good, so I won't. Um, I'm an immigrant a mother of four, and I'm speaking on items, set item two, opposing item 18, and a general public comment. Um, I wanna thank Supervisor Barger for raising a very important question that has occurred to parents of children all across LA County in public and private school for the past year and a half during which their young lives have been disrupted, destroyed, they're living through despair. As the previous caller stated, even kids that should be quote unquote resilient or thriving are not getting the best out of a schooling experience. My kids are masked for 47 hours a week. That's including dancing on point outdoors. It not only makes no sense in a time when natural immunity vaccines are available and Omicron as everyone is making the pivot now um, has shown to be mild and we all know that COVID is age stratified and that children have never been at risk. These all need to end. It is highly discriminatory. Black and brown children are suffering the most. The problems and challenges we're all facing are due to the pandemic response, not actual medical issues. Barbara Ferrer, PhD, has been a disaster at the head of LA Public Health and it is far beyond time to listen to her. We need to be at least in line with the California state um, guidelines. In terms of item 18, it is unconscionable on American and I would dare say anti um, against uh, against everything we hold dare to fire people for not for and not respect their personal bodily autonomy. 
many of our first responders and the people who are going to be fired actually are immune to COVID because they were there on the front lines. They got sick. Um, I'm not anti-mask or, or anti-vaccine. I am pro-children. I'm pro-freedom. I'm pro-faces. I'm pro-smiles. I'm pro-oxygen. Last thing I just want to say, adding a word to the Pledge of Allegiance is beneath the dignity of this office. I took an oath to the Constitution of the United States of America, and I pledged allegiance to this country when I became a citizen legally. And I have to say that it is disgusting to say liberty and justice for all. Oh, one caveat, it would be great if our children who do not have a union representing them could get liberty and justice today by removing the public health order that is hurting so many lives. Thank you, happy birthday, and may you all do what's right for the people of Los Angeles. Thank you. Next speaker, please. May we have the next speaker, please? As a reminder to address the board, if you have not already done so, please press one then zero at this time. Now press one and zero a second time or you'll be removed from the queue. We will now hear the Spanish interpretation of this reminder. Como recordatorio, para dirigirse a la junta, si aún no lo ha hecho, presione uno luego cero en este momento. No presione uno luego cero por segunda vez o será eliminado de la fila. Gracias. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant will come from the line of Brian Smith. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Uh, yes, good morning. Uh, I was going to speak on set matter two and 18 and just piggyback on and general public as well. So to piggyback on what the uh, last speaker just spoke on, um, this, this, these orders that have been implemented across the Los Angeles County employees and general public is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, the kids, number one, thank you, Barger, for speaking up and starting to move in the direction of getting uh, the mask off our children and getting these mandates off our children. That's, that should be number one, because we should be leading by an example. And you have kids all around this county that are continuing to stand up and beginning to speak out and step out with their masks off and being suspended, risking getting suspended and messing up their school record so that they won't have to be... Uh, compelled to continue this madness. So that needs to stop, number one. Number two, with the ever-changing environment of COVID, we've obviously seen, again, piggyback on the last comment, that the, the Omicron variant is affecting everybody, the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. You, we have people that are double, triple back, and some might maybe even get quadruple back, and they're still catching it, and they're still getting sick. That makes your uh, vaccine policy completely obsolete. The vaccine policy originally stated that it was set up the way that it was so that those who chose not to be vaccinated were, were viewed as a danger to the workforce and the public that they encountered. However, if, they can, if the vaccinated can still get sick, then now everybody is still that danger. So everybody should either be required to test or nobody should be required to test. The questions you guys need to start asking yourself is when will this end? This is a power grab on behalf of all of you that sit in these ivory towers. Jewel, I have no doubt that somebody will catch you on camera later today celebrating your birthday in an unmasked environment around a bunch of unmasked people just like it happened the last time you extended these orders. This stuff needs to stop now. So you guys are being put on notice now, the public. Excuse me, your time uh, has expired. May we have the next speaker, please? And they will begin to file lawsuits against all the powers. Thank you. Our next participant will come from the line of Carrie Mackinson. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hello. Thank you for your time. I'm speaking on set matter number two. I am a mom and I am a clinical psychologist licensed in the state of California. As helpless as it sounds, I beg all of you women to drop the mask mandate at our children's school. I do feel helpless as a mom. My heart aches and my anger grows. As a psychologist, I feel afraid for our children's future. 
I'm not sure how much you know about neurobiology, specifically the brain's development for empathy. Masking our children is detrimental to the development of empathy for others. Motor neurons and the prefrontal cortex are responsible for an empathetic response. When our children don't see facial expressions, and I'm not just talking about smiles, I'm talking about sorrow, hurt, embarrassment, their motor neurons do not fire. In the Middle East, excuse me, your time has expired. May we have the next speaker, please? Cover their face in order to stop the empathy towards them. Yeah, our next participant is going to come from the line of Olga Nagel. These states regular agenda items you're addressing today, and whether you'll address on general public comment, you may begin. Good morning. I'm calling regarding two and regarding 18. <clears throat> regarding two, I think it's so wrong to have these children masked. I do not send, my daughter does not send my grandchildren to school for the same reason. I am so against it. It's inhumane and it, it has to end. Also, I'm 18. Um, as you know, over the past two and a half, two plus years, we have learned so much about COVID and we are at a period where we should focus more on therapeutics and encouraging people to be more healthy instead of forcing these vaccines on people. Um, vaccines that we don't know what the long-term effect is gonna be on our bodies. Uh, it is very wrong and I say sad um, for you all to be so giddy this morning dealing with these issues is just very disturbing. And I just want to say the last thing is um, only God, only God can decide the fate of these uh, hardworking people. We are not God. We are not. Even you, that you're in that high position and you feel that power, you're not. Thank you. Thank you. May we have the next speaker? Vanessa. Our next participant come from Vanessa and Anthony Estrada. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment, you may begin. Yes, I'm addressing item number 18. Uh, we are strongly oppose the motion by Supervisor Sheila Keel to submit amendments to the civil service rules to discipline the county employees who would refuse to take the, the, the COVID shot. We strongly feel that the board should respect employees' personal freedoms and that any discipline measures against them would endanger public safety. We very much concur with what Sheriff Villanueva shared in his testimony. It is a very concerning what is happening in the city of Los Angeles with safety and, and the county throughout LA County and to further remove funds for uh, uh, funding officers would very much endanger our city, much more than it already is, and our county, County of Los Angeles. Please look at the John Hopkins report that came out speaking about the truth of the mandate, and please look at that as a consideration before a decision is made. Thank you for hearing my comments. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant will be Gen Genevieve Clavrell. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Yes, good morning. This is Dr. Geneviève Clavrel. I'm going to speak to item uh, 2, 20, and 18. <clears throat> I am very concerned when a lot of the research coming out showing that lockdown is not effective or very little effective when the state of California is going to release some of the mask, uh, you know, uh, worry, wearing on, <clears throat> why any county decide to not follow even the state guidance? I am appalled. It's time we reopen. I mean, we, you cannot stay closed forever. 
And it's very evident right now that many people suffer because of that. <clears throat> I am, this needs to change. You need to wake up and you need to make sure that people do not suffer anymore. The economy does not suffer anymore. It's time to go back to daily meeting. It's back to reopen. And please follow the guidance of science and not political desire. And happy birthday for you, Silver Fuel. Anyway, I hope you have a good week. I hope that you start to do the right thing. And I hope that you resist some of those draconian measures. Bye. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant will be Tracy Hauser. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment, you may begin. Good morning. Thank you uh, all of you for the opportunity for all of us to be able to speak what we, so many of us have been frustrated. I'll be speaking on, um, commenting on item two and 18. Um, I'm the mother of four, grandmother of seven and a small local business owner in the city of Santa Clarita. And number one and first and foremost is masking the children. And I, I'm just gonna echo what everyone else has said. It, it needs to stop. This is a ridiculous thing that has happened. The, um, and I also wanted to echo what uh, Sheriff Novella said. Um, my son is also a fireman and they face a lot worse danger than what this has all been. Um, and as small business owners, you know, shutting down the restaurant has done irreparable damage. And what it's doing now is making people that are reasonably thinking people extremely suspicious of our leaders. And, you know, the Nuremberg Code, you know, Nazi Germany was not so far away. And as the rhetoric keeps going, them and othering people where you're getting people if you're vaccinated or not vaccinated families having fights over such a silly thing it, it it feels like there's a deeper bigger agenda going on and i feel that that's what these voices are all trying to tell you we wonder how how many of our politicians have sold out to the big industries and big pharma we've given big pharma free license to experiment on the american people and now they're going after our kids. And this is what you're hearing. You're hearing the anger and the frustration of people are gonna draw the line at the children. And let me tell you, people that are vaccinated are drawing the line at the children. So please show some reason and get the, this needs to stop. We're losing people out of California at a mass pace because they're not gonna vax their kids. I appreciate this opportunity. And I, again, I don't have any ill will to our leaders. I just question now the thoughts behind your why time has expired. Decisions. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next speaker will come from the line of Lisa Ramirez. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment, you may begin. Good morning, thank you for taking my call. I am addressing a general public comment. I'm speaking against agenda number 18. And I wanted to let you know that as a person of color, I am skeptical of any medical procedure being forced upon me. Yeah, you take that and the risk of myocarditis with these vaccines and you can understand our view against forced vaccinations. We have all prayed to God Almighty and he stands with us. And we hope he enlightens the Board of Supervisors. I am a licensed, unvaxxed, registered nurse at a large healthcare facility in the County of Los Angeles. Several triple vax and at, at our large facility got and spread COVID to one another, all while taking care of patients. I hope you guys really take all of this into consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next speaker will come from the line of Jim Cunningham. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment, you may begin. Uh, good morning, uh, supervisors. Um, I'll be speaking on item number 18. Um, I am uh, attorney for the Los Angeles County Peace Officers uh, Association, POPA. 
Uh, we represent over 6,000 of our county's bravest uh, and most dedicated employees who 24 hours a day, seven days a week are serving this great community, citizens of this great uh, county. And we stand in strong opposition to any changes in the civil service rules, which are, which are already extremely robust in terms of discipline and disciplinary appeals, any changes that would have a direct impact on our employees. There has to be other tools and other uh, available avenues to address concerns that the Board of Supervisors may have with the establishment or with the Sheriff's Department. But to punish the Sheriff's employees by a significant change in the charter, uh, we would submit is not only potentially illegal uh, and may run afoul of the state constitution and the Peace Officer Bill of Rights, but it'll also be incredibly disruptive, disruptive to the very men and women that you're counting on a day in and day out, overtime, loss of vacations, all of the impact that the employees have already suffered. Excuse me, um, your time has no expired. May we have the next event. speaker, please? Our next speaker will come from the line of Paul Scrivano. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Thank you, Paul Scrivano. I will comment on two and 18 and general public comment. Uh, on two, very simply for her arrogance, overreach, and mishandling, Barbara Ferrer should be fired immediately. On 18, I say God bless Sheriff Villanueva. These men and women that are in fear of losing their jobs are the strongest and fittest people in our county. Vax or no vax, it's obvious that it does not matter that you'll catch or transmit COVID. It's a very weak strain right now. We currently live in a zoo without walls on the streets of Los Angeles. Flailing, convulsing, angry people roam the streets. My shopping centers have been broken into 10 times since August, and I've been assaulted multiple times trying to keep, keep these people off of my shopping centers. This cannot go on. This crime wave is ridiculous. Firing these people, firing these deputies, defunding as Sheila Kuehl continues to do, uh, it's, no sh it's no shock that she brought this recommendation. On, pub on general public comment, for context as to why Sheila Kuehl loves crime, hates the sheriffs. In April of 2018, she came into the city of Calabasas and spent $3 million from her discretionary funds to put lighting on about a half a mile's worth of the most vile, violent gang, graffiti, and tags underneath the 101 freeway. She said, she stated in the acorn, we kept the graffiti artwork in the tunnels because that's historic. The LA County Code 13.12.090 says the supervisors deem graffiti to be a nuisance subject to abatement because of its deleterious and detrimental effect on the county and leads to more violent crimes. Sheila Kuehl should step down immediately. We don't need to wait till November. I will run for supervisor in November, and I will change this county around. Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next speaker will come from the line of Andre Zimdek. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today, and whether you'll address on general public comment, you may begin. Yes, hi, good morning, supervisors, and happy birthday. My name is Andre Zimdek, and this is general public comment also. I'm calling, representing all the homeowners up here at Fernand Falls. We've been landlocked here and trapped in our homes with no vehicular access uh, since the last rainstorm washed out our only way in and out. And uh, up to this point, it really hasn't been an issue, but uh, now it's starting to be a crisis. Mom's already missed two doctor's appointments or has an eye infection. I've got no way to get her to the doctor to get to my car. I have to walk a quarter mile down a hill over a bridge, a creek, and up another hill, which is fine for me. I'm 65 and still relatively young, but mom's 97. I can't put her on my back and do all this. Now, I'm not just here to complain. I have a solution. So it's, uh, there is another way out to the west. It goes over the HOA private streets, which we're not allowed to drive due to a 1999 agreement between the county and the, and the homeowners on the HOA. The, the county can come in with your lawyers tomorrow, and we need this done now. We're in a crisis mode. We can't feed our animals. My mother can't get uh, medical help. God forbid she dies because she can't get medical care. The county can bring a lawyer in. Excuse me, your time has expired. May we have the next speaker, please? 
Our next speaker will come from the line of Kathy Ledgerwood. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Yes, good morning. I'm speaking on agenda number 18 and general public comment. Good morning, Chair Mitchell and Board of Supervisors and Council members. This uh, motion number 18 is complete overreach to our Sheriff's Department. We the people voted for our sheriff and his autonomy as director of his department. The sheriff's department has autonomy since he is elected by the people. Under the laws of the Constitution of the United States and under the California Constitution, the sheriff operates the sheriff's department. This motion attempted by the Board of Supervisors is illegal. In addition, I would request you fully fund the sheriff's budget and remove the hiring freeze. And finally, our bodies are our own. Again, overreach to fire county employees who have chosen not to comply with the vaccination violates our freedom within the Constitution and of our Bill of Rights. Many of these employees have had COVID and have natural immunity, which the CDC as at this point deemed 20 months of immunity. It's only 20 months because that's all the time that they have uh, looked at it. And let me remind one final thing. The EUA authorization is not an FDA approved vaccine. And so at this point to require individuals to put a EUA vaccine into people is totally illegal and against our Bill of Rights. Thank you for your time and have a great day. Thank you. Next speaker, please. One moment, please. Our next speaker will come from the line of Brenda Villanova. Please state the regular agenda items you wish to address today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to address item 69A. First of all, good morning. My name is Brenda Vinova and I am a health policy advocate and community organizer at the Los Angeles LGBT Center. I'm extremely appreciative of the Board of Supervisors support for the removal of the ban that prevents many gay and bisexual men from becoming blood donors. The ban is discriminatory and outdated and all donors should be treated equally. As other countries are lifting bans, we believe the United States should follow suit. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Can we have the next speaker, please? Yes, one moment, please. Our next speaker, one moment. Our next speaker will come from the line of Susanna Shield. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. Please begin. Yes, hi there. Um, two and 18 and yes on general comment. Um, we are in complete, our family's in complete support of Sheriff Villanueva and against any type of forced injections. I am also a proud immigrant to the United States and I was surprised by the last words of our pledges of, of allegiance. But yes, I do hope our children receive justice today. And if not, we are pulling our children from the public school system. Please unmask our kids, stop the six feet distancing and stop the testing today. These mandates are causing more harm regarding social emotional learning, mental wellness and overall health of our children. As per OSHA, these surgical and N95 masks cause adverse health condi conditions and should not be used in everyday life, especially on our children. Please refer to OSHA and PubMed for many other studies and viruses that are not contained and know that viruses are not contained by wearing masks. That means you would have to cover up your eyes, orifices of your ears, and of course the pores of your skin. You are taking advice from Barbara Ferreira, who is a psychologist and not a medical doctor. The Hippocratic Oath states do no harm. If Governor Newsom sends his children to maskless schools, maskless camps, maskless sports clubs, then it's good enough for us to unmask our children. Recently, Governor Newsom and Mary Garcetti attended a large gathering Gathering in sort of fancy sky in, in front of, uh, inside inside fancy sky boxes without masks 
without six feet apart. Most of these tests are, quote, made in China, and we understand that this is a DNA data collection exercise. Why are we doing this? Why are you also taking money from the government to force all these mandates on our children? Why are our schools being paid off to enforce these unlawful mandates? These mandates need to stop for our children today. We are watching very closely on how you vote, and we will vote accordingly. God bless you, and do the right thing. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant will be Burton Brink. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hi, I'll be addressing agenda item number two and number 18. My name is Commissioner Burton Brink. I am a retired sergeant from the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, and I am also running for state assembly in the special election on February 15th. I'm against masking our children. It is time to let our children breathe and have an opportunity to learn properly. We have shown that um, the masks are also affecting people's immune systems. The children are having proper, uh, to have a proper immune system need to breathe properly and breathe in the elements to help get their immune system going. So um, this is really bad and it's time to uh, address this and stop the uh, mask mandates for our children. In regards to item number 18, I am against firing our Los Angeles County employees who fail to uh, get the vaccine. We just lost a member who received the vaccine, um, the second dose, and was hospitalized shortly thereafter, and he passed away this morning. He was an active member of the Sheriff's Department. Many members have the opportunity to get the vaccine or the shot um, on their own. They don't need to have a vaccine mandate brought on to them by the county board of supervisors, nor should there be a mandatory vaccine for them to do so. People have that opportunity already to have a vaccine if they choose to do so through their um, doctors, and it should be between their doctors and them. Forcing out these members of our sheriff's department and public employees for Los Angeles County that have been working through this pandemic um, day in and day out without a vaccine, got sick. Um, I know many of my friends who have been sick through the, vac uh, through the uh, pandemic, and some are vaccinated and some are not. We have shown that the vaccine does not stop the COVID, vac uh, uh, the COVID and therefore it should not be a mandatory take the shot or lose your job. Cost millions of dollars to put our people through the. Excuse uh, me, your time has expired. We, uh, May we have the next speaker, please? Next speaker will come from the line of Matthew Boys. Please state the regular agenda items you'll be addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Thank you for the time. Item two and general public comment. For two years, we've witnessed this board and the health department make decisions for us as parents and our children that did not align with qualified health experts and the CDC. We've had two child suicides amidst COVID distance learning pressures in our community, your community, Supervisor Hahn. Our children are in crisis. Supervisor Mitchell, you criticize your peer, Supervisor Barger. It is you who needs to hear criticism, and we're gonna do that today. You hosted the governor last Monday in a press conference to blatantly lie about following your rules. Why are the same public health violation fines enforced on businesses in your district not being levied on SoFi Stadium, the governor, and the LA mayor? Supervisor Barger should be applauded. In closing, this week, you all in the public health department will not be able to effectively enforce your draconian mandates while 100,000 people attend the Super Bowl in Inglewood. The day after the Super Bowl, our children my children will go back to being distanced and masked for over seven hours a day. Children are being forced to wear masks when they run, play sports outdoors. They're being made to believe that people can get sick and die from their simple act of breathing. We're not gonna let you ignore us anymore. We will not let you harm our children any longer, align with the state or resign. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next speaker will come from the line of Ashley Presley. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment, you may begin. 
Good morning. I'm calling to address item number 18. I am in complete opposition of this and mortified that is even being considered. As an LA County deputy, my husband has showed up to protect and serve this county during the entire COVID period. I'm a federal employee and recall working from home as I'm sure many of you board members were as well, and I can tell you're still remotely working during the 2020 riots and watching in horror on TV with my three kids while my husband's on the front line. And to think these are the men and women that you guys are considering firing is very disappointing. <clears throat> now that it has been proven that you can test positive and transmit while vaccinated, there is zero, cool, zero logical argument for firing employees who choose to not be vaccinated. In fact, I would argue that some of these unvaccinated employees that test negative weekly are safer to be around than the vaccinated ones. Let's help make this county more unsafe than it already is. We value our safety and our deputies and do not want <clears throat> to lose these valuable men and women just because of an illogical mandate. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next speaker will come from line of Stephanie Luna. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning. I'll be addressing agenda item 18 in general public comment. Um, it's not surprising how Alex Villanueva is calling in to ensure that his murderous deputies do not get relieved of duty for their non-compliance with the county's COVID-19 policy. And talking about public safety as if his department isn't responsible for the brutalization of our communities. The Sheriff's Department has consistently broken the law and gotten away with it because they are taught to act as if they are above the law. It is imperative that the board takes a stand against the corruption and misconduct that surrounds the Sheriff's Department and put this charter amendment on the ballot. Because while some of you think that we have time to sit and wait for the sheriff elections to come around, we don't. These elections come around every two years. And by then, we have a rogue, unhinged sheriff similar to the one we do now and any other sheriff that is to come. How many more lives do these deputies have to take for you to realize that we're running out of time? This is a human rights crisis that has been brought upon us by the sheriff's department. Law enforcement can be trusted to police themselves. You hear of deputies getting charged with perjury, but what are their consequences? You hear of deputies murdering our children, but what are their consequences? You've heard of deputies harassing grieving families and even some of you that are sitting on the board today, but what are their consequences? There are none because they hide behind their deputy laws, ALAT, and are protected by Villanueva. This charter amendment has everything to do with us being capable of protecting our family and community from the abuse this department is capable of continuing to inflict on us. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next speaker will come from line of Tina Mastromico. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hi, it's on uh, item 18 and a general comment and happy birthday to Supervisor Jewell. Thank you for your years of service. Please keep our officers, our deputies, emergency personnel, regardless of vaccine status. So it's a drastic measure to take their jobs away it puts our communities in danger and overstresses the employees. Is not, isn't there a, uh, uh, some kind of compromise, education, COVID vaccine education or testing? We're already doing testing, some compromise because these, these people were the people who showed up in March of 2020, April of 2020, you know, when it was really dangerous, when we really didn't know what was going on. And I understand things changed, but we went from uh, two weeks to slow the spread to now we're going to let go of thousands of our good employees. So I'm, I'm, I'm asking, I'm begging you to uh, uh, save our communities, not do this to our officers. And, and a general comment, uh, thank you to Sheriff Villanueva for, uh, for being the voice of reason and for standing up for your deputies and for the community. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next speaker will come from line of April Drotty. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hello. Hello, please begin. I'm speaking on set matters to and general public comment. Um, greetings Los Angeles Board of Supervisors and all present. I am April Drotty. I've been a part of this community for 18 years and I'm raising my 13 year old daughter here who attends LAUSD school. I want to first address Supervisor Barger. Supervisor Barger, if we had a city full of officials with your level of integrity, sensibilities, sincerity, and gall, I believe there would be no need for this meeting. 
Since this COVID-19 regime was executed in our city, I've watched you boldly go against the grain and take many, many stands against our governor, our teachers union, our mayor, and many others while your constituents left you standing there as they towed the crooked line. I hope they don't do that today. Supervisors, I don't claim to know the full scope of your respective jurisdictions, nor what you do or do not have the power to change, but you do know. You'll have to forgive me. I haven't been in politics very long. I didn't get into politics until politicians and leaders in this city became my child's direct perpetrators. There is no legal, scientific, or medical basis for this mask requirement. You are suffocating our children literally, as well as mentally and spiritually. As elective officials, we are asking you to demand that all schools stop testing, injecting, quarantining, and masking children that have a 99.98% chance of recovery should they legitimately contract COVID-19 or any other variant. You, if you truly are looking for something to focus on regarding the health and safety of our children, we don't need any more food. We can feed our own children. We don't need food banks. We don't need grab and goes. We need to work and we need our kids to go to school. We ask that you look at LAUSD's admitted dramatic increase in rates of depression, anxiety, suicide, along with the effects of constantly telling our children they are a literal death threat to themselves and others and muzzling their breath and speech to that end. Please look around. There is more of a chance of, and threat of our children getting ill from being harmed from tracking in human feces and urine that they step in, in and around our city, or being shot, stabbed, raped, or robbed on our streets than there is of COVID, which is another reason to stop harassing our police and firemen and women along with our children. Thank you for your time. Have a blessed day. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next for chance to come from the line of Madison Lee. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning. My name is Madison Lee. I'll be speaking on item number 18. I've lived in the 5th district for 26 years, which has a 43% higher crime rate than other cities and towns of its size. It has a higher crime rate than the national median and with crime rate, violent crime extremely high and continuing to climb. The Board of Supervisors is focused on taking deputies and firefighters off the street and firing them. The vaccine doesn't, pre doesn't prevent the spread of COVID, and the personnel have been complying with mask mandates and reporting measures. The employees have also been testing, and this will greatly impact communities, especially those in low-income low areas. The Board of Supervisors are not living in low-income areas, so this does not affect them. This is a huge safety risk, and we're rolling the dice on our children's safety. Please vote to oppose this. Lastly, happy birthday, Sheila. I can't wait to see your massless photos later. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next speaker will come from line of Ashley Gardino. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hello, good morning, board. Thank you for hearing me. Um, I will be addressing line item number two and number 18. Yes, public. Um, First, I would like to thank uh, Sheriff Venezuela. Um, you are a trailblazer and a leader, and I thank you for what you do. Also, um, Catherine Barter, um, thank you so much for what you do. I have met you in person at events, and I have always thought that you speak sense <laughs> in a world of crazy. Um, my children are nine and 11. They go to public school in Santa Clarita Valley and have always loved school, always loved going, have always been excited to learn and be there. And they have not lately. Um, for the first time, my son is in sixth grade. For the first time I got a call from school from the vice uh, principal. He wasn't in a lot of trouble, but he's bored and he can't concentrate and they can't focus. And these masks are terrible. It is not okay. Um, <clears throat> I come from a family with first responders, um, a long line of first responders, they were expected to go out there, do their job, and be in what we consider harm's way with um, COVID. And they, they went, they did their jobs, they risked their lives, um, they did everything they needed to do, and to now force this upon them is, horrific and wrong. Um, my son, um, I'm not anti-vax. I'm, I'm not anti anything. I am protect my children. Um, my son did have an adverse reaction to a vaccine when he was younger. 
and now I can't get him an exemption because doctors won't give it anymore because they are afraid to lose their license. This is terrible and wrong and um, I work in real estate in Santa Clarita Valley and I can tell you right now the people that we want, the people that contribute to Excuse me, your time society. has expired. <laughs> May we have the next speaker, please? Next participant will come from the line of Carla Howell. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Good morning, my name is Carla Blade Patel and I am the Chief Executive Administrator with the Child Care and Development Division with the California Department of Social Services. I am calling in support of item number 10. Before joining uh, the Department of Social Services, I was an attorney with a community-based nonprofit law firm. And to provide you a better picture of the type of obstacles that child care providers face as they try to open new programs, let me share a client's story. Sharon is a savvy child care provider who decided to open a second child care facility. And then looking for space and location, um, it became a part-time job. Sharon found a great location at a local park, but the local jurisdiction was unwilling and unable to make property changes to comply with community care licensing. Other locations were identified by Sharon, um, but in order to look at those locations, she had to ask um, herself a question and apply for a conditional use permit. The conditional use permit basically asks the question, can I open a child care center at this location? Sharon discovered that answering this question can cost up to $10,000. Luckily, she applied and got a yes, this location will allow you to run a child care program. However, your time there has expired. Conditions in order May we have to the next speaker, please? Well, our next participant will come from the line of Jason. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Hello, my name is Jason Carpenter. I'm calling regarding agenda item number two and item number 18. Can you hear me? Yes, please begin. Okay, thank you. Uh, regarding number two, I have a student who is uh, 16 years old in LA Unified calling regarding the masks, um, I guess the latest face ornament, which doesn't work, would be the N95 masks, which I have in my hand right now, a box that I was given here at my county job. And it does say right on the side that the respirator helps protect against certain contaminants, but it may not eliminate the risk of contracting disease or infection. So I'm wondering why kids are being forced to wear something that uh, the box alone says it doesn't work, as well as if the vaccines and the masks work, then after two years, why aren't they working? Regarding number 18, as an employee who is now under this mandate, I'm unvaccinated and I, it's, it's odd to hear that the county's considering whether to let go many of us employees because I haven't even had my religious exemption that I filed responded to yet. So that's kind of odd. My personal freedoms are being violated. Conscientiously objecting is being violated. And I've already had COVID in October of last year, so I have natural immunity. And an Israeli study found that 6.7 times greater protection is given than the vaccine, which is actually not a vaccine. It's a gene, re it's a gene therapy, and it's not even, as others have said, FDA approved. And I also would like to say thank you to Sheriff Villanueva for the hard work that he's doing. And as far as to anyone else who may be listening and those who may be calling soon, there's no need to thank these paid politicians, career politicians for listening to us. They are our workers. We employ them. I have nothing left to say. Sheila Kuehl, you're a disgrace. And may you have a horrible birthday. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Mark Donier. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Um, uh, hello, my name is Mark Donaire. I'm calling in on, uh, for general comment about, about the youth from the BJ facility for it to be uh, closed down and, and the youth be transported to Kilpatrick. At the end of the day, cells are cells. And if we continue to look at the youth as farm animals that basically 
are used for job security, then that's something that we all need to like come to terms with. Um, the rehabilitation centers need to be properly developed in order for them to become mature individuals. So that way they can incorporate themselves within society and feed positive vibes for everyone that exists within our wonderful world. Thank you, and that's all for me. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Severna Mystery. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address the general public comment. You may begin. I'm speaking on agenda item 218 and general public comment. Our children have not had a normal school year since 2019. For two years, I and several parents have written to this board begging for relief for our children. For two years, you have put the union and special interests ahead of our children. Experts around the world and our own U.S. Surgeon General have sounded the alarm of a mental health crisis in our children to the pandemic school closures and the continued restrictions. Our children are in crisis and you continue to ignore it. Not a single message has come from LA County Public Health addressing the social, emotional, and mental harm these restrictions are doing to our children. This is an epic failure by this board and by public health. Our children were locked out of their schools and sports for over a year. Now the school doors have opened, our children are distanced from friends, masked for seven plus hours a day with no parties, no field trips, no fun. Children are being forced to wear masks outside in the heat to exercise, run, and play sports. Children are made to believe that people will get sick by their very simple act of breathing. None of these restrictions are enforced on adults. We've all seen the Super Bowl, we've all seen the stadiums and concerts halls full, jam packed of adults without masks. This needs to end. We are taking a stand, we are taking control back. Um, this board has utterly failed children in the past. I hate to bring this up, but let me remind you what you have done to children that have been abused and you have failed them. This needs to end. Um, as for item number 18, essential workers have been working this entire pandemic. Firing unvaccinated workers serves absolutely no purpose for public health other than coercing vaccines. Everybody has already spoken about, you can still catch and transmit the disease or COVID-19, uh, even if you're fully vaccinated. Everyone should be entitled to their own personal health choices. You are running LA County into the sewer. You need to end all these restrictions. You need to restore freedom to the people of LA County. I live in LA County. I live in a fire hazard. I don't give a crap whether the fireman that comes to my house to extinguish the flames at my backyard is vaccinated or not. I don't care if I call a police officer to come help me as I'm being murdered in the street, if he's vaccinated or not. You need to stop this discrimination or we need to restore faith and confidence in our public officials and our public health department. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Maynor X. Please state the regular agenda items you are addressing today and whether you'll address some general public comment. You may begin. Um, what's up? Good morning, everybody. Um, just general public comment. Um, here to speak on the 15 youth that are in the secure track uh, that are currently still in um, night or, uh, you know, back in July 2021, they they passed a motion to move them to Kilpatrick, but yet seven months later, they're still there. Um, the BSCC on September 2019 found the facilities unsuitable for anybody to live there, let alone a kid. Um, so yeah, I'm here to say Northern Nydorf moved these kids to Kilpatrick and also the BOC, com the commissioners went and they went and, and inspected and, and tried to talk to the youth in the compound and they said that every time there's a fight there, locked down for a week, regardless if you were in, involved or not involved in the fight and only 40 minutes to shower. If we were to do this to our kids out here in the community, with no doubt, you guys would take them away from us. So, but yet, you guys are here doing the same thing. So please, stop all that shit. Excuse and me, your time has expired. May we have the next speaker, please? 
Our next participant is Richard O'Neill. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address them on public comment. You may begin. Hello, my name is Richard O'Neill speaking on the agenda nine, item number 18. I oppose it as it is an infringement of our US, Constitu US and California constitutional rights to provide for the common defense. Thousands of officers will be terminated, negatively affecting public safety. For those terminated officers, it is a 14th Amendment violation as it does not provide equal protections under the law for those unvaccinated. California Constitution, Article Section, Article 1, Section 28, Subsection 4 would be infringed as it would violate our voting rights and that we empowered the sheriff with our collective votes and disempowering him is silencing the voice of those people <coughs> of LA County who elected him. If the people do not like his leadership, then they can speak in the upcoming election. It has been proven that vaccinated people can still contract and spread the pathogen. The terminating unvaccinated officers is not protecting others. Furthermore, there are other measures to protect the public, which are also effective, such as weekly testing, which is currently- Excuse practiced. me, your time has expired. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Waldo Gonzalez. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. One moment, Mr. Wal Mr. Uh, Gonzalez. You may begin. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Waldo Gonzalez and I'm representing Inner City Struggle, a community organization based in the east side of Los Angeles. I am speaking in support of item number nine. I see us serve some of the highest need and most vulnerable communities in Los Angeles County. As such, the communities that we serve bear a higher burden when resources for mental health and affordable housing are lacking. The now two-year COVID-19 crisis have exposed just how vulnerable our communities are to the pre-existing inequities and how those have become exacerbated during this time. Therefore, we urge the board to adopt this motion to allow us to realize the reuse of the iconic and historic General Hospital building and West Campus. This would bring a regional solution to the affordable housing, community health and wellness needs, job creation, and address the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. As a, COVID, as a member of the Health Innovation uh, Community Partnership and the Community Engagement Steering Committee for the General Hospital Reuse Feasibility Study, we are excited about having supported the construction of a new child care center and ensuring that this project benefits local residents by incorporating an aspirational goal of 50% targeted worker and local hire. We applaud Supervisor Solis for your dedication and commitment to having an active engagement of the community in realizing the Healthy Village vision at the LA, LA County USC campus. We stand ready to work with the County Board of Supervisors on this historic project. Thank Excuse you. me, your time has expired. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Jacqueline McCroskey. Please check take the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Yes, Jacqueline McCroskey, I'm addressing item 10 and public comment. Um, I, I really want to thank Supervisor Solis and actually the whole Board of Supervisors for your continuing support of the early childhood education system in LA County. Um, this motion is designed to help um, local Los Angeles County early education providers compete successfully for state infrastructure grant program dollars. Um, there, there's, I would say, three important components of the motion. Um, one will help our LA County providers who are interested in developing new childcare facilities navigate the complex landscape of land use and permitting processes in LA. My colleague Carla Places Hal laid out some of those in her um, description earlier. Um, it also directs collaboration between regional planning and our key early childhood education offices, including the Office for the Advancement of Early Childhood Education and the Policy Roundtable for Child Care and Development. I'm a member of the Policy Roundtable. We are very, very excited about the opportunity to, for continuing collaboration with regional planning. Um, but the motion goes further than just that and also supports development of a comprehensive support system for providers, including some of our key friends outside of county government from First 5 LA, the Child Care Alliance and the Partnership for Early Childhood Investment. We're so delighted to see 
the state release dollars for facility development. These are very precious resources and to have the opportunity uh, to compete for them is, is a very exciting and important moment. In, in my experience, however, I've seen that sometimes it's very difficult for LA um, proposers to compete successfully in such state processes. And that's for two reasons. One is because our own county processes can be um, complicated and complex, and certainly in land use. Excuse me, your time has expired. May we have the next speaker, complex. please? Our next participant is Jessica Perral. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today, and whether you'll address on general public comment, you may begin. Jessica Perral, your line is open. Go ahead, please. Hello, uh, this is Jessica Peral from the Los Angeles LGBT Center. Um, I want to thank the Board of Supervisors for moving to support an end to this discriminatory and outdated ban that prevents gay and bisexual men from donating blood. This ban was imposed in an era when HIV was poorly understood, when no reliable and practical test for detecting HIV in the blood existed, and it has still persisted for decades even as blood screening technology has improved dramatically. Today, every unit of donated blood is rigorously tested to detect any trace of HIV, syphilis, hepatitis, West Nile virus, or other bloodborne diseases. And for this reason, uh, the American Medical Association has called for the ban to end. And I strongly urge the Board of Supervisors to move ahead with their message to the Food and Drug Administration in support of ending the ban. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Zoe Rawson. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment, you may begin. Good morning, Zoe Rawson from Earth for Healing and Justice Network and LA Youth Uprising. I'll speak to general public comment and also the item on the sheriff, which I don't know the number of. Um, so I'm a person who's been harmed by uh, probation and the sheriff's facility. Um, I'm somebody who is um, committed to trauma-informed practice, to my own healing and the healing of other people. I care for people who are being harmed in these facilities. When I enter them, I can feel, because I'm so focused on trauma and healing, I can feel that there's no compassion and no respect and no dignity. And when I push back to um, achieve that for myself and the people I love inside of these uh, barbaric places, um, I, I'd be, I'm treated the same way. So I wonder where, where that harm is in this conversation. NIDARC needs to shut down. It's, it's harmful and abusive. It's not trauma-informed. Uh, I was recently banned from visiting a loved one in Men's Central Jail for a month. And I was not explained um, that there was a written policy for that. I was not explained who instituted that ban. I was not explained how to appeal that ban. And in the meantime, the person in prison goes without. It's a young person because we lock up young people in our adult jails. Um, and that person has suffered health, mental health, crisis while there. And now he, I'm banned from seeing him. And it's because the sheriffs are abusing their power and treating others without compassion. And um, I'm really upset about it. And because I'm a person that's committed to healing, I work on my Excuse own. Excuse me, your time trauma. has expired. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Eric Previn. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address some general public comment. You may begin. Yes, thank you. I, I intend to address uh, several items and the uh, a general public comment as well. May I begin? Please begin, you have three minutes. Um, thank you. Uh, I wanted to say, first of all, that this is a very, very dense agenda, and I've been trying to follow along. Um, and also, I wanted to say that last month, 
marked the 175th anniversary of the Treaty of Cahuenga, which was signed right here in uh, near Studio City in Council District 2 or 4, uh, I believe now in Barger's District, I'm not sure. Maybe Sheila's District, it used to be Sheila's District. It's where Universal Studios is, FYI, where, uh, where one of the lawyers uh, who's investigating the MRT thing uh, works, it's actually his wife. But look, this was a historic pact that was signed right there at the Coenga area, uh, the Mexican-American War in, during, and, and it made LA, it was the first time that LA became an American city. It was a magnificent or magnanimous um, treaty made in the spirit of mutual respect with the expectation that people of different cultures would live side by side in peace. It guaranteed protections of life uh, and liberty to the Californios, as they were called, and further provided that equal rights and privileges are vouchsafed, sort of quoting here, to every citizen of California, as are enjoyed by the citizens of the United States. So I was reflecting on that. Um, but what these actions have in common is the fundamental principle upon which the Treaty of Kringo was based, which is that despite the differences in our background, uh, our ethnicity, and our material wealth, all of us, human beings, are entitled to respect and dignity and peace. And now more than ever, as our nation can seem so divided and so torn by outrage and anger, we need to realize that our future rises or falls for all of us together. But this board, unfortunately, under Holly Mitchell, who I actually tried to help get elected because I was so disgusted by Herb Wesson, her opponent's conduct. Uh, incidentally, uh, Covington Burling, the firm you've hired, was Herb Wesson's uh, lawyer when the federal probe swung through City Hall. So I really think they have to be reconsidered. They can't be the right firm for the public. It's Joe Biden, who I voted for, uh, campaign attorneys, uh, who write big multi-million dollar, six million dollar report for an Oregon hospital to cover up sexual harassment. And they bring in at $2,500 an hour, uh, Eric Holder, who when I told my mom, she said, I love Eric Holder, how dare you? And I said, mom, it's not about that. They're covering, they're not, we don't need an investigation into uh, our partners by our partners. That doesn't make any sense. We want an- Excuse me, your time has expired. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Sonia Fuentes. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today, and whether you'll address some general public comment, you may begin. Hello, Sonia good morning. Fuentes, Sorry about that. Could you hear me? We can hear you. Please begin. Okay. Um, this is Sonia Fuentes. I'm a psychiatric social worker with the Department of Mental Health. Um, I work for the mental evaluation team. Um, I have firsthand knowledge on or kind of observation on the impact of COVID and the public policy. Um, definitely mental health has been affected. We, our team um, and pretty much we're the only field-based teams apart from the psychiatric mobile response team that has been out in the field, um, it would be greatly affected if um, uh, in terms of Department of Mental Health, if workers were to be fired. Um, a lot of the employees currently are um, still teleworking which creates a lot of impact on the work that we do. Um, the resources, the linkage that we do is um, at capacity. So for example, full service partnership is completely, uh, they're not accepting new clients. Um, in terms of uh, clinicians teleworking, um, a lot of our clients that are uh, getting hospitalized or destabilized is because um, they're either psychotic or Your time has expired. To be May we have the next speaker, please? Because they're not seen in person. Our next participant is Ari Gutierrez. Ari Gutierrez, please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address some general public comment. We begin. Ari Gutierrez, you may begin. 
Hello, did you call Ari Gutierrez? Yes, please go ahead. Oh, sorry. I'm speaking in favor of item nine. The residents of Los Angeles have a unique and very special opportunity to return historic general hospital to full service. Through years of thoughtful study and inclusive community input, the vision for the reuse of general hospital to address the most pressing social service needs of our community at large is ready for the next step. By investing in the RFP process for this project, <coughs> LA County can begin to actively seek funding sources and administrate the process of putting the historic national resource back to work for all Angelinos. Please vote yes on this motion. Ari Gutierrez Darambula on behalf of the Latino Equality Alliance. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Kimberly Gonzalez. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address some general public comment, you may begin. Hi, I'm addressing item number 18. Um, as others have expressed and um, have opposed um, this agenda, I agree entirely with all statements that have been said by them and by Sheriff uh, Villanueva. Um, by proceeding with um, this enhancement um, code, it is going to actually um, endanger our communities. There's gonna be more violence than it already is in, within the city and within the county. Um, and ultimately, we should all respect our personal choices. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Kate Haney. Kate Haney, please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address a general public comment, you may begin. Thank you and good morning to everybody. Um, I'd like to start my uh, by saying thank you to Catherine Barger for standing up and for standing up to unmask our children. I have three children in LA County and my daughters who do music and gymnastics are masked 50 hours a week. And that's just not acceptable. I don't think that the board members or Barbara Pereira have any idea of the mental health impact of these masks on children, as well as the vaccine mandates. My daughter plays the tenor saxophone and she is required to get tested weekly, even though she is vaccinated. I just don't understand why the facts related to mental health on children are not communicated. Barbara Ferrer just states the same facts over and over again. She does not provide any statistics on children. And the fact that COVID has, children that get COVID have mild symptoms. My family, the adults are all vaccinated, got COVID in December, and my 10 year old was crying because she was afraid that she affected somebody. Excuse me, your time has expired. May we have the next speaker, please? Next participant is Mr. Devin Lee. Our next participant is Robert Field. Robert Field, please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address on general public comment. You may begin. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> I'm speaking today against the passage of Agenda 18. The proposal in this motion to terminate the employment of 18,000 county employees, 4,000 of which are sheriff deputies and may include the uh, religious and uh, medical exemptions is reckless. This proposal violates um, numerous labor laws and privacy laws, potentially exposing the county to hundreds of millions of dollars in damages in employee lawsuits. That is our money, the taxpayer's money of Los Angeles County. I urge you to vote against this reckless motion, Agenda 18. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. 
Our next participant is Gloria Prieto. Please state the regular agenda items we're addressing today and we'll deal with the rest of the general public comment. You may begin. Yes, thank you. I'm addressing Agenda 18 in which I strongly object to. To fire 18,000 county employees is atrocious. This is, um, these are the same people that we called heroes just a short time ago and have been able to to perform their job with or without the vaccine. It, it doesn't make any sense. The people, you're criminalizing the people who have chosen to not be vaccinated and to exercise their right to free, cho to free choice. We know now through new studies that have all come out that the mRNA vaccine, vaccine does not work. Needless to say, that it is still an EUA and not FDA approved. So today I speak to you and I am in strong opposition to agenda 18. And I hope that you make the right decision and vote against it. Thank, Thank you. you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Ashley Racy. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and we'll be able to address some general public comment. You may begin. Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please begin. Hello, I am calling to oppose number 18. I first want to say as a resident of LA County, it's not new news that this county is lacking full resources to provide adequate public safety. Crime has drastically increased that last the last few years, especially with the horrible DA Garcon. The thought of possibly losing 4,000 LASD members sickens me, let alone the entire 18,000. Most members have natural immunity. The vaccine is not an end all. It does not stop or prevent spread. Sheriff Bill and Ueva, thank you for taking a stand for choice and doing what you were voted in to do. No one should have to face losing their job, feeding their family over a health decision. A mandate is force, force is not choice. Stop the mandate, stop the vaccine mandates and the testing. I know for a fact when people, when someone is in need of requiring emergency services or healthcare, no one is going to stop someone in a life-threatening circumstance and ask for proof of vaccination. If you feel that way, you should not be serving our community, please, take a job transfer to China and work with that communism. Number two, I am also opposed to these mask mandates. Barger, how was that awesome? Excuse me, your time has nice expired. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Point Milby. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and we will address some general public comment. Let me begin. Uh, yes, my name is Clint Milby. I'm in district number five. I'm speaking on uh, number two and number 18. First of all, on number two, uh, recently, I'm sure you are aware, uh, the UK dropped all of their mandates. And on a UK television show, they were interviewing a woman, a young lady, she was about 13, I guess she was 15 now, 13 when the, all this started. And she started talking about how, you know, that they were constantly feeling like they were doing something wrong as students and then, you know, but they definitely wanted to talk to each other. So they went into like, janitor's closet to talk and she was telling us you know all of the story and then she just broke down crying and said that the, you know two two years of her life were gone and you could sense the pain and you could sense the loss and you could you know if you could see with the eyes you know uh, of you know understanding you could sense that she's going to have ptsd for many years to come and i really want you to think about the the visuals on that Secondly, on number 18, oh, and I also want to do a general comment, sorry. I, on number 18, I recently spoke with an emergency worker uh, who told me when I was like, you guys get like all kinds of vaccines and stuff like that, hepatitis A, B, C, all of these things every year just to be able to have your job. What was it about this one in particular? Was there something that you were seeing? And uh, he said, yes. He said that, you know, when we roll out to do welfare checks because they haven't heard from Uncle Joe or something like this, um, you know, what they were seeing were heart attacks and strokes that the common denominator in about 90% of them was 
that the person had been vaccinated within three months of having that event, with having a stroke. And that's the reason why these emergency workers do not want to get this. It's not, it's, it's not a, any type of phobia or they're anti-vax or something like that, that they've seen the effect of what this mRNA gene therapy is doing to people, and they know... Excuse me, your time has expired. Job. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Lisa Lee. Lisa Lee, please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and whether you'll address some general public comment when you begin. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please begin. Thank you. I'm addressing the number item 18, and this is for public comment. I am perplexed that the vaccine mandate is even on the table for debate um, with everybody, and especially our LAPD. As a young single woman living in central Hollywood with my citizens app notifications going off and choppers flying over my house, the last thing that me and my friends want is our LAPD to be fired. It's not a good idea. Um, the crime is rampant in LA, and we all know that the vaccines don't actually prevent the spread, so it's a complete fallacy. And if you decide to vote that they should have the mandate, you guys should be held responsible for all the crime that is about to ensue in this city. Thank you. Our next participant is Nicole Goodfellow. Please state the regular agenda items you're addressing today and we'll be able to address some general public comment. You may begin. Hi, I'm uh, addressing set matter two, uh, opposing item 18 and general comment. I'm a parent in LA County 5th District resident. During the pandemic, all I have seen are people trying to do the right thing, wearing masks, getting vaccinated, complying in hopes that we can get out of this. We are rule followers here yet none of these measures have actually worked except to destroy lives. You may dream of zero COVID, but it's not realistic. The state is ending the indoor mask mandate on February 15th, but LA County is not. We cannot continue with the draconian mandates, restrictions, and metrics that are impossible to achieve. Public health has changed directions so many times, you are no longer have credibility. We need to align with the state on these matters. Our children have had not had a normal school year since 2018, 2019 it came to an end. 2019, 2020 was abruptly halted on March 13th, 2020, when we learned in-person education is not essential. Faces are not essential. Smiles are not essential. Human connections are not essential. All that is essential are the demands of organized labor and the government attempts to do something, anything, regardless if it helps or harms. I oppose item 18. Many who have chosen to remain unvaccinated are essential workers and first responders that were already exposed on the job. Natural immunity does actually exist per the CDC. While you sat home on laptops at peak COVID and pre-vaccine, millions of Angelinos went to work and hoped for the best. We called them heroes. Their reward now to lose their jobs if they don't take a vaccine that many don't want or need. It's disgraceful to even consider firing county workers and first responders over a vaccine mandate. It's time to move to a vaccine and mask optional situation for students, workers, and all Angelino. We cannot allow you to continue to take the path of least resistance with mandates on our children because of unscientific demands of labor unions. When the state and local restrictions end, the union and school district restrictions on our kids must end too. The majority of Americans are living in a mask and vaccine optional environment and doing just fine. We deserve the same freedom of choice in Los Angeles County. Thank you. And thank you to uh, each and every member of the general public who took your time today to call in and express your perspective. We appreciate you. Uh, with 90 minutes having lapsed, our time for public speakers has ended. Again, thank you to all who called in. If you were unable to provide your comments orally, you may submit written comments as indicated on the agenda. We will continue to accept all written comments that come in during the meeting, which will become part of the public record. Executive officer, please indicate the agenda item numbers on which we will be voting today. The following items are before you, 3, 6 through 8, 11, 12 through 16 as revised, 19 through 21, 23 through 30, 32 through 36, 38 through 42, 
44 through 57, 59 through 68, 69A and 69B, 72 and 73, 1D, 2D, and I am going to read a statement. 1D is a recommendation to adopt resolution authorizing the issuance, sale, and delivery of the Vermont Manchester notes in an aggregate principal amount not to exceed $46,338,493 for a 118-unit affordable housing project and the Vermont Manchester Senior Project notes in an aggregate principal amount not to exceed $26,094,717 for a 62-unit affordable housing project, both located in the city of Los Angeles. 3D through 7D are before you. Thank you. Moved by Supervisor Barger, seconded by Supervisor Hahn to approve these items with the exceptions noted by the Executive Officer. Executive Officer, please call the roll. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kiel. Aye. Supervisor Kiel, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. We will begin with set matters one and two and then proceed to agenda items four, five, nine, 10, 17, 18, 58, and concluding with item 69C. We'll begin with set matter one, the American Rescue Plan funding. We'll hear a presentation from Fiji Davenport, Chief Executive Officer, and Dr. Barbara Ferrer, Director of Public Health. Good morning, Madam Chair, and good morning, Board of Supervisors. Um, I will go ahead and get started talking while the PowerPoint, thank you, is being brought up. Um, so today's presentation will be the fourth in our series of regular presentations on the county's progress implementing phase one of the county's American Rescue Plan, the spending plan. As your board will see from today's presentation, departments continue to make steady progress finalizing their federally compliant program designs, each of which incorporates your board's equity mandate and moving into an implementation phase. But the initial focus of our presentation this morning will be on the larger systems change instigated by your board. As your board will recall, weeks prior to considering and approving the phase one spending plan, your board directed my office to create specialized tools and a funding formula to support the development and launch of a new equity-based service allocation that is tied to your board's approval of the ARP spending plan. We will be presenting a core component of this new infrastructure, which is basically a mapping tool called the Equity Explorer Mapping Tool. And while Dr. Scorza, We'll take, talk more specifically about the tool's capabilities. I wanted to take a moment just to highlight the importance of the tool. First, in terms of its capabilities, the Explorer tool leverages numerous data indices, allowing departments to identify service population by needs tiers, those in the highest need, high need, et cetera. Departments can then leverage spatial data to identify geographically concentrated service populations. They can also tap into data sets to identify non-geographically contiguous populations who may be eligible for services, but are not necessarily concentrated by census tract or by geographic indicator. Dr. Discorzo will discuss some examples of these types of populations later in the presentation. Departments can also focus on data sets most informative to their service population. For example, the Economic and Workforce Development Agency will essentially focus on data sets that are most informative to their service population. WEDAC will focus on different data when designing a small business support program. Then, Excuse me. WEDAX will focus on different data when designing a small business support program, then the Department of Public Health will 
use when designing their home visitation programs. Second, the Equity Explorer mapping tool marks an important evolution in the way county departments evaluate how to deploy limited resources to those most in need. In short, an equity-based process that can be replicated in programs from ARC to CFCI and beyond. I also wanted to quickly note that your board's efforts are receiving national recognition for its efforts to ensure equitable investment of ARPA funds. Last month, the Department of the U.S. Treasury issued its final rule governing, governing, governing the expenditure and reporting of ARP funds. The final rule calls out your board's care first, jails last programming as an example of local strategies using ARPA funds to invest in holistic approaches in violence prevention that are rooted in targeted outreach and addressing root causes. They highlight this use of ARPA funds as an example of ARP eligible programs that aim to replace arrest and incarceration responses with health interventions. Next slide, please. So the next slide essentially uh, shows what we will be covering today. As I mentioned, Dr. Scorzo will address items one through three by providing an overview of the Equity Explorer mapping tool and a status update on ARPA implementation. And then Dr. Barbara Ferrer, Director of Public Health, will present on item number four. She will spotlight public health ARP funded programs focused on home visiting and nurse family partnership. And with that, I will turn the presentation over to Dr. Scorza. Thank you so much, Ms. Davenport. Good morning, board. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. Uh, next slide, please. As um, our CEO has mentioned, um, we worked closely with our partners in ISD to develop the Equity Explorer mapping tool, which uses your board's directed COVID-19 vulnerability and recovery index to indicate areas of highest, high, moderate, low, and lowest need tiers in order to assist departments with their project design efforts. The use of this index can help departments, as the CEO mentioned, identify communities that are disproportionately impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic based upon risk factors for infection and severity, as well as their ability to recover from the health, economic, and social impacts of the pandemic. Using this information, departments can best target their ARPA program funding and resources towards communities with the greatest need. RD also provides departments with training and guidance on how to use the mapping tool in their project designs in order to inform the decision making and better align program investments with recovery needs. The mapping tool is now publicly accessible on our ARPA website at the link you see on the screen, um, which is now at ceo.lacounty.gov slash recovery. Next slide, please. Race, class, and place are closely linked in Los Angeles County and the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic has disproportionately affected individuals and families who live at the intersections of these factors for several reasons. Decades of discriminatory housing, banking, and economic policies have limited opportunities for African-American, Indigenous, Latino, Latina, Latinx residents, Asian-American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, and many marginalized communities who reside in the county who need our services to maintain their economic security and, and weather crises. The COVID-19 Vulnerability and Recovery Index is the primary map layer in the Equity Explorer mapping tool and was developed in partnership with the Coalition for Equitable ARPA Implementation based on and adapted from a statewide place-based index. The county's index uses census tract, zip code, and neighborhood level data to help identify populations according to need here, as well as identify, again, communities that are most impacted by the pandemic and in need of long-term economic recovery interventions based upon relative risk. The index assesses risk factors for COVID-19 infection and severity and includes measures that were meant to measure the health risks of communities and the long-term social and economic impacts. The need tiers are based upon an analysis that categorizes risk, severity, and recovery needs using indicators that are known factors for risk of COVID-19 infection, including high degrees of vulnerability to severe challenges if infected, and the need again to recover from the health, economic, and social impacts of the pandemic. This slide shows the current list of indicators under each of these three indices 
and their subcategories, risk, severity, and recovery need. The communities are also at greater risk to, of exposure to the virus due to their increased likelihood of being essential workers, public transit dependent, and live in, living in housing that's far from supermarkets and other essential businesses. This data is then geographically mapped and the Equity Explorer assists departments and their program leads by providing a visual representation of communities where the greatest needs exist. Next slide, please. Recognizing that not all populations will be captured or identified in publicly available data, your board directed CEO to develop strategies that would help identify communities that are not geographically concentrated or may be hard to locate. To ensure that these non-geographically concentrated communities who are also disproportionately impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic are identified and prioritized, already consulted with several subject matter experts, including representatives from, but not limited to, community-based immigrant, Native American, American Indian organizations, to help us develop strategies that would ensure these communities are considered and included as departments design their projects. To help meet your board's directives, we identified indicators for hard to reach populations and developed outreach strategies to increase inclusion of non-geographically concentrated communities, including an effort to source data through what's called participatory mapping. To further tailor their program populations, departments may also identify and use other validated indicators that target communities most impacted by the pandemic, provided that they can be justified and substantiated to align with the focus on equity and disproportionately impacted populations. We strongly encourage departments to use the COVID index as a starting place for their analysis, um, or essentially the floor, not the ceiling, and to consider additional factors to identify their populations most in need, including veteran, unhoused, immigrant, and other social vulnerability statuses, amongst many others, to better target services to the populations who have received the greatest benefit from their program. Next slide, please. Based upon the need levels using the COVID-19 Vulnerability and Recovery Index across LA County's population, we were able to demonstrate the total number of residents who fall within each need tier. As you can see, nearly 63% of our county's population fall within the moderate to highest need tiers. Now, while not comprehensive, the locations identified here are examples of communities that fall within those multiple need tiers. 42% of our residents fall within the high and highest need tiers, and are concentrated within communities throughout all five supervisorial districts. These neighborhoods are often communities where high degrees of concentrated and accumulated disadvantage exist and are disproportionately impacted by the pandemic at higher rates than in low and lowest need neighborhoods. Zip codes within the highest needs on the index have nearly four times higher uninsured rates compared to zip codes within the lowest need. Zip codes within the highest need on the index have nearly four times the rate of individuals living below 200% of the federal poverty level compared to zip codes with the lowest need. Overall, these data show that roughly three out of five residents fall within the moderate, high, and highest need tiers, where highest need communities were often between four to seven times more likely to be at greater risk for infection, severely impacted by the pandemic, or a need for recovery support. Next slide, please. Now, given the effusion of ARPA dollars in our county, your board has directed that LA County acts upon our commitment to advance equity by implementing strategies to allocate funds fairly and transparency, transparently. Your board's approved spending plan, aligned to strategic pillars, calls for equity as a primary consideration in allocating resources and supportive services in order to advance an equitable recovery. Systematically implementing our countywide equity principles and the use of the Equity Explorer will help fulfill and further your board's directives by prioritizing the individuals and families in our county who are most impacted by the pandemic and need the most resources to recover from the pandemic's disproportionate effects. By using the Equity Explorer mapping tool, as you can see here on this, this slide, departments and now the public can explore census tracts throughout LA County to identify areas of highest, high, moderate, low, and lowest needs when either conducting project design planning or examining projects themselves. What you see before you is a visual representation of that COVID index along with additional data layers to the top right, such as incarceration, tenant vulnerability, CalFresh participation rates, language diversity, 
computer and internet access, amongst many others that departments are currently utilizing to better target their resources. We're even able to identify communities that have been historically redlined to better locate neighborhoods where disadvantage has accumulated over time. Included in this mapping tools are links to the data sources, options to filter that data, features to search for specific neighborhood or supervisorial district characteristics, buttons to export that data, and tools to see the results in real time. I'd like to thank and acknowledge our partners in ISD, including Steve Steinberg and his team, who helped us drive and develop this tool. Next slide, please. As you've requested, as your board has requested, this slide provides you with a current update on where projects are in the design, development, and approval process. RD continues to partner with departments to develop and complete project designs that comply with your board's directives and U.S. Treasury's guidelines. The focus on equity will ultimately lead to investments in communities hardest hit by the pandemic and at greatest risk for a slow recovery. As of February 4th, 59 projects are in the design development phase. This includes efforts to clarify the goals and outcomes of each project, the project's potential impact on reducing disparities, and strategies to measure that impact. I should note that Treasury requires a strong focus on evidence and evaluations, and departments must be able to demonstrate the improvements occurring in communities most impacted by the pandemic. One project is currently under RD and County Council review, and a total of 23 projects have been approved for launch and implementation. As CEO shared, the total number of projects approved for launch has more than doubled from 11 to 23 within the past month, and projects, some projects have begun implementation. Next slide. During our last board presentation, you asked us to track estimated pro department project launch dates and report on the projects currently launched. This slide details those projects that are now made available on the ARPA website. The website was an effort in response to your board's comments last week, to, um, um, two weeks ago, to provide a single place online where the public can view which programs are available and which ones are coming soon. We will continue to refine this site with information as we receive it from departments. And for the time being, programs that have launched or are on the way to launch may have an estimated launch date and are currently listed on the site where more will be added later. I would like to note that while we are working to get this information um, quickly and out to the public, we will continue to refine and improve over time. Many programs are at multiple stages and others have approved program designs and are moving towards implementation. Next slide, please. Next, Dr. Barbara Ferrer, Director of Public Health will highlight two of their ARPA funded programs to showcase some of the initiatives the county is supporting during our first phase of ARPA funding. Dr. Ferrer. Hi, Tina. Oh, great. Thanks. Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Supervisors, uh, uh, Ms. Davenport and, and Dr. Scorza for the opportunity to discuss with you how the Department of Public Health is administering the ARPA funding to support two essential home visiting programs, Healthy Families America and the Nurse Family Partnership. Uh, for some background, as many of you know, home visiting is a prevention strategy used to support pregnant moms and new parents to promote infant and child health, foster educational development and school readiness, and help prevent child abuse and neglect. Across the county and the country, high quality home visiting programs offer vital support to parents as they deal with the challenges of raising babies and young children. Home visiting models vary. They may rely on nurses, social workers, child development specialists, or trained paraprofessionals. All come with prescribed training requirements, and public health supplements the required training with modules on mental health and trauma-informed care. Home visiting clients also often vary by program model. Across programs, clients include high-risk first-time pregnant women, new parenting families, homeless women who are pregnant, survivors of violence and trauma, and teenagers in foster care, transitioning from juvenile and criminal justice services. 
LA County provides home visiting through the department's public health nurses and through contracts with 19 community-based agencies who implement three evidence-based models of care. In addition, we're partnered with First 5 LA and they provide a low touch model called Welcome Baby, which is evidence in form. This model allows us to offer a single contact to a large number of women, identifying those with needs that call for referrals to other programs. Home visiting is part of the county's continuum of services for pregnant women and families of young children. This continuum of services is vital to achieving county goals around proving birth outcome equity and averting risk, including the risk of abuse and neglect. It provides non-judgmental, culturally appropriate uh, and competent education and support to families with a wide range of health and social needs. We're grateful for the $11.9 million in ARPA funds that have been directed by the board for these two home visiting programs with $5.6 million of funding for the Healthy Families contracts and 6.3 million funding for the Nurse Family Partnership. These dollars filling gaps in home visiting funding, allowing us to mitigate the decrease in home visiting services that resulted when there was a funding reduction uh, from the Department of Mental Health in this last fiscal year. It provides funding for seven permanent county public health nurses under the Nurse Family Partnership and allows us to continue with programmatic and administrative services for both uh, the Nurse Family Partnership and Healthy Families and the Healthy Families uh, uh, Program as well, uh, Healthy Families America. Uh, the ARPA funds for the Nurse Family Partnership will allow us to serve at least 175 new clients uh, adding to the current uh, Department of Public Health caseload of over 3,600 clients. The ARPA funds for Healthy Families America will allow us to serve at least 600 new clients. Combined, the intended population is over 775 clients who are low income, high risk, and high need, pregnant and, fa and parenting families identified using the COVID-19 Vulnerability and Recovery Index. Targeting the populations that are noted on this slide, including those that are involved in foster care uh, and those experiencing violence, homelessness, and or substance use. The ARPA funding in particular is critical uh, at the present time, given the challenges imposed on low-income families by the pandemic. These families, especially families headed by women of color, have faced unique stresses due to employment in essential positions that entail high levels of risk, often without the protection of paid sick leave, particularly severe loss of employment that has, been, uh, that has not been recouped with the reopening of businesses and the need to homeschool older children, often with inadequate technology and minimal support. Their numbers have swelled demands for emergency food and shelter and services across the county. We can go to the next slide. The project's goals, as I briefly I think you can go to the next slide. The project's goals, as I briefly mentioned earlier, are to widely screen, identify, refer, advocate, and coordinate successful mental health and family support linkages, thereby preventing trauma risks for young children and strengthening all expectant and parenting families to have healthy, safe, and ready to learn children in the county. The department is currently wor working with county council on the contracting mechanism under the ARPA requirements for the process to continue to fund the 12 Healthy Families of America agencies. Upon final approval, we'll amend these 12 agreements and conduct a work order solicitation for a temporary personnel services contract. Meanwhile, work is underway by our program staff to finalize the draft scopes of work for the Healthy Families contractors and that because these need to include the ARPA requirements and uh, we're finalizing the work order solicitation. While this ARPA funding offers an urgent response to the intensified hardship experienced by families, it is also a step towards the achievement of a system with long-term capacity to meet the needs of all families who want and could benefit from some model of home visiting support. We're currently working with partners, including First 5 LA, EPSS, and DCFS to secure expanded and sustainable funding for home visiting through third-party payment from Medi-Cal, 
and uh, uh, Medi-Cal and insurance in addition to current funding sources. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much for that presentation. Are there members who have questions? Shift from the slides back to, excellent, thank you. Uh, I see uh, Supervisor Kuehl, who will be followed by Supervisor Solis. Supervisor Kuehl. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I want to thank uh, our truly visionary CEO, whom we've asked to begin to think this through in terms of our ARP dollars, uh, Dr. Scorza, who has put in so much time, and of course, Dr. Ferrer, uh, in terms of the presentation that she made. Uh, when I first was elected um, almost eight years ago, the uh, home visitation programs were scattered in a whole lot of different entities. Uh, county didn't really know everything that was out there and uh, we uh, tasked ourselves to begin to try to bring some of these things together. And I've been fortunate to be appointed by uh, all the board chairs along the way to chair the first five board of commissioners each year and have really tried to integrate what they are doing because there's a lot of investment there as well with a lot of what the county is doing. So. I'm very pleased to see uh, in this particular arena of home visitation and public health, uh, how well that has come along. Nothing is ever done, nothing's ever perfect, but um, so that was one thing. The second thing is I'm very impressed by the tool that Dr. Scorza showed us. Uh, you know, we envision an outcome when we pass any set of motions. Uh, and then hope that someone will figure out how to get from here to the outcome that we want, which takes a lot of steps. And uh, this tool looks to me to be a very, very important one, um, informative and um, complex for sure, but the overlay of all the different indicators of need are complex in and of themselves. So I simply wanted to praise the work and uh, thank everyone uh, for all the time that they're putting in on this. It's going, I hope, to help us really focus our ARP funding uh, in an equitable way and in a transparent manner. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Supervisor Solis. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I also want to extend my thanks to Fizia, Dr. Scorza, and Dr. Ferrer for the presentation. I know a lot of work's gone into this, and. I frankly, I hope that we can use this tool for all of our funding that we have to oversee because it makes sense and data and uh, looking at trends are very important to how we plan out uh, where we need to go as a county. So I'm really very impressed with uh, the uh, agility and the efficiency and putting all this work together. I think it's very commendable, but I do have, I continue to have some concerns because I know we have a ways to go and part of it uh, it deals with contracting opportunities that we have with our county departments and making sure that they really do understand these tools and the usefulness of them. And I hope that we can really uh, create standards with all of our uh, departments so that they all fully understand what it is we're looking at here. Uh, and, and I, you know, again, just want to ask the questions, how are we going to reach out to these organizations so that they know how to apply for the funding? And part of what I'm already learning in my new district is that we have uh, significant uh, linguistic barriers. The fact that we don't have many of our materials in other languages. I was just visiting out in the uh, west, the east, no, it's not west, the east Hollywood area, where a large number of the Thai, Thai community resides. And they were telling me about how hard it was during the pandemic to try to get information to small mom and pop owners, that there was no information available in their language. And they, in fact, had to get volunteers to help them go online. Many were not even able to access a uh, computer, so they had to go somewhere else to get that assistance. So I'm just hoping that when we think about uh, really getting information out to our, our different departments, that they think about the populations and the different languages that they speak, Thai, Vietnamese, Japanese, Tagalog, Mandarin, Cantonese, just to name a few. So I hope... Uh, 
I don't, you know, it's more of a more of a comment, but I do think it is really important. I did have a question for Dr. Scores. I understand that the list you put together of the high needs community is not comprehensive, and I I just like to know if well, we're going to see revisions or additions where we'll see more unincorporated areas also reflected, such as Bassett, Valinda, Roland Heights, and other high need areas that I believe. Um, also uh, deserve equal attention. They're not cities, they're unincorporated. So we therefore uh, are their so-called mayors. So Dr. Scores, just a response from you on that. Yes, you thank you so much for that question, Supervisor. Um, that is such an incredible uh, consideration. I wanna thank you for lifting it up. Um, what's great about the Equity Explorer is that it captures the needs in those neighborhoods and it allows our departments to filter out by um, those locations as well. So uh, as you noted, the list that we provided was just a short sample of the communities with the highest and high needs, but the departments are able to see the unincorporated areas that you've um, uh, just listed uh, and utilize the information they have for those locations in their program designs and in their data. Uh, we are ensuring that they're considering unincorporated areas, um, but they're also largely following the direction that they're receiving um, from their director, from the department director, and from uh, 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 their uh, sub subject matter expertise, and they're utilizing that to help drive project design. So in short, yes, they are able to see those communities of need in unincorporated areas, uh, and we will continue to provide um, access and updates uh, to the tool for all the supervise for all of your staff so that they uh, can also uh, make note of areas that we should focus on. And maybe this is a question for Fisha, but with respect yeah. to the language, you know, language accessibility, I think that's going to be really uh, critical. As I said, there's so many diverse API communities as well as uh, in indigenous languages being spoken. And I'm just, you know, wanting to hear if we're going to be able to also fit within our infrastructure uh, the capability of having staff that speak these languages or working with CBOs that can do that work for us. I think that just has to be underscored. I really would like to hear a response on that. Yep. Thank you, Supervisor. If I could just respond to your first question also to Dr. Scorza. One of the things that we can do, we know that sometimes when we show information to um, uh, preview information, whether it's for our departments or anyone else, people might think that that is the set list. So Dr. Scorza has already indicated that departments can use the data, they can slice it and dice it to kind of call out uh, for example, unincorporated areas. But I also think we can update the list just um, in terms of it being illustrative as an example uh, to the department so that it doesn't just include uh, census tracts and cities, but also an unincorporated area. So we'll work on that. On the issue of uh, the diversity of languages, so um, we are in the process of, or we actually have secured uh, translation services for our art materials. We want to have them translated. I think it's, is it 12? Yeah, seven and oh, seven. Okay. So in about seven or eight different languages, <clears throat> that information we actually want to push out in a very specific way uh, to the community, to the relevant communities that speak those languages. Um, and we want to do it in a very intentional way using social media, providing toolkits, et cetera. On the issue of contracting, I believe you mentioned with community-based organizations to carry that message I think we actually have an infrastructure uh, for that already that we've actually funded with CRF and we also set aside uh, funding under ARP, your board did, tranche one for hyper-local um, communication. And I think that that's where that fall, that's where that effort would fall. So we will make sure that as we translate these materials that we don't just push it out using social media uh, but that we will also include it as part of our hyper-local um, ethnic media outreach. Thank you. And, and then just lastly, thank you, Madam Chair, for the time. I wanted to thank Dr. Ferrer uh, for her work on the updates on this critical program, the Home Visitation Program, and especially the Nurse Family Partnership. In fact, I know my team recently met with representatives from your department as well as DPSS, DC, DCFS, and DMH regarding the program and its future viability. DPSS and DCFS shared how critical the work uh, that you all are doing with the NFP is to support some of the most high, high acuity clients. There's no doubt in my mind how important this program is. 
and I was glad to help advocate for ARPA funding to support the program and also lead a motion to support NFP, and I'm thankful for your presentation today, but I know the long-term funding for the program remains an open question, and I want to begin there. How long will this funding support ARPA program, and what are DPH's plans to preserve the long-term viability of the program? And if you can, discuss some of the past funding challenges and what support you could use from other departments and the board to sustain the program. And beyond simply sustaining the program, what support do you think would be needed to help us expand and elevate the level of services provided by uh, the NFP uh, practitioner, practitioners? Those are my questions for Dr. Perun. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Supervisor Solis. And, and also want to thank all of the board for, for their support and leadership. Uh, and recognition of the important role that home visiting plays. And, and there are lots of different models. Um, and the nurse family partnership model uh, obviously is, is one of the more intensive models uh, because it requires clinical uh, providers to help round out that team. But many families are asking for different levels of support. And I'm proud that here in LA County, um, you know, e even before we had uh, this amazing uh, new investment uh, with the ARPA funds, you know, we had, you know, probably close to uh, $30 million invested in a variety of home visiting efforts. Um, and, you know, DPSS has, has been really one of our most important partners, and, and we work with them through the CalWORKs program uh, to provide a lot of support uh, for, for their um, eligible residents. Um, around, you know, the additional support that people we, uh, need as they're transitioning into a work environment. So, you know, we've just been really pleased with uh, that partnership. We also have a family stabilization program that we work with them. And then we've received a, a lot of funding as well, or a significant amount of funding that we get from the state around expanding some of our uh, maternal, infant, and early childhood home visiting investments. So I, you know, I, I feel that we've we've carved a path with multiple sources of funding. Um, but you're right. I think the vision here in LA County is that every single family um, that's welcoming a, a new child uh, has an opportunity to get the support that they need, and that support will be varied. Uh, depending on those individual circumstances. And, and ideally, um, in some ways, there's a menu that families get to select from so that no families uh, feel unsupported during what can be some of uh, the most challenging times, with a particular emphasis on those uh, families and individuals that are already uh, facing significant challenges. So I, I love the fact that we're able to use the ARPA funding to actually extend uh, services and support for some of uh, our individuals and families who, who have, you know, really significant needs uh, that we as a county can be helping with. So I, I want to recognize uh, what you said was, was really important, Supervisor, about connecting to other departments, uh, both because oftentimes uh, they may uh, be working with or supporting a family who would benefit from home visiting, and, and we'd love to get make sure those referrals are happening. But also there are times where a family receiving home visiting services would benefit from some of the services and support that are offered across our many departments. Um, so I think, uh, again, opportunity here to strengthen uh, both the county network and then our network of supportive services from our community-based organizations that also uh, provide a lot of support for home visiting. Thank you. Thank you very much to all. And thank you again, Madam Chair, for allowing me to ask questions. Of course. Helpful information. Any questions from any other um, supervisors? Okay. Thanks to the team for, um, again, bringing us valuable information in the standing item. I think the Equity Explorer tool just shows you the power of data collection and the power of technology that, that um, creates opportunity for us to dig very deep on a granular level to really understand the needs of our communities um, and ways in which we can use these funds to meet their needs. And as Supervisor Salih said, to rethink our budgeting process based on that, that really micro level of that analysis. So thank you very much. This report is received and filed. Hearing no objections, that will be the order. Set matter two. 
We'll now hear a presentation once again from Dr. Barbara Ferrer, Director of our Public Health Department, and Dr. Christina Galley, Director of our Department of Health Services. Dr. Ferrer, we'll begin with you. Yeah, good afternoon, and, and thank you so much, Supervisor Mitchell and the entire Board of Supervisors for your ongoing support, guidance, and leadership as we continue navigating uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. I also wanna take a minute and, and wish Supervisor Kuehl a, a very happy birthday. Uh, we appreciate, as always, the opportunity to provide you and the residents of LA County an update on public health pandemic response. In today's presentation, I'll share our COVID uh, metrics on case hospitalization and death rates by vaccination status. Uh, LA County's vaccination coverage. Uh, we'll also talk about the updated business compliance numbers uh, with masking requirements and then close with information about our plan and mitigation strategies as we anticipate entering uh, what we're gonna call a post-surge phase. Uh, I'll take the first slide or the next slide. Uh, we do continue to be encouraged, as you can see here, by the steep decline in cases and hospitalizations over the past weeks. Uh, this slide shows cases, hospitalizations, and deaths over the course of the pandemic, and it clearly shows that we recently experienced the steepest increase in cases, that's that green line, and a corresponding significant rise in ho hospitalizations, that's the orange line during this winter surge. The good news is that we're experiencing this rapid decline in cases and a steady decrease in daily hospitalizations. However, as you can see here, our case and hospitalization numbers are still almost as high as they were during the peak of last winter's devastating surge. And tragically, uh, the blue line at the bottom shows that our deaths are not declining yet. And we averaged about 70 deaths a day over the past week. Take the next slide. Uh, as you'll see on the next few slides, case hospitalization and death rates vary significantly by vaccination status. On this slide, as in the next few slides, you'll see COVID-19 trend lines for three groups. Unvaccinated individuals represented by the dotted lines, individuals who are fully vaccinated but didn't receive their booster dose represented by the dashed lines, and individuals who were fully vaccinated plus had their booster dose and that's represented by the solid lines at the bottom. For all groups, although case rates are still very high, we're relieved to see these sharp declines. For the week ending January 22nd, individuals who were fully vaccinated but had not received a booster were about, were about two times less likely to be infected with COVID-19 than unvaccinated individuals. Meanwhile, those who were fully vaccinated and had a booster dose were about four times less likely to contract COVID-19 than unvaccinated individuals. Next slide. If you look at our uh, latest hospitalization data, you see even more striking differences in outcomes between vaccinated and unvaccinated individuals. For the week here that ended January 22nd, residents that were fully vaccinated but hadn't yet received a booster dose were six times less likely to be hospitalized for COVID-19 than those who were not vaccinated. Those who were fully vaccinated and boosted had even higher levels of protection and were about 22 times less likely to be hospitalized than unvaccinated individuals. I'll take the next slide. During this winter surge as COVID-19 hospitalizations rose, we also saw an increase in the number of COVID-19 patients requiring care in an intensive care unit. As expected, the data show that unvaccinated individuals were the most likely to require intensive care, uh, care, intensive care, care in the intensive care unit, and that COVID-19 patients who were fully vaccinated with a booster dose were the least likely to be admitted to the ICU. For the period that ended January 22nd, residents who were fully vaccinated and had a booster dose were about 31 times less likely to need care in an ICU than those who were not vaccinated. Fully vaccinated individuals who did not have a booster dose, dose were about eight times less likely to be admitted to the ICU than unvaccinated individuals. Next slide. When reviewing death rates by vaccination status, we can't calculate stable rates yet for vaccinated individuals separated by booster status because there are just so very few deaths of people who are vaccinated and boosted. So we're only comparing deaths between all fully vaccinated people, that includes both boosted and not boosted, 
and unvaccinated people on this slide. When looking at deaths, unvaccinated individuals had worse outcomes than vaccinated individuals. For the period ending January 15th, individuals who were fully vaccinated were about 12 times less likely to die from COVID than those who were unvaccinated. It's evident that vaccines continue to provide significant protection against COVID-19 and especially against severe illness and death. And the booster dose provides an important extra layer of protection against disease and severe illness. Next slide. We, uh, given the importance of vaccination coverage, we continue, oh, uh, given the importance of uh, understanding what's uh, going on uh, uh, by race and ethnicity in terms of our outcomes. Uh, we also looked at uh, case rates uh, by race and ethnic groups as well as hospitalization rates. And as you can see here, uh, I and I want to call attention to the differences for folks who are vaccinated. Race and ethnicity uh, plays a critical role as well as vaccination status in affecting uh, both whether or not people are infected and whether or not uh, those that are fully vaccinated uh, end up hospitalized. And, and unfortunately, uh, as you can clearly see here, black and brown residents in LA County who are vaccinated have a higher rate of infection when compared to white and Asian residents. And the same thing holds true uh, for uh, those who are fully vaccinated and uh, end up needing hospitalizations. Uh, and here, uh, the difference is twofold. Um, a possible explanation for the fact that uh, fully vaccinated individuals don't all uh, enjoy the same level of protection is most likely related uh, to two facts. One is that black and brown residents have higher rates of underlying comorbidities uh, that place them at greater risk. Um, for illness and severe illness um, from COVID. And many of our black and round, brown residents are also essential workers who have more exposures both at work and in their community settings. Next slide. Um, given the importance of uh, vaccination coverage, we also continue to track our incremental progress in vaccination rates, uh, noting that 69% of LA County residents are fully vaccinated 90% of adults 65 and older are fully vaccinated, and 73% of those five and older are fully vaccinated. While there are almost 8 million residents vaccinated, there are 1.7 million residents currently eligible for vaccine that haven't received their first dose, and 526,000 children under five that are not yet eligible. Among the 6 million LA County residents ages 12 and older, currently eligible for an additional booster dose, 2.7 million eligible residents, so that's about 45% of eligible residents for boosting, didn't get uh, their booster dose yet. Given the waning protection of the initial vaccine series, it is important that those who are eligible for a booster dose receive that dose as soon as possible. Next slide. Uh, the graphic on this slide uh, highlights the results of a study published by the CDC based on data collected and analyzed by scientists from the California Department of Public Health and the University of California at Berkeley. The study analyzed the effectiveness of face masks or respirator use in indoor public settings for preventing COVID-19 infection based on a case control study that enrolled randomly selected California residents who had received a COVID-19 test result between February and December of 2021. Similar to other studies, wearing a mask in indoor public settings was associated with lower odds of uh, having a positive test result, especially when compared with never wearing a face mask or respirator in these settings. And wearing the respirators provided the most protection and was associated with 83% lower odds of a positive test result compared with not wearing a face mask or a respirator. The next best protection was provided by a surgical mask associated with 66% lower odds of a positive test result compared with not wearing a mask. These findings showed consistently wearing a face mask or respirator in indoor public settings significantly reduced the risk of getting infected. This is particularly, uh, this is a particularly important layer of protection to use 
when there are large numbers of breakthrough cases, as we have seen with Omicron, and during times of high transmission. Next slide. Because mask wearing is an effective strategy for reducing the spread of COVID-19, compliance at businesses with indoor masking requirements during times of high transmission remains important. Masking requirements can reduce transmission without much disruption to people's routines while helping businesses reduce risk for their customers and workers. And while I know there's been a lot of focus on what was happening and what happens in our uh, large arenas, I, I want to sort of shift a little bit and talk about what happens at most of our business sites. Uh, the health officer order currently requires that with limited exceptions, all persons two years of age and older wear masks while, indoor, while in indoor public settings and businesses. And beginning on January 17th, employers across the county were also required to provide their employees who work indoors and in close contact with other workers or the public with well-fitting medical masks, surgical masks, or higher level respirators. As we just saw on the previous slide, these upgraded masks are better at blocking virus particles than cloth masks, and they provide additional protection both to workers and customers. Between January 21st and February 3rd, public health conducted over 1,500 site inspections to assess vaccination verification where appropriate and mask compliance, including whether employers were providing upgraded masks. And we're encouraged to see that com compliance was near or above 90% among restaurants, bars, nightclubs, lounges, breweries, food markets, hotels, and food manufacturing plan plants for customers wearing masks employees wearing upgraded masks, and vaccination verification were applicable. For gyms, compliance for customer and employee, employee mask wearing was around 80%. For garment manufacturers, compliance for employee, employee mask wearing was at 70%. We appreciate the businesses, communities, and public's adherence to these safety requirements, which we know helps reduce the spread of COVID-19. On the next few slides, I do want to just share the public health plan and strategy as we enter post-surge. We'll go on to the next slide. Uh, as our COVID-19 metrics continue to improve, we've begun to plan for post-surge approaches that can minimize, minimize COVID-19 risk after our winter surge has ended. I want to emphasize that post-surge does not mean the pandemic is over or that transmission is low or that there will not be additional unpredictable waves of surges in the future that will require integrated public health measures. Rather, post-surge acknowledges that we're stabilizing with consistent declines from the surge peak, and it realigns our current public health response to meet current mitigation needs. And while we move through the short term, where masking in some settings will continue to be a key part of our post-surge COVID-19 strategy, some changes will occur soon. We share in the desire to take masks off. The issue is one of timing. Masks provide an essential layer of protection when transmission is high, and they help us reduce exposures and drive down case numbers. Because mask wearing is an effective strategy for reducing the spread of COVID-19, uh, uh, we, uh, we are glad, sorry about that, um, we are glad that um, we can use that mask wearing to safely do routine activities that we love, even when transmission is high, because we're able to layer in protections. And those protections include as well testing, vaccinations, and infection control, along with masking. On December 15th, when the governor issued the statewide mask mandate, LA County reported 1,600 new cases and there were 772 people hospitalized with COVID. Across the state, there were about 5,500 cases reported on December 15, and 3,600 people hospitalized. On February 6th, we reported over 7,000 new cases and over 2,700 people hospitalized with COVID in LA County. Across the state on February 6th, there were over 73,000 new cases and almost 10,600 people hospitalized with COVID. Our case numbers today are more than four times higher than they were on December 15th because transmission remains really high. 
And while it's always important to assess personal risks and benefits, public health is also charged with assessing risks and benefits across populations. The costs of high transmission are not just borne by individuals, and it's not distributed equally. High transmission, as we just experienced, leads to severe disruptions associated with staffing shortages, reduced economic security for the many without sick pay when quarantining and isolating, and higher morbidity and mortality for those most vulnerable and those with more exposures. In the month of January, there were over 841,000 new cases of COVID in LA County, including 265,000 cases among children. In the month of December, 396 individuals died from COVID, and that's compared to 163 individuals dying for, from pneumonia and flu. And there remain unknown, and there remains a lot of unknowns around the burden of long COVID and MISC in terms of ongoing disabilities and disruptions. Being cautious still makes sense and doing everything we can to drive down the high rate of transmission is an appropriate goal for us to continue to embrace as a community. And the steps we're taking are helping us move in the right direction. Public health will consider LA County to be post-surge when COVID daily hospitalizations drop below 2,500 for seven consecutive days. One of the most harmful consequences of this winter surge has been the extraordinary pressure on the healthcare system, forcing many hospitals to postpone routine services and divert patients to other settings. The return of most hospitals and healthcare facilities to providing the full range of services needed by patients and residents is an important indication of reduced danger to the county. When LA County moves into the post-surge period, Masking will no longer be required while outdoors at outdoor mega events or in indoor outdoor spaces at childcare and K to 12 schools. In alignment with the CDC recommendations post surge, masking will continue to be required for indoor establishments, including indoor offices and work sites, indoor events and high risk settings until we can meet one of the following conditions. LA County has had two consecutive weeks at or below moderate transmission, which uh, as defined by the CDC is fewer than 50 new cases per 100,000 persons in the past seven days. It's a weekly rate. Uh, we anticipate you know, being able to get to moderate transmission if we can continue to drive down uh, the rates as we are right now on our cases. Uh, within a few weeks, uh, but we're not there yet. Um, another metric that would allow us to uh, eliminate a mass indoors uh, in most settings would be uh, when vaccines have been available for children under five for eight weeks. Um, eight weeks is how long it takes for a child to be fully protected um, from what will be the Pfizer vaccine. And again, we anticipate that that vaccine will be available uh, to residents, uh, hopefully by the end of the month. Um, where there are federal and state regulations, masking also will continue to be required. And this includes when riding public transit and in transportation hubs as required by federal regulations. And it includes indoor masking requirements at TK through grade 12 schools, childcare, youth settings, healthcare settings, correctional facilities, homeless and emergency shelters and cooling centers as required by the state. Uh, those uh, requirements are not lifted by the state on January 15. Local jurisdictions cannot be less restrictive than the state or the federal government. So it's important to note that the school indoor masking requirement remains in effect per the state order. Sites will also need to continue to adhere to any applicable masking requirements that are included in health officer orders or all facility letters for healthcare facilities. We'll be asking that employers continue to provide workers with high quality and well-fitting masks if their jobs put them in close contact with other workers or with the public. Until transmission is low, we'll also continue to recommend that we do keep our masks on whenever we're in close contact with others in indoor or outdoor crowded spaces. We know that throughout the pandemic, businesses and organizations have voluntarily put extra precautions in place to protect workers, customers, or the public. 
They'll continue to have the discretion to require masking of workers, customers, and the public. As we've shared many times, masking is one of the easier steps we can all take to reduce the spread of COVID-19. And we thank residents for continuing to take this action to protect themselves, protect workers, protect those who cannot get vaccinated, and those at high risk of severe illness while transmission rates remain so high. I just wanna move on to the next slides and just briefly note some additional important strategies in our post-surge plan that will position us to mitigate risk. Um, it's really important that vaccination testing and contact tracing uh, play important roles in post-surge. Vaccination verification will continue to be required at mega events and in the indoor portions of bars, lounges, nightclubs, wineries, wineries, sorry, uh, breweries and distilleries. Uh, testing uh, will continue to be required by businesses, local or state health officer orders, Cal OSHA or state all facility letters in high risk settings. This includes testing at nursing facilities, uh, long-term care facilities, healthcare facilities, shelters, correctional facilities, and schools. Testing continues uh, to be required for entry into mega events for those not fully vaccinated, for exiting quarantine and isolation early, and for outbreak management. Otherwise, testing is optional. And case identification and contact tracing will also continue to support the isolation of positive cases and quarantining of close contacts, at least until we're at lower levels of community transmission. We'll focus in four areas of post-surge. Uh, we'll continue electronic communication with those who have a lab reported positive test result so that they can get information about isolation and notification of their close contacts. We'll prioritize contact tracing in settings where there's high risk for transmission or severe illness. We'll maintain our call center so those with a positive test result can call us to get information and support and we'll be disseminating information at testing sites about how to handle a positive test result. These strategies will continue to help prevent COVID transmission and protect our workers and our residents uh, from, uh, from COVID-19. On to the next slide. Another important strategy for mitigating the worst effects of COVID is improving access to and distribution of therapeutics especially of the approved oral medications for people with COVID-19. While currently there's a really scarce supply of the newer therapeutics, we are working to build an infrastructure that will ensure that those in hard hit communities and those with less access to healthcare will be able to get information and access to therapeutics as they become more readily available. And here our efforts include expanding our network of providers with information, supply of therapeutics and prescribing ability. Expanding our network of distribution sites, including pharmacies and community clinics that will be able to distribute the oral medications. We'll be establishing a call center where residents can get more information about and how to access, about the therapeutics and how to access the therapeutics. And we're considering using some telehealth platforms at public health clinics or other community sites to uh, improve access in places where uh, we think uh, there's not enough access. Next slide. When we move into the post-surge phase, public health's equity-focused response will remain focused on protecting the medically vulnerable, protecting essential workers, protecting hospitals and health system functioning, and supporting a subset of vital institutions, such as those that provide government services, schools, childcare, and emergency response. The role of public health post-surge will continue to be to protect those most vulnerable and at highest risk of severe COVID-related illness. We'll also keep working to ensure an equitable distribution of the information, resources, and opportunities needed to prevent COVID transmission and severe illness. Over the past two years, the pandemic has illuminated stark inequities in the burden of disease by race and ethnicity and geography with black and brown communities and those living in under-resourced neighborhoods experiencing higher case, hospitalization, and death rates. These disparities didn't happen by chance, and they reflect decades of disinvestment, marginalization, and racism. Calls for minimizing public health response activities too early can have an unintended consequence of exacerbating inequitable outcomes, 
since the existing healthcare and social service systems are not adequately organized and supported to provide the most vulnerable and marginalized with the necessary resources to mitigate the impact of the virus. The post-surge plan we have laid out takes into account systemic health and social inequities, the continued disproportionalities that the data consistently shows and acknowledges that there are steps we can continue to take collectively to keep our economy open while reducing the burden of illness and devastating deaths caused by this dangerous and unpredictable virus. Thank you, and I'll gladly take any questions after Dr. Galley's presentation. Thank you, Dr. Galley. Can you can you hear me now? Yes, if you could speak a little uh, louder, Dr. Galley. Sure. Thank you, and and good afternoon or good morning, supervisors. Uh, I'll keep my comments uh, fairly brief and move to the through the slides quickly. But if you'd like to come back to something. Uh, please just let me know and happy to answer any questions. If you could go to slide three, uh, this shows our trend across the four DHS hospitals. If you could go to slide three, please. Thank you. Uh, the four DHS hospitals showing the rate of hospitalization among individuals with a positive COVID test and showing the recent decline that we've been experiencing over the past couple of weeks. This is a very welcome change and it reflects the overall decline that we're also seeing in community transmission. As community transmission goes down, we're also seeing a smaller number of staff calling out uh, because of the need to isolate or quarantine. Despite this welcome improvement, we still do have staffing shortages resulting in closed beds, uh, non-essential procedures and surgeries being postponed because staff are being reassigned to generally inpatient areas. We do expect that we will see a gradual improvement in that uh, situation every week over the next couple of months. On the next slide, slide four, uh, you're familiar with this slide. It shows the percent of cases uh, for individuals who are hospitalized with a positive COVID test, the percent of those people that are admitted for COVID. Uh, historically, that ran around the, the uh, kind of more recent, in the most recent surge in December and January, that 40% mark. Uh, and it was higher earlier in the pandemic, as you can see in the slide. However, more recently, that number has also declined. Uh, we of note only use PCR tests. We don't use antigen tests for our inpatients, and we know that PCR tests remain positive for weeks or sometimes months after an, infec in, after an infection. And so this uh, uh, is an expected shift in the data, and we expect that that percent percentage will continue to trend down over time as the number of people uh, admitted for COVID goes down and what we see is just the residual individuals who are admitted with a positive COVID test, most likely from an infection that was in the distant, more distant past. Next slide, slide five, looks at our staff booster rate. We're working toward a March 1st compliance deadline as established by the state. And currently about three quarters of our staff are currently have provided documentation of booster. Next slide, slide six shows the latest status at the quarantine and isolation sites that are operated by the county. If you go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, as you'll see, we have both greater capacity and also a greater share of that capacity that is currently unutilized. As cases are now declining in the community, we will begin to decommission sites uh, to lower our overall Q&I footprint. Uh, specifically, we will be downsizing the beds at MLK beginning uh, next week. We'll also be transitioning the sobering center in downtown LA back uh, out of Q&I operations to shift back to its original role of being a sobering center. Uh, and then we'll also plan to end operations of the shelter hotel at the end of February. Uh, now I'll shift to testing. If you could go to the next slide and the next slide again. Uh, this sh slide shows uh, our effort to increase testing capacity throughout January and February. Uh, we continue to increase testing capacity through February with additional test sites that are still slated to launch this week, and I'll go over those in just a minute. Next slide, slide nine. Our overall testing demand is coming down as the Omicron surge subsides. Uh, if you look on the far right of the slide, the blue shade is completed tests and the yellow and green shading is unused tests. 
and you'll see that currently less than 50% of the capacity is currently being used as of the most recent data available. All county and state sites uh, that are in operation have same day appointment access and are taking walk-ups. Next slide, slide 10. The COVID, the county's COVID testing website is available as a resource for county residents. Residents can search for county, state, uh, and other partner sites by location and availability. The test sites have been vetted to ensure that they offer an EUA approved test to all county residents with no out of pocket costs. So this is a great location to go to if you have a question about whether or not a particular test site has been uh, vetted and ensured that they meet those criteria. The website also has links to the at home test collection program and sites for pickup and dis, uh, of test kits also has a site uh, link for frequently asked questions and a weekly weekly COVID testing dashboard is also uh, linked there. Next slide, slide 11. Thank you. There are currently 28 pickup and drop off test kit locations across uh, the county at the present time. Uh, all of those are in operation. There's a number that are available in libraries. Generally, the hours of operation of the pickup and drop off matches the opening hours of the libraries during the week during staff for staffing reasons. Uh, the libraries do not have that option that's currently available on weekends and the pickup and drop off option closes generally about an hour earlier than the library does to allow for courier pickup and uh, uh, closure of the site for the day. The return rate on those kits that have picked up, are picked up at these 28 sites, including but not limited to the library, remains fairly low. Uh, and that same thing applies to the at-home mail kit program, which is still in operation. The percent that's been returned cumulatively to date since we relaunched it at the end of December uh, is the return rate is 24% for the kits that are mailed to individuals' houses and 38% for the kits that are picked up by individuals at these pickup and drop off locations. We're still evaluating approaches to work to increase those return rates. I would encourage people to please just take the tests and ask for the test to be mailed to you if you have an immediate need for their use. But due to the low rate of returned kits, which has a higher cost to the county, we will likely begin to discontinue or at least ramp back down those test collection programs and the test pickup program in consultation with your offices. Next slide, slide 12. Looking forward, there are eight additional testing sites that opened since our last meeting, including two federally funded sites. The pending sites were planned with testing partners in January. We will keep looking at testing demand in the coming weeks and evaluate ways to better match our test capacity with demand. We do anticipate significantly less need for testing and reduced hours and days of operation at testing sites over the next few weeks with potential site closures starting later this month. And we'll keep you in the loop on all of those conversations as well. Uh, we'll also continue discussions with your teams and really grateful for their ongoing partnership uh, about how the county would like to continue to see the community testing uh, function be provided as we continue the course of this pandemic and what the role is of community testing moving forward uh, and what ways we might be responsive to the community's needs uh, in combination with also the testing that's provided within the established health system. And with that, I'll close and happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ferrer and Galley. I can get members back on the screen to see raised hands for questions. We'll start with Supervisor Solis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I wanna thank uh, again, Dr. Barbara Ferrer and Dr. Galley for this presentation. It's rather sobering, I think, to hear that while we can see we are coming out of, of the pandemic to a certain degree, we still see numbers that for me are still very alarming, especially amongst our youth uh, and the ages of 12 through 17. Uh, and the fact that we only have still 69% of LA County residents uh, that are fully vaccinated. Um, and I think sometimes that's lost on us, but I just wanna share something with my colleagues. You know, this past week I was out two weeks ago out in uh, not just East Los Angeles, but also in uh, newer parts of my district out in Roland Heights where Supervisor Han used to represent the area. And what I find is that there were a lot of multiple families coming in together to receive tests 
And uh, knowing that they could only receive two sets, that means four, there's two tests for each kit. Um, it was pretty uh, disheartening to know that you had multiple uh, family members, uh, typically in Latino and Asian families, where you have more than five or six children, including perhaps an older relative, grandparents or other siblings that, that live there uh, that may be related to the parents. And I, I really think that uh, we may not have a full uh, picture or view of what the need really is in, in some of our areas that we represent. So I really do want to see how we can continue to target this population and make sure uh, if, if I can suggest that we use, as we did early on, uh, younger people to help convey this message. Because I really think that hearing from myself or perhaps people who are in the know may not translate in the manner that we need to see with our young people and with our parents. Because our parents also, I think in our, at least in the uh, Latino community, I can see where many parents are still hesitant to get their younger children vaccinated between you know, five and, and 17. They're not encouraging them enough. And I think that that's, uh, that's gonna take us in the, in the wrong direction and prolong this, um, this effort that I think uh, many of us wanna see resolved. But we need to have very, very strong messaging. And I hope that that's something that we can do, Dr. Ferrer, Dr. Galley, uh, as we do that. And, and with respect to the mask, I mean, it's pretty clear to me that we do have to have uh, people still wearing masks, particularly the younger population, as outlined in your presentation, the people that um, have not been vaccinated is that quartile. And then looking again at um, trying to make sure that people have access to the masks. And I'm finding that that is something that uh, people in, in parts of my district don't have access to. They welcome us giving them out, but uh, it's limited. And I do think that we have to continue to still be a lot more vigilant uh, with respect to that. Um, I do wanna mention and, and thank Dr. Galley also for um, working with CDC. I know there are two uh, federal uh, testing sites that are opening up this week. I think Santa Fe Dam in our district is opening up and that uh, will be, I believe, open seven days a week from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., providing a thousand tests. But it isn't just limited to the surrounding cities around Santa Fe Dam. I would encourage us to make sure that we get outreach done to Pomona uh, and other areas that have been really hard hit by COVID and uh, still remain without access to um, the test, masks, and vaccination. So I hope uh, moving forward that you can uh, help us with this. And I'd love to hear your responses on that also from both of you, if possible. Dr. Ferrer, Dr. Galley. Oh, sure. You know, thank you so much, uh, Supervisor Feliz. And I couldn't agree with you more. You know, they, there always is going to be a lot of work we need to do around communicating effectively, making sure that those resources are getting out. I do want to note that um, there is a contract that's being signed uh, with an organization to help with the distribution of uh, higher quality masks and test kits. So, you know, we're aware that, you know, particularly for workers in lower wage jobs, uh, in, and I'm working in, in, in businesses where uh, the owners may not have a lot of resources either, that, you know, we have to do a better job on the distribution there. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that we're able to I, I think it's, it's you know, allocate about $7 million to help support that effort uh, to get both, you know, test kits and we've been working separately on the on the mask uh, issue as well. Because I do agree that it's important. And, you know, I want to thank uh, your office and, and everyone else's office for uh, really being very good about letting us know where there are communication and information gaps so that we can get our teams out. I do want to know we totally agree with you on you know, the messenger makes a big difference. Uh, we have a, a launched a two, you know, we have like three community ambassador programs in addition to, you know, the expansive community health worker slash promotora program. Uh, but we have a community ambassador program, a parent ambassador program, and a student ambassador program, which really is about peer-to-peer -peer leadership. Uh, folks come in uh, to a virtual training opportunity with us, uh, and then ongoing, you know, we have ongoing like chats where we can answer people's questions so that they feel well informed about being able to talk to others 
uh, about protections around COVID-19. And, and we have thousands of people enrolled in those programs at this point. So, uh, you know, we'll continue. We work very closely with the schools, obviously, on trying to encourage parents and students uh, to become ambassadors. And really, as you noted, uh, be able to provide a wealth of accurate information and answer questions uh, to people in their social circles and in their work circles. So thanks. Thanks for that, because uh, we, we completely agree with you. Supervisor, thanks for the comment. And I, I agree the focus on children is so important. And we've done a lot of outreach to our patients uh, through a variety of modalities. And, and similar to earlier in the pandemic, when we saw a lot of hesitancy about uptake of the vaccine, we're seeing that now less so among the adults. I think with time, those messages get through, but we're seeing it more with, with parents and concern for their children. And there is a lot of evidence about the safety of the vaccine, the efficacy of the vaccine. And it just, uh, I think, really underscores to your point, the need to move messaging out through many different ways. And, and, and in addition to that, really focus on those one-on-one -on -one conversations and relationships where people have them to help people get their questions answered, uh, help them get access to fact-based information and, and work, work with people wherever they're at on the questions they might have about vaccinations among their children. You know, just a quick question though, as I mentioned, we have, uh, you know, families, multiple families maybe living in one unit um, and you can have maybe eight people or 10 living in one household. And I know when we have our, uh, our testing site set up, we usually limit to test to test per family. Is there a way where we can expand that to allow for more when it when it is requested? And I've had I've even had senior citizens tell me, look, I'm here right now, but I have someone who lives next door who knows that I was coming. They're also seniors, but they're homebound. Um, are we able to kind of be flexible in that? Because I really do think that uh, we're not really reaching everybody we think we are. Yeah, um, that's that's what I've seen on the street. Thank you for raising that. Um, some of the, the test sites have different criteria for how many test kits that they will give out. Um, one of the challenges has been even if we um, have tried, sometimes people aren't providing the names of the additional in, uh, individuals who would be tested. And what our goal would be is to register those tests under a, an individual's name so that if by chance the test is positive, we have that right information, DPH has that right information. Uh, but uh, the point is well taken and we will we'll take that back to work with our testing partners on it as well as our direct sites and work with DPH uh, also so that we get ideally as much information to them as possible about who would be using the test. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Questions of other um, supervisors? I will just say uh, to Dr. Ferrer, I want to thank you for clearly articulating how you define post surge. And post surge has a trigger 2,500 ho daily hospitalizations for seven consecutive days. And I think I've asked you a couple times to kind of give us a trigger so we all know kind of the goal that we're striving towards. And I certainly think that is, frankly, more relevant than an arbitrary date. So thank you for that. See no further hands raised? Oh, there they popped up. We'll go with Supervisor Barger, followed by Supervisor Hahn. Thank you. I thought I had text, so I apologize. Um, you know, I've been calling for aligning with the state at, at this time, and actually with the new announcement regarding the lifting on February 16th, I still believe um, that it's important for us as a board to um, discuss this. The board has been in unison on the critical efficacy of masks to limit transmission and blunt the harshest effects of the spikes we've seen. We've all been in agreement on that. And there were those that tried to hijack what I said last week and make it about eliminating masks. Nothing could be further from the truth. I was about aligning with the state and I still believe that is the right thing to do. We've had the public health measures in place for the better part of the last two years. And we all agree that these measures are most essential when cases are spiking to protect the stress on our healthcare system. Crucial to these measures is ensuring the public responds when we sound the alarm by changing this behavior in private settings where public health measures don't reach and a majority of the transmission occurs. My concern 
and it will continue to be my concern is that these restrictions have become provisions that will last really in, per in perpetuity. I mean, when you look at the numbers that you put out, Dr. Ferrer, um, I, I feel that it's it's not even realistic. I mean, we'd have to completely eliminate COVID in order to get to a point where um, we'd be lifting most of these restrictions. Public health experts across the country are advocating for the relaxing of mask mandates, not only due to the drastically dropping cases, but also to signal that being willing to remove restrictions, we will build public trust when we need to implement measures again in the future. I'm in support of essential measures, but committing to keeping these in place until late spring is inconsistent with the public health approaches from across the state and the country. We all recognize that COVID is not going to disappear, and it is likely that there will be another spike. I believe it's imperative that we cultivate good faith and trust with our residents for when that time comes. Setting a pathway to align with the state closely after the state lifts the mandate on February 16th provides clarity and consistency to our residents, something that I'm hearing loud and clear, not only from residents in the 5th District, but from across the board, I'm sure you all are getting calls as well. So I cannot support the public health recommendations to carve out this county until late spring. I believe it's time for us to get back to where we were as a board in the middle of this pandemic where we all agreed, or I, I think a majority of us agreed, that aligning with the state was the best option. The state has public health experts that are also advising the governor. And I believe that, that the recommendation to lift that mandate is based on public health as well. And so I just find it very frustrating that once again, we are being the most restrictive with quite frankly, I don't believe the science to back up that. When you look at what happened at uh, the stadium last, last week, it told me that the inconsistency is creating confusion. And there are those that are coming in from other counties that don't realize the mask mandate that we have here in LA County. And I hear from businesses that are on the border that they're frustrated because it's pushing their business into other counties based on these mandates moving forward. So I just wanna set the record, put on the record that I will be opposing the health orders that relates to keeping in place our mandate when the state is going to be relaxing that portion of it. So having said that, I have a couple questions for you, Dr. Ferrer. Most major cities across the country and other counties in the state have moved forward with lifting mask requirements in fully vaccinated environments like offices and gyms. Not only does this public policy recognize the efficacy of the vaccine, but it also is shown to encourage people to get vaccinated, something that as a board, we all agree with. Vaccination is the first line of defense against getting hospitalized or death. But I, um, so, um, I want to ask that when the state lifts the indoor mask mandate, is this an approach you would consider for LA County? Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Supervisor Barger. I, I had a moment trying to unmute there uh, and appreciate all the support and, and the thoughtfulness of, of both the perspective and, and your question. And, and uh, you know, I, I know in general, we, we do our very best to align with the state as well because we know it does create some confusion. I think this is just a circumstance where when we look at our data uh, and we see how much transmission there is still, uh, it's really it's, it's really hard to just go ahead and, and take away uh, masks given that the vaccines don't work as well as they were before on protecting people from transmission. We have a lot of disproportionality in who's getting infected and who's hospitalized. And uh, we remain concerned about protecting essential workers uh, who have to go to work. So I, I think, you know, uh, we understand the frustration of saying this is going to be a few more weeks. You know, we're, our numbers are dropping pretty rapidly. So I just want to be clear from my perspective, there, there's no way this is a forever. Uh, this has an end point. Uh, if nothing else, it's eight weeks after there's approval of a child, you know, an early child vaccine, uh, but I think we're going to get there a lot faster if we continue with the decline. The issue is 
the decline continues if the protections are in place uh, that really help us limit transmission. And uh, when we remove a lot of those, as we've seen in the past, uh, we tend to see our numbers go back up. So, you know, my, my most important concern right now is to get transmission down as low as we can before, as you said, uh, there may be another variant or something else we need to worry about um, because we never really returned to a low rate after Delta before we got hit with Omicron. So I'd like us to get to a better place. And I think in doing so, uh, we protect all of ourselves uh, from unnecessary uh, death. I do agree with you that um, there is an argument, a sensible argument to be made that in places where people are all fully vaccinated, or in this case, it would be up to date on their vaccine, similar to like what San Francisco County has done, uh, as, we're, as our numbers are dropping, uh, the risk is so much lower in that environment, you could conceivably think that those are environments where it's safe to go ahead and, and remove the mask. But for us to do that here would require us to impose uh, a new vaccination verification requirement in so many settings. We only, you know, after talking with the board, we decided to stay rather narrowly focused on the highest risk settings with the vaccination verifications being mega events and bars, lounges, et cetera, with that vaccination verification requirement. So in order for us to create, as you noted, you know, some other possibility for people to remove their masks, we would have to put in place uh, a vaccination verification requirement at places like gyms or restaurants or offices. Um, but if that's something that this board wants us to take back and consider, uh, we're happy to do that. So, I mean, I'm talking about, just for point of clarification for my colleagues, um, in office settings where everyone is 100% vaccinated, currently under the mask requirement, all are required to wear masks in that office space. And um, I've been approached by some of the businesses asking um, why that is in place when we know that, you know, we're, we're, we're uh, telling people to get vaccinated um, and when they're 100% vaccinated, they don't feel that a mask is necessary in the in that environment. So that, that was where my question was coming from. Um, I appreciate the department setting benchmarks and thresholds. I think that's very helpful um, that the public can monitor to trigger our, our county's progression through rolling back public health measures. Per my review of the data, it's my understanding that LA County has only qualified for the CDC's moderate transmission for a few weeks late last spring. Given that our case numbers were even higher this winter than they were last winter, I would expect, and correct me if I'm wrong, that it's gonna take longer uh, for our cases to drop to a point where we reach the moderate transmission and potentially possibly April or May. Many Bay Area counties previously used the moderate transmission threshold, but moved away from it as they felt that it was unreachable. As we've discussed, LA County does significantly more testing per capita, something that I think is commendable, uh, which elevates our case rate. Last year, the state released an adjusted case rate to take into account the different levels of testing. How does the CDC's threshold control for different testing levels, and if it does not, could we develop an adjusted case rate to use as a metric to more effectively track our progress? Yeah, thank you, Supervisor Barger. And, and again, I appreciate that suggestion. And, um, you know, there there is always advantages to sort of weighting um, some of the data that we use to set these thresholds. And, you know, we're, we're happy to look at that. I mean, at this point, we're aligning with, um, the CDC, which is where uh, lots of folks were. And, and I want to note that I think what was really, uh, what's really important is to take into account, you know, sort of those, uh, those overall vaccination rates. You know, I think uh, San Francisco County is 84% or 82% of all of their residents fully vaccinated. We're at 69% uh, in spite of having the most extensive access uh, to vaccinations uh, of really any county in the entire country. Um, we're still, you know, moving forward, but moving much more slowly. Um, I don't, I don't, I, I don't know that it will take us weeks and I don't know that we should look back at history of last spring, um, mostly because we didn't have vaccinations then. So I think vaccinations still provide, as I showed today, you know, 
two times less likely to get infected, four times less likely to get infected if you're boosted. Um, so I think having vaccinations may be able, having vaccination coverage is not great, but it's decent uh, here in LA County will help us, you know, get back to moderate transmission. Um, and I think we can do this. Um, I'd be the first one to say, you know, if this really ends up looking impossible, then we've got to revisit. And one reason for adding in the threshold around those 535,000 children having the opportunity to get vaccinated was to again reduce risk uh, among people who, at this point, you know, even if there's small risk to them, uh, have risk, and they also have risk, as we've seen, of spreading to others. So. Um, so I, I'm happy to, to think about if, if a waiting strategy works um, for us, because we do do a lot of testing, particularly, you know, in, during the week. Um, but, uh, and, and then get back to you, uh, you know, with, with some way to, to include a, a modified metric there that takes into account the testing. We're not trying to set the bar too high at all. Uh, we're actually trying to set a reasonable bar that says to us, it's much safer. Uh, for our workers and our most vulnerable people uh, to have masks off when there's not as much transmission. And if there's a way to rethink what that threshold is and not align fully with CDC, I'm completely open to that. Uh, what I what I think our team doesn't feel comfortable with, and, and which is why we've given you this proposal, is an arbitrary date that's actually not tied to the conditions in the community. Um, and and we don't we feel like our risk is just way too big right now, uh, with the rate that we're at. So so knowing that and and that that actually leads me to that last question and that is, um, can you explain why you think the state's data is is where it is and why they are lifting it? I mean I don't think they're being arbitrary on their date because their their announcement was based on public health experts who felt that the the dropping cases and decreasing hospitalizations statewide. I mean, they said statewide um, were such that they felt that lifting the restriction, but still maintaining the fact, and I said this all along, first line of defense vaccination. You should still continue to wear a mask um, where you, you know, in a market. I mean, I, I still wear a mask in, in areas, but not mandated. And so I'm trying to figure out what the state knows that we don't. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much, and you know I appreciate the question. I, I obviously don't have the the answer necessarily, but I, I would I would point to a couple of pieces of information that may help clarify. Uh, when the state imposed the mask mandate, uh, they put an end date on that mask mandate of February fifteenth, and all that's really happening on February fifteenth is that the man mask mandate is expiring. So they had set. Uh, this time period when they initially imposed it uh, and obviously feel comfortable uh, with the fact that it will expire. Um, and, you know, their, their considerations, I, I think, are, are just as you noted. I think they're heartfelt. I think everybody who's working uh, on trying to, you know, really mitigate uh, COVID and, and respond to the pandemic is coming from a place of, of trying to do the best thing. Uh, I do think that there are probably two ways to think about a path forward right now. One is to allow people, because we have tools, to make choices about what tools they want to use and when they want to use them. And, you know, really go back to uh, the idea that, you know, people can take individual responsibility uh, for reducing their risk. Uh, and in doing so, uh, that's helpful. I think we're not in that camp. Clearly, uh, we're in the camp that says we have some equity goals. There are some people who uh, don't have the same opportunities and resources to protect themselves as others. Um, and it's still up to us when there's this level of high transmission to build in some guardrails. I totally agree that for all of us, we need to see how it's possible to live with this virus. Uh, and I think we've done a good job here in LA County. We have stayed open through the worst surge uh, that we've ever experienced. Uh, no businesses were closed, uh, hardly any schools closed. And when they did, it was you know for staffing shortage issues. Um, and so I think we are getting better at living with the pandemic, but I don't think we have to do that 
uh, at the expense of not recognizing our responsibility um, to really protect workers um, who will be in situations when there's this much transmission of uh, extraordinary amount of exposure still without a level of protection that we think would really be helpful. So is this about equity or is this about public health? Um, Cause I, I know looking at it through an equity lens, but when you look at the numbers um, based on public health, um, do you feel that the mask mandate should remain in play based on public health, not on the equity lens? You just said you're looking at it through an equity lens. Yeah, I'm sorry if that was confusing. I, I think you know we we use different lenses whenever we're we're trying to make policy decisions, and we weigh you know it's all you you weigh your risks and your benefits you know depending on on you know what that lens is. But I will say unequivocally that uh, we should not be lifting a masking mandate uh, when we're reporting thousands and thousands of new cases every day. Uh, that doesn't make sense to us here at Public Health. Uh, that we think that rate needs to come down uh, significantly in order for us to be able to continue protecting each other and getting to a place where it is sensible uh, to reduce the uh, safety measures that we're all living with. But we don't. We just don't think we're there yet, Supervisor. I, I just and, and then I'll let go. But but so we're tying the lifting of the mask on the um, mega outdoor to 2,500 or less hospitalizations over a say, seven day period. Correct. Yes. So in that instance, it's not tied to the number of cases. So we're still at four thousand cases per day. Yeah. We're going to make that recommendation. So it's more it's tied to the hospitalization. So how do you differentiate? What's your yeah. decision in doing that based on hospitalization versus number of cases being reported? Yeah, it's it's a great question, and and uh, you know we obviously here went back and forth on thresholds. Um, I think the first priority for all of us during surges to really uh, protect our healthcare system because we all need that and we need it to work well and functional for all kinds of health issues. Um, and uh, post surge for us, it really means when we've declined enough that there's no longer a threat um, to our healthcare system. And we feel very comfortable that when we get to a no longer a threat to our healthcare system, uh, we can go ahead and in the outdoor settings, uh, lift uh, that masking mandate, knowing that in the outdoor settings, the risk has always been lower than in the indoor settings. Um, so that would be one place to start. Um, and at the time that we were developing this plan, uh, that would have aligned us with the state because at that time, the state hadn't announced uh, that they were lifting indoor masking. So we didn't really know that. Um, but again, we were feeling good about the decline that it was consistent uh, and it was allowing many of our hospitals, not all, as you heard from Dr. Galley, but many of our hospitals uh, to feel like they were approaching a time where they could reopen for all of their customary services. Um, and, and we think that's really, really important and a place to, to continue to pay attention and to start. Uh, we also know that while protecting the healthcare system is really important, as you see, I outlined protecting essential workers, protecting those most vulnerable, including residents in skilled nursing facilities, as equally important. Uh, and we think for, for that piece of the work, it remains essential to reduce transmission. I don't think we can just say we're at a point right now where trans transmission doesn't matter any longer, that that's not a driver, that we don't have to worry about how many cases we have. Uh, cases still drive, uh, the number of people that are hospitalized and they still drive our deaths. Um, and we still don't have all of the tools we'd like to have to say getting infected is no big deal. We're getting closer when there are therapeutics, oral medicines that people can take before they develop symptoms that would help them avoid getting ill or getting you know, significantly ill. You know, that again, another tool in the toolkit that allows us to reassess what other mitigation efforts we need. But we get 3,000 courses every two weeks of Pax, Paxlovid, Paxlovid, which is the oral therapeutic that everybody uh, feels has the most promise. So, you know, we're, we're a very big county. That's obviously right now being uh, doled out very carefully to the highest risk folks and not really available to most people. So we've got to 
be in a better place with those therapeutics as well for us to think that we don't have to worry so much about the numbers of people that are getting infected. Right now, I think we do have to keep, keep we have to continue to pay attention to that. Okay, thank you. Those are Th all my questions. Thank you, Supervisor Hahn. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I really appreciate the, the discussion we're having. I, I really, uh, and I think it's important to the public um, to listen to the back and forth that we just had uh, between Supervisor Barger and Dr. Ferreira. I, I really like that we're doing this in public. Um, and before I get to some of my questions to Dr. Ferrer, I, I would just like to say to Dr. Galley, thanks again for the library testing sites. Really appreciate it. No, it was some logistics involved and it was getting some uh, DSW workers involved, but I like it that we've aligned with the library hours. I've been out to uh, a few of my libraries in my district and saw the lines uh, coinciding with the, with the library hours. And I think that's, um, really a, not a good service that we're offering. I really want to thank you for that. I'm still a little bit concerned about some of these um, scam pop-up sites um, and, um, you know, uh, hoping that we are, we have some system in place to, you know, cite them or to know when they're popping up. Uh, I know I found one that was clearly um, not legitimate uh, in my neighborhood on Saturday, and it was just difficult getting a hold of anyone to sort of come out and shut them down. So, and I know we've instructed county council and uh, our Department of Consumer and Business Affairs to sort of get involved in that. I'm wondering, uh, Dr. Galley, from your point of view, or Dr. Ferrer, is, you know, do we, are we worried about these? And do we need a better system that, uh, particularly on the weekends, that we can really shut them down. And maybe my, my, my uh, twin uh, comment on this is li looking at your list of all of legitimate sites that we've got going up with libraries and parks and other places, maybe we could just um, up our game in terms of marketing and, and alerting LA County residents on where the legit sites are. I don't know if either one of you wanted to respond to that. Yes, thank you, Supervisor. Thanks for the kind comments on the libraries. We're glad to have it launched. Uh, and yes, I share the concerns about the illegitimate sites. Very sad that there's people out there taking advantage of the public with these sites to make a profit. Um, we uh, are working closely with DCBA, who is the lead entity on the enforcement side. And uh, we're working as the subject matter experts uh, also pushing out messaging about to, to the public, what to look for, what are the red flags, what should what should alert you that this is not a legitimate site. And we will keep pushing that messaging out there through as many um, media angles as possible. And, and, and I'm happy to work with CEO communications potentially on how we can push that messaging out more broadly than just through DHS's channels and DCBA. Um, and, and really, it's that messaging that's needed. We can work on enforcement, DCBA can work on enforcement and shutting them down. But if the demand's not there, because people know they don't go, they know that what a red flag is, they see it, they're concerned, and they're using the legitimate sites that are posted on the website, then they'll close down and they'll go away. So we need both the carrot and the stick uh, and that messaging to be pushed out broadly. And, and we will keep working to do just that. Right, I know because they're they're popping up maybe right next to a park, right on a Saturday. So I think that the public that is, you know, getting outside, gathering with family, having a good afternoon. I don't think they're going to see that and go, oh, you know what, this is a good time to get tested and then kind of get get taken. So anyway, I, I appreciate any effort we can all do to um, advertise our legitimate sites and try to shut down these, as you said, um, the sites that are unfortunately taking advantage of, of people. Um, so Dr. Farr, I really, again, I, I listened to your whole exchange uh, with Supervisor Barger and, you know, um, clearly, you know, you're, you're operating from, uh, you know, obviously your um, role as, as uh, you know, the protector of public health. And that's what you've always done through this uh, pandemic, and we have relied on you, uh, obviously, for your uh, advice and guidance. I will say that I also 
have felt all along that it would be better if we aligned our public health orders with the state. I think it makes the rules less confusing for our public, um, easier to follow. Uh, plus, based on a lot of the calls coming into my office and clearly the ones we heard this morning during public comment, I do think we're on the verge of losing the public's trust again a little bit in how we make our decisions. Uh, you know, I picked up both of my morning papers, LA Times and the Daily Breeze, front page, you know, the, in, in bold, 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 you know, state uh, lifting mask mandates. And I, I do think right there that that leads to, um, you know, some conflict with us and some confusion and some anger and, and frustration with the public. And I think for, for the public, you know, they're really latching on to the uh, two things that I, I think you know, are catching their, their ear. One is if we were to align with the state, um, that would mean that kids uh, wouldn't have to wear masks outdoors on playgrounds right now, and that masks would be um, optional at outdoor mega events. And it would also mean lifting the indoor mask requirement at the same time as the state does, which is on the 15th, which you said um, kind of related more to their uh, expiration of, of the previous mandate than, than any data. But nevertheless, I think the public is looking at February 15th as sort of being this day um, when uh, the indoor mask requirement could be uh, lifted. And I, you know, I think again, the, I think a lot of the public listened to the state uh, yesterday and I think they heard the state make some compelling reasons on why this is the right time to loosen restrictions, hospitalizations, have stabilized statewide cases decreased by 65% since uh, the peak of Omicron. And here in LA County, even though we still got numbers, right? Our numbers are even better than the state's. Our hospitalizations have stabilized. We saw a 90% drop in cases from the peak of 45,000 cases on January 9th to uh, a little over 4,000 uh, reported yesterday. Uh, I know you, are, want to keep uh, our measures in place until, as you said, we reach the CDC's definition of low or moderate, uh, which is about 500 cases uh, a day, and um, or until we've had the the uh, vaccines are available for kids five and under for eight weeks. Now, I did hear you say that we might get that vaccination by the end of the month, but I do think everyone, myself included. Uh, is wondering if we will ever get to that 500 cases per day threshold, because even last fall, um, between the Delta and the Omicron surges, our case, cases never dropped that low. I heard you say it, I think, to in, in an answer to Supervisor Barker, but maybe once again to the public, um, when do you, you know, all things being equal, can you predict when you think we will get to uh, 500 cases um, per day? Or do you think we're going to get to the vaccination of, uh, of uh, under five for eight weeks first? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Supervisor Hahn. Um, also, you know, for all your uh, support. And, and uh, I know none of this has been easy for anybody. Um, just a couple of things. One is to get to moderate, it's 730 cases a day. Um, that we don't need to go to low. We just need to go to moderate. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I thought it was 500. Cases. Okay. Right now, we're dropping uh, a, somewhere between 40 and 50 percent every week. Uh, now, if that continues, we'd be there in a few weeks. Um, okay. The question is if that continues. I mean, it can okay. continue if we're all careful and cautious and, you know, um, aren't really necessarily foolish. Uh, right. I, think, I think it's... I, we wouldn't have put it in there if we thought it wasn't attainable. We actually think it's attainable. We're on a pretty steep decline. A couple of, you know, concerns that remain out there that we don't have answers to. One is BA2. People have heard us talk about, you know, sort of the sublineage variant of Omicron. Mostly what we're seeing is BA1 in this country. It is associated with uh it is associated with being even more infectious than Omicron, 30 to 35 percent more infectious. If it were to take hold here, we see very little of it. I think CDC estimates that about 8 percent of the Omicron that's circulating right now, which is 100 percent of what we're seeing, is BA2. But if we were to see a lot of it, 
it could make the decline go a little slower. We don't, we see no evidence yet that it's going to result in, uh, you know, sort of more serious illness. We don't see evidence yet that people who got Omicron associated with BA1, the BA1 subtype, could be very susceptible to getting reinfected with BA2. That's a concern because people who got Delta had a lot of reinfections with Omicron, but we don't see evidence of that yet. But, you know, we have to pay attention to, you know, what could slow down our progress. As far as I could see, having BA2 take over might slow us down a little or having uh, us not attend to the basic public health measures uh that we know how that. much i mean i think we i think we've got to give the public you know <laughs> kind of something to hang on to to hope for um I, I think that's part of what i think the like if you thought two weeks we we could get there i think that's something uh, like you said very attainable but now you're talking a little bit about slowing down and so you know kind I, of, I, I, I think we really need to speak to the public in ways that they can um, you know, uh, hang on to. Yeah, I, I, I hear you. I mean, I think it's difficult because uh, I'm not going to lie and I'm not going to make yeah. promises that I that I can't make. Um, and yeah. I'm aware that with this uh, virus, there's a lot of unpredictability. And and I right. think I think we all I think know that. Public, yeah. I think the public understands that because they've been with us for two years. They've lived every single day with this unpredictability. I think in in if things go really well, like you said, uh, you know, okay. we'll be there in, in a few weeks. Uh, uh -huh. if, if something interferes with things going really well, and that's the unpredictability of this virus, then it might take us a little longer. In no case should it take us, you know, more than, you know, sort of we're hoping, I mean, I think we think the end of April is, uh, you know, sort of the, the sort of end point for us because everything okay. we're hearing indicates that we've got- I think that's yeah. Okay. I, I mean, I appreciate that. I, I, you know, before I listened to the presentation today and before I heard you kind of doing your back and forth, you know, I was ready to ask you, would you consider, because I knew you weren't going to align with the state, which I still think, you know, is, is the best uh, course to follow. But I was even going to say, would you consider, um, you know, reassessing something that was more attainable? But it sounds like you think this is attainable. Um, I'll, you know, I sure hope this Super Bowl, you know, you know, go Rams, but I'm, I hope this Super Bowl doesn't in any way, you know, slow us down. And, uh, you know, again, based on the photos that I saw from, from the last few games, uh, you know, people were not wearing masks indoors. And so I hope it's not a super spreader bowl because that would be very upsetting to all the work that we've done, all the sacrifices that people have made that have, you know, one game uh, on a Sunday afternoon in LA County in any way uh, negatively impacts our, our progress or, um, you know, the ability for, for, for kids uh, to, to go to school or play outdoors without a mask. So, uh, you know, everybody should should definitely do their part, but I, I worry about that, and I hope we won't be, I hope it won't count against us, some of those cases. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Hahn. Supervisor Kuehl. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you uh, to both of our doctors. All the questions I was going to ask have been answered in terms of the data, and I just wanted to say uh, sort of two things. Um, uh, this I love this board because it is filled with hope. But in this case, I think we have to be very careful to balance our hope and desire um, and, you know, want some relief uh, against what Dr. Ferrer has presented about the efficacy of masks and how um, people who wear them are get less uh, infections. But I'm thinking more of the people who have to go to work and be exposed to all the people not wearing masks. Um, we were very hopeful a couple, you know, a year or so ago when we reopened our businesses and um, it, it turned out not as well as we hoped. We had a, uh, you know, a surge. We didn't see it coming. Uh, we, we thought we were doing the right thing. I think in this case, you know, we've been wearing masks now for two years. 
I think that we can probably do it for another month or two. And I know people are tired. I know they're wondering, but uh, I am really concerned about, uh, you know, when the weather gets warmer, people spend more time sort of together, even when it's outside. And um, the, the fact that this can contribute to, uh, you know, greater numbers, I think is a potential problem. So I support the, I think, very thoughtful approach that Dr. Ferrer has uh, presented um, because it actually takes the real data in Los Angeles County into account, not what Sacramento, you know, thinks should be sort of a, a flat number or, or approach for the whole state. And I think that that is also a good idea for us as a board to really look at our own numbers, project from them, and try to protect uh, as well as we can. I think when Dr. Ferrer talks about equity, it's uh, also a recognition that many of our workers travel from, uh, let's say, more impacted areas, uh, less affluent areas, to work in uh, areas that might have a lower transmission rate because they don't count what you catch at work. They only count, you know, where you live. So I, um, I think this is a reasonable approach. I think we're going to make it. I'm just as hopeful as everybody else. Uh, I'm dying to see the end of this, but, uh, you know, a, a, a disease that's killed more people in America than World War II did in uh, battle and, um, uh, you know, a disease that is the highest cause of death among law enforcement officers. I think we have to continue to take really seriously and follow what I think is a reasonable approach to the science. So thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you very much to um, uh, all of my colleagues. Uh, that, this is precisely why this is a standing item um, on our agenda every week. And so this, this kind of uh, discussion can take place in the public. So um, every LA County resident can hear our discussion. And you know, public health is really population health. So valuing and recognizing the true complexity and diversity of all of LA County is an important element as we talk about what public health looks like for each and every resident. This report is received and filed. Hearing no objections, that'll be the order. Colleagues, we'll move on to item four. Uh, thank you to Dr. Ferrer and Galley for your presentations. Uh, Supervisor Hahn, item four, assessing the LA County's bridge infrastructure. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> A couple of weeks ago, I think we all saw in the news the collapse of the Fern Hollow Bridge in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, just hours before President Biden planned to visit the state to discuss uh, the federal infrastructure law. While thankfully there were no life-threatening injuries in that collapse, this event highlighted the importance of addressing aging infrastructure and assessing current state and federal funding opportunities. We wanna make sure that none of our bridges collapse Next, so with this motion, we're asking our Director of Public Works, Mark Pastrella, to provide us an assessment of all the bridges under the county's oversight. But most importantly, identify the most dangerous and come back with a plan to get state and federal funding to quickly begin those repairs. I spoke to Director Pastrella last week, and while he's confident that none of our county bridges are in immediate danger of collapsing, like the one in Pittsburgh, there is still work to be done. And he believes we must move quickly while infrastructure funding is available. Public Works is the lead agency for inspecting and maintaining 287 county owned bridges, but they're also responsible for inspecting an additional 823 city owned bridges. Uh, for an inspection total of 1,110 bridges. You know, when I was in Congress, I remember receiving reports from the American Society of Civil Engineers who would give our bridge infrastructure a letter grade A through F. Right now, our bridges in the state of California are receiving a C grade. Um, so, you know, we are, are not A, but we're not F, but clearly uh, this is an important issue, I think, and is of utmost a priority when we talk about public safety. 
we must ensure that our road infrastructure is in good condition and those that are not, we must ensure that we have the funding and that we begin to make the necessary repairs and maintenance immediately. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Barker, would you like to speak? Yeah, um, thank you. And thank you, Supervisor Hong, for allowing me to co-author this motion with you. Um, as you said, the collapse of the Fern Hollow Bridge in Pittsburgh serves as a reminder of the importance of timely maintenance, repair, and the replacement of our bridge infrastructure. It's estimated that about 20% are in need of rehabilitation and placement in this county. At the time of the collapse of the Fern Hollow Bridge, as you said, it was carrying five passenger vehicles and one bus. Thankfully, there were no reported casualties. Data from the National Highway Safety Administration shows that bridges in fair or poor condition in our county community have more than 24 million square feet of deck area. The American Society of Civil Engineers most recent infrastructure report notes that although state funding provided by Senate Bill 1 is helping meet these challenges, about 50% of the bridges in the state have exceeded their design life. We know that these types of improvements get more expensive over time. And that's always been a frustration. Even here in the county, we do deferred maintenance. And then the more we defer, the more expensive it gets. We know that these type of improvements need to be done and need to be done to protect public safety and, and health. There is hope that significant federal infrastructure funding will be available shortly. And we need to be ready to fight for this and make sure that we have the data and the need to support the funding. This assessment will position our county so it can make investments and improvements where it matters most. The numbers and statistics are indicative of the critical need to assess our bridge infrastructure and develop a plan to pursue the necessary state and federal funding to remedy the deficiencies. I wanna again, thank you, Supervisor Hom, for allowing me to co-author this. I will benefit the county as a whole and I think it'll be used as a blueprint across the state to get ready for the overall infrastructure of the state as it relates to the bridges and repairs. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? I would just say, Supervisor Hahn, I completely agree. When I was in the legislature and witnessed firsthand the vitriolic debate around SB1, I knew that based on the information uh, about bridge safety in California, there was nothing else I could responsibly do but to vote on that measure. Uh, I think the grade C you just quoted is an improvement from where we were two years ago. It was frightening to me to look at that dangerous bridge list uh, as a California resident, certainly as an Angelino. So thank you very much. Any other comments from anyone? Hearing none, moved by Supervisor Hahn, seconded by Barger to approve this item. Executive officer, please call the roll. Item four is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn? Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger? Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell? Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Item five, report relating to the critical incident in Norwalk, which was held by Supervisor Hahn. Supervisor Hahn. <clears throat> uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, colleagues, it was last November uh, that we asked the Office of Child Protection to conduct a full investigation, including the Department of Children and Family Services and other county agency, agencies. We wanted to get to the bottom of how a four-year-old boy in Norwalk who was in foster care ended up in a hospital with life-threatening injuries, allegedly at the hands of his foster mother, someone who we, the County of Los Angeles put in charge of protecting him. We asked if language or cultural barriers played a role, what history the Department of Children and Family Services had with the family and the foster family, how or if any referrals were made to the medical hub and what went wrong. The Office of Child Protection completed their investigation and released their report on Monday. So today, this motion will be asking for the implementation of their recommendations made by them, which includes strengthening policies and trainings for forensic evaluations, fully utilizing public health nurses, improving interviewing skills for social workers, and improving information sharing within the department. While I know there have been numerous recommendations like this, and there's so much more to do, this is a small next step. 
but it is one of the many next steps to really make a difference on how our Department of Children and Family Services and all of the county agencies that work with children and families can do better. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Remarks or questions by members? Hearing no other comments, item five is before us. Moved by Supervisor Hahn, seconded by Supervisor Mitchell to approve this item. Executive officer, please call the roll. Item five is before you. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Item nine, use of catalytic funding to support requests for proposals for developer services for repurposing the LAC USC General Hospital building and West Campus for housing and mixed use purposes, which was held by Supervisor Solis. Supervisor? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair and colleagues. It's with great enthusiasm and excitement that I bring this motion for catalytic funding to develop the RFP for the reuse of the LAC USC General Hospital and West Campus. And thanks to all the people that did call in and those that couldn't get in because they were overwhelmed by other callers for other items, but they were on the line trying to get through to us. And believe me, it's no secret that the reimagining of the LAC USC campus site is a top priority for many of my residents, including myself. As the county responds to another wave of the COVID pandemic, our ability to provide a range of critical public health services and housing to our most vulnerable populations has become the foremost pi priority. The reuse of the iconic, historical Old General Hospital and West Campus in conjunction with the multi-phase restorative care village is a, is a regional significant response to help us address affordable housing, health and wellness, job creation, and the COVID pandemic. And over the course of the time that I've spent on the board, I've introduced various motions members in alignment with the community to move forward for our collective vision of a healthy village, a vision at LAC USC Medical Campus. And I'm so very proud that by working with our community, we've been able to accomplish many things. Following up to my motion back in 2017, we established an actively engaged stakeholder process known as the Health Innovation Community Partnership, which consists of more than 50 community leaders representing hundreds and hundreds of our residents. The Health Innovation Community Partnership has grown to become a regional force with its members comprising of leaders and residents of the various surrounding communities, El Sereno, Boyle Heights, East Los Angeles, Chinatown, and Northeast Los Angeles. Completion of the 160 restorative care beds consisting of 96 recuperative beds and 64 crisis residential treatment beds are now there. This phase of the Healthy Village also incorporated beautiful murals and I would extend a visit for all of you to go by and see it once we prepare our ribbon cutting ceremony there. It's beautiful. And it is reflective of our community surroundings. In fact, the community participated in what type of artwork would be provided there. So it does enhance our culture, our cultural beliefs, our values, and it also helped to lift up our local artists. The completion of also a new child care, care center is gonna be underway, hopefully this May, which will not only help our employees at LAC USC campus, but also the community, the surrounding community will be able to utilize that. The Women and Children Hospital was, as you know, demolished uh, back in phase two of the restorative care village consisting of hopefully soon a 200 bed subacute psychi psychiatric inpatient facility, a recovery and respite center, outpatient and wellness center and mental health and urgent care center. Many of these components members you have already seen come to fruition on other campuses that are in your district. All I'm asking here is that we move this agenda forward so that we can also come up and be realistic in terms of meeting the needs of our community in every point and corner of the county. Uh, modern times, a job developer consultant was brought in on board to establish a regional pipeline for achieving not only targeted worker and local hire policy goal of 30%, but actually they set an aspirational goal of 50% local hire. And as of January the 10th this year, I'm proud to report that they've exceeded our 30% goal. 
And with regards to the feasibility study for the reuse of LAC General Hospital and redevelopment of the West Campus, we're proceeding in a very focused manner with the study being completed this April, this spring. In an effort to capture state funding opportunities, the motion will allocate funding to develop an RFP in parallel with the completion of this feasibility study. Members, this is a tremendous effort and it's no doubt that a good team and partnership effort was conducted. And I especially wanna thank the following partners, our chief executive office and consultants, the Department of Health Services, the Department of Mental Health, the Arts and Culture Department, Department of Public Works, state legislative partners, and the Los Angeles County delegation. And a big thank you to the Health Innovation Community Partnership and many, many stakeholders. Colleagues, I respect, respectfully ask for your support of my motion to further our critical efforts realizing the Healthy Village vision to bring this iconic and historical site to continue serving the region as a beacon of light for the most vulnerable. And I wanna underscore regional because there are people now who come to our facilities from all corners of the county and even outside of state and in other counties because they know that we have superb services that are uh, available there at the LA, LAC, LAC USC campus. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak on this matter, Madam Chair, and I ask for your I vote. Of course, other members wish to speak on this agenda item? Seeing none and hearing no further comments, item nine is before us, moved by Supervisor Solis, seconded by Supervisor Kuehl to approve this item. Executive officer, please call the roll. Item nine is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Item 10, building LA County's early care and education infrastructure, which was held by Supervisor Solis. Supervisor Solis. Yes, thank you again, Madam Chair. Um, as many of you know, early care and education should be fundamental as known as really a human right, I think for all of our children. But in this county, which is home to almost 400,000 infants and toddlers, where over half are eligible for California subsidized early learning programs, only 6% are being served by state subsidies. This is, you know, a travesty, especially when you consider the number of passionate and committed ECE providers working in the County of Los Angeles, which is why the early care and education is an issue this board has taken head on. The board has approved several motions to make sense of the complex funding streams, access county facilities like libraries to leverage ECE sites and allocate millions of dollars in CARES Act funding for childcare vouchers and much, much more. And now I believe we have a responsibility to ensure that our ECE providers can access the historic investment of $250 million in funding from the state and federal government to create an infrastructure for childcare facilities with a focus on childcare deserts. This funding will support both minor and major facilities construction, allowing ECE providers to acquire, construct, develop, and renovate facilities for our children. But we know Los Angeles County has a role to play in helping our ECE providers navigate the various local licensing, zoning, permitting, and other regulatory processes that may pose barriers to the development and expansion of such facilities. And as a result, this motion will result in a plan to remove barriers in ECE facilities, land use entitlement, and permitting processes. It will also engage partners like First 5 LA and the Child Care Alliance to develop a support system for ECE providers applying for the state infrastructure grant. And in closing, I wanna acknowledge what it is incredible uh, for those individuals that have really been working on this together. And I really wanna shout out uh, a, a high five to the following departments, the CEO, BPH, the policy round table for the child care and development, and even regional planning. This motion before you colleagues is possible thanks to the partnership of our departments with the leadership of Deborah Coleman and our director of the Office of Advancement and Early Care and Education. And it's through working with her and my commissioners, Carla Pletz-Howell and Jesse Perea, 
and this board that I know we can move mountains and help our children. I respectfully ask for your I vote. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any comments or questions? Advice of Solis, two thumbs up. Uh, you know, it, it, permitting and licensure and all of the things that complicate one's ability to open up a child care facility has really been a burden for far too many, which has helped exacerbate our child care deserts across the state and across LA County. So I'm very proud to support you in this motion, proud of what the departments have done to try to rede reduce those fees and streamline processes because when we recognize um, how many closed their doors as a result of the pandemic, um, that you know one child care seat to X number of LA County children will only grow bigger. Also proud that this county has dedicated 20 million in American Rescue Plan Act funding to provide grants to child care providers. So we're approaching it from a multiple kind of access points and that's all good, so thank you. Seeing no further comments or questions, Item 10 is before us, moved by Supervisor Solis and seconded by Supervisor Mitchell to approve this item. Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 10 is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you, Supervisor Kuehl. We are now taking up item 17, the Woolsey Fire Action Final Report and Conclusion of CityGate Oversight. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, in 2018, uh, three and a half years ago now, the Woolsey Fire erupted in the Santa Monica Mountains and became one of the most devastating wildfires in the entire history of the county, forced thousands and thousands of residents to evacuate their homes consumed almost 100,000 acres of wildlife habitat and property. Uh, shortly thereafter, I uh, brought a motion to this board, which passed to hire a third party independent consulting firm to do a deeper dive really than we've ever done in an after action report and to analyze ways that we can as a county improve our emergency response and recovery processes from lessons that we learned after the Woolsey fire. So as a result, CityGate Associates came up with an after action plan and we involved, uh, I would say maybe 60 people who met several times from all the different jurisdictions uh, to work with CityGate. And the plan included 86 recommendations. And I'm happy to report about 80% of those have already now been implemented and they will go on to improve overall safety during states of emergency countywide. So none of this work could have been done without the strong leadership from our Office of Emergency Management. Uh, shout out to Kevin McGowan, to uh, numerous other county departments, uh, especially regional planning, public works, county fire, animal care and control, and my very good friend, the sheriff, uh, that have participated in the process to really shift the way we look at emergency response, recovery, and safety. These departments also managed to continue this very difficult and ongoing work through the COVID-19 pandemic, and that was really not easy. So I also want to thank CityGate and Stu Gary uh, of CityGate, a, a real leader of this process, for their oversight and management of this after action plan and highlight just a few of the improvements put forward that our departments have already been able to implement. For instance, regional planning made amendments to the existing North Area Plan to introduce new fire hardening requirements and provisions for those who are able to rebuild their homes in order to improve resiliency and home protection. Public Works developed a private property debris removal local program that can activate response without the state's assistance from Cal OES or Cal Recycle. This is a real improvement in efficiency and it was tested. This is not just about the Santa Monica Mountains on my end. It was tested during the Bobcat and the Lake Fires recovery, which included a state and county partnership that shared resources to maximize the program's effectiveness, both for disasters that have been declared or not declared. 
LA County Fire also acquired a new mobile command software that's been field tested and will be deployed department-wide use next fire season. In addition to their new handheld and vehicle mounted mobile radios and computers being deployed for all operational units. Animal Care and Control constructed 50 additional stalls at the Castaic Animal Shelter for emergency sheltering use and um, are currently collaborating on draft MOUs for more sites. The Sheriff's Emergency Operations Bureau completely overhauled their incident management team process and conducted a number of training sessions on the updates. So although there's plenty of work still to be done, you can see that improvements have been made both on the ground and system-wide. So I give my heartfelt gratitude to OEM. They are gonna take up the torch of overseeing the remaining recommendations and uh, all the departments that have really put forth an effort to continuously improve safety for all of our county residents. So we are required to bring this motion in order to close some of these elements and let us get on with the next uh, part of implementation. And I ask for your I vote. And thank you. Comments from members? Seeing none, item 17 is before us. Moved by Supervisor Kuehl, seconded by Supervisor Barger to approve this item. Executive officer, please call the roll. Item 17 is before you. Supervisor Solis? Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl? Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn? Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger? Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell? Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. We'll now move on to item 18, amending the LA County Code to enhance compliance with and enforcement of the county's COVID-19 vaccination policy, which was held by Supervisor Kuehl. Supervisor, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Well, we heard a lot about this item today uh, in public testimony. So I wanna take uh, just a few minutes to say kind of what it really does and what we have been doing in the county. Because I think it's important to get accurate information uh, about what has been done, what is being done, and what might be the result of taking this action. So first of all, I wanna thank uh, you, Madam Chair, for co-authoring this. Also to thank County Council, our CEO, and the Department of Human Resources for their support in thinking through the motion's directives. I wanna thank the many department heads who are already doing everything in their power to promote compliance with our vaccine mandate uh, and um, to continue to promote and help their departments to comply. You know that this board already adopted a vaccine mandate for all of our county workers. And we did so because we have a responsibility to keep our clients safe when they come and seek our services, to keep our employees safe in their workplace and by reference, to keep our employees' families safe at home. We know that the vaccines work. We know that they're safe. We saw the whole report today, unvaccinated people are 20 times more likely to die of COVID-19 than fully vaccinated people. Our county family responded to the mandate. And we can proudly say that approximately 83% of our workforce have already complied with the vaccine mandate voluntarily. They have documented that they are vaccinated or as allowed by the state, they have requested a medical exemption or a religious exemption. And we have an independent panel, not overseen by us, that hears all of those requests for exemptions and makes decisions about whether uh, they are um, valid. But six months have now passed and we don't have 100% compliance. And the refusal to get vaccinated or to request an exemption, that is not even to register in the system and do one or the other, really puts county lives at risk and it is simply unacceptable. So working with our labor partners, as you all recall, we gained um, assent to a uh, countywide uh, progressive discipline process and it's really a, a five chance process. You have five separate chances to get your vaccination 
to register or register in the system for an exemption. The process starts with uh, a, a reminder. Essentially, it says to you, you know, this is the uh, process. This is what you must do. Please get vaccinated. If you don't, there's a warning, um, a write-up perhaps, a conference to discuss these expectations just to make sure that every employee in every department understands that it's required. Eventually, after quite a long time of allowing you to uh, get your vaccination and provide proof of it, there is a suspension without pay for five days. After the suspension, though, you come back and there's like another 45 days that you have to get your vaccination and put in the proof. Ultimately, of course, at the very end, after these five chances, it can result in an employee's termination. So far, that's happened, as we know, only in a handful of cases. And I honestly, and I think the rest of us would really like to keep it that way. Uh, but to protect county lives, including our clients, not just our employees and their families, we have to enforce this mandate. Every department head must be serious about enforcing departmental and countywide policies. We can't say, oh yeah, you just pick and choose the policies that you want to enforce. That's not how it works. The county has policies uh, across all of our employees. They must be enforced. And in the case of our countywide vaccine policy, not all of our department heads have recognized that this policy is critically necessary and will save lives. So given what's at stake, this country, as I mentioned before, has lost nearly 900,000 lives. The United States of America has had more, almost a million people die. And that is more than twice the number of Americans that died throughout the entirety of World War II. That is just unacceptable. We have to do everything we can. So this motion says to our department heads, we are not going to permit county lives to be jeopardized by an individual decision not to comply with county policy. This is not allowed. And you, county department head, if you will not take this matter seriously and enforce it in your department, the county director of personnel is willing to do so. And this motion is to give her that authority. To anyone also who wants to serve, who's applying to serve in an executive leadership position in LA County, this motion says, we love to have you join us. This is a great place to work, but you must be vaccinated. So the questions that were raised today, really, I think have already been put to rest. There are people who think vaccinations are not helpful. They think that they shouldn't be mandated. That is behind us. Six months ago, this board said, we mandate vaccinations for our employees. So um, as I said, 83% are fully vaxxed. Over 5,000 are going through accommodation as they've asked. Uh, they've applied for exemptions, et cetera. But there's still about 10,000 that aren't compliant. The sheriff isn't even entering data for his employees. And the sheriff's department has consistently ended up in the basement of the percentage of those people who are vaccinated, which to me is shocking because as I also mentioned earlier, the greatest um, reason for deaths of law enforcement officers by far this uh, uh, past two years has been COVID. Not something they faced on the job, something they faced because in many cases, they refuse to be vaccinated. So um, this motion essentially would give the ability to the director of, health, of the human resources department to be the person who enforces just this mandate. This is not every other countywide mandate that remains with all the department heads, just the vaccine mandate, and also would give her the ability to say, this department is doing pretty well. I cede it back to them to enforce the mandate. But in the case of departments that are not doing pretty well, 
that enforcement would be um, given to the Department of Human Resources. So before I close, I want to ask our county council, because people have said to me, can the Board of Supervisors do this? At which to me is sort of funny because it's kind of saying, can the Board of Supervisors set policy for how their employees are supervised? I, I would think it'd be an easy answer, but if I may turn to our county council for a brief answer, does the board have the authority to vest this power in the uh, head of the DHR? Thank you, Supervisor. I think I can give you a very quick answer to that question, and the answer is yes. The board does have that authority. Uh, can you think, Council, of a reason why people would say uh, that uh, we cannot vest that authority in her? Um, I mean, sir, the concern, but Supervisor, is I, I don't want to get too much into uh, potential arguments one way or the other. I, I Listening to the public comment and, and understanding what um, some letters have indicated. Um, I think it's it's the wiser course to just say that the board does have the authority and uh, and, and leave it at that. All right, I, I thank you for that. Um, I think that we really do need to have this vaccine policy enforced. Uh, I would, uh, you know, we waited quite a while before even thinking of taking this step to see how it would turn out. Uh, and so I wanna thank all the county staff who have been at the front lines of this pandemic because they're suffering from the unvaccinated people as well. People who risk their lives every day before there was a vaccine. County employees who have chosen to get vaccinated so they can continue to safely interact with coworkers and everybody coming to us for help. They are real heroes. I also want to say that um, the sheriff has sort of taken to a kind of an interesting public, um, what shall I say, campaign uh, to put out a lot of what I think he considers information um, about all the various ways that the County Board of Supervisors are not serving him well. And I think uh, you may have seen in many of the answers that much of what the sheriff has said, I, I can see why he wears a big hat because he pulls a lot of numbers right out of it. Uh, most of which can't be substantiated. Um, you know, we've increased the people who work for him. We've increased the budget. And in that case, in this case, uh, we have an absolute right to say, these are our employees, not yours. These are county employees. And we need to protect them and their families and all the people that they stop and say, you know, roll down your window. Um, and or people on a bicycle, as we saw a couple months ago. Uh, it's important. And I think that um, it's unfortunate to have to take this step in a way, but a necessary one, and frankly, I think a very good one, one that will be more um, evenly um, spread over all the departments so that we look at them all the same. So I uh, thank you very much for allowing me to present this and uh, ask for your I vote. And um, I, my board uh, chair, who is my co-author, I, I know might want to say something as well. Uh, Supervisor Q, you wrapped it all up very clearly and succinctly. Um, I appreciate you. I know that we have available um, our director of personnel, as well as Mr. Robles from the chief executive offices are available for questions. Do any board members have questions? Supervisor Barger, followed by Supervisor Hahn. I, and you. Supervisor Sleeves will follow. I see you. I hear you loud and clear, um, Supervisor Kuehl, and, and we do have the authority, but having the authority doesn't necessarily make the action right. And I believe that this action is in response to an individual. And I would like to know from um, Lisa Garrett, who has been working with human resources in the Sheriff's Department, if in fact they're complying or if they're being cooperative, because to change now over one individual or one manager, I, I don't feel is is appropriate. And I just want to understand um, from Lisa Garrett where she is working with that department. Because I went out and talked to um, sheriff's deputies who in fact have been vaccinated, but don't want to upload 
on our platform because of misinformation from this sheriff as it relates to the platform that we're using, which is a whole nother debate to have um, and totally inappropriate on his part. But it's a disservice to those employees if we don't work with the department. So I'd like to hear from Lisa. Good afternoon, supervisors. Uh, Lisa Gare, Director of Personnel. Uh, after that recitation by Supervisor Kuehl, is not much more to say, but um, as to the sheriff specifically, um, of uh, Supervisor Kuehl uh, mentioned this, about of our 100,000 uh, employees, about 9,000, 9, almost 10,000 employees uh, are non-compliant. Uh, based upon our records in the Fulgent uh, tracking system, sheriff employees uh, at, actually were at 83% uh, uh, registration rate and 54% vaccination rate. However, in around December, uh, the sheriff's employees stopped and putting their information into the system, which gives us no visibility as to uh, compliance uh, for that particular department. However, um, at that time, about 13,154 uh, of their employees were registered and about 8,902 actually provided proof of full or partial uh, vaccination. But uh, as of December 2022, 20, I'm sorry, 21, the Sheriff's Department had about uh, 2,764 employees who were not registered in the system. And as of that time, about 7,300 were not vaccinated or non-compliant with the county's policy. So, um, but Lisa, my question was more directed at the working relationship you have with human resources right now, because I'm told that in fact, you are commuting, communicating with human resources um, on this issue. Is that correct? Because I've heard that they're not being cooperative, but I've heard that in fact, you're working with them. I would say it's both supervisor. I um, have been reaching out to uh, the sheriff's department to determine what their actual numbers are. The sheriff's numbers today was uh, the first time I had heard uh, where they are uh, right now. So um, they have indicated that they are going to turn over numbers and allow uh, us to see what they are. However, I have not yet seen that. So of course we will work with the sheriff, we will work at all of the departments and we're contacting departments on a daily basis uh, practically to get uh, the numbers as far to determine how and who is in compliance with the board's, the board's ordinance. And do we get the number of um, deputies that are testing who, because I know someone called in and said that they filed a religious exemption and have yet to hear from the county regarding their exemption. Have we, I mean, where are we on all the exemptions and flushing those out? Supervisor, we received about 5,300 exemptions and we are working through those. Some are medical exemptions and some are uh, religious exemptions. So we are working on those and some of the sheriff's employees have uh, filed uh, for exemptions, they, they have. Um, but again, uh, once notice was made and the employees stopped inputting any information into the uh, Fulgent system, it's been difficult for us to see who is compliant and who is not. Of the numbers that the, the sheriff provided today, uh, that uh, 5,700 of his employees were not vaccinated. Uh, supervisor, that makes up about 60% of the county's entire non-compliance rate. Can we work with them? Yes, we will. Uh, I just have not, we've not been given access uh, to, to their recording, how they're monitoring. And uh, so again, we have no visibility into how they're complying or not complying with the order. And, um, and I don't know if this is for um, Fesia, um, but are you working with the labor partners? Work, I mean, I, I think of workarounds and I think a workaround and I've talked to ALADS and to uh, 1014 and they very much want to work with the county to work with their members that are either resi resistant to um, downloading the platform that we use and or even addressing the issue of vaccination. So. Fizia, have you been communicating with them? Thank you, Supervisor. Um, Supervisor, when this policy, the vaccination policy was uh, adopted by the board uh, and my team was in negotiations with uh, the various labor unions, there was a lot of discussion 
uh, back and forth at that time. And then I believe uh, after the announcement was made um, that folks didn't need to register in Fulgent, those conversations have sort of died down. But I do believe that uh, some of the labor organizations are aware uh, of this motion because I've received requests to uh, meet uh, at the same time that actually the teams will be negotiating over the impacts of this motion if passed. So I think the answer is we were engaging. Um, I think that engagement subsided, but it's expected to pick up again uh, due to if this motion is in fact passed. Okay, thank you. Thank you, that's my question. You're welcome, Supervisor Hahn. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I think we all agree, Supervisor Kuehl, uh, you had a, a great lead off uh, on, on this discussion and, and really outlined it well. Um, you know, this is a, a countywide policy. It applies to all of our departments. And I know when we did it, you know, we did it to keep our employees safe, to keep the public safe that our employees interact with, and, you know, to really do our part uh, as, a, as the County of Los Angeles in stopping the spread of this virus. And unfortunately, the Sheriff's Department is the only department in the county that's refused to implement this policy, and that's I think why we're here today. I think we were left with no other choice. But, uh, and I, I am gonna to support this motion, but I wanna take the opportunity today to also um, say, I think it, it's time for us to um, consider lifting the hiring freeze uh, and increasing the number of academies uh, in our Sheriff's Department to make sure that they're able to hire in a timely uh, and efficient manner to maintain a level of service that our residents uh, want and deserve and some of our cities pay for. Um, in fact, if in fact we do end up uh, losing, uh, they end up losing uh, personnel as a result of this enforcement. And I uh, hope to have discussions with our CEO uh, about this because I know for me, I am hearing from a lot of my uh, cities, uh, my contract cities who are even willing to pay more uh, and uh, to get a few more deputies. And it seems to be we're a little bit stuck in terms of how uh, the sheriff uh, can hire and, and um, fill these, these positions. So uh, if a big argument against this is public safety uh, and we'll be uh, decreasing the level of service, and I think we should at least on the other hand be prepared uh, as a county to look at ways to make sure that we do maintain the level of service if in fact uh, some of these personnel is lost. I'm hopeful that um, our sheriff's personnel will react like the other um, employees reacted, which is once they get the letter, once they see it's serious, once they understand uh, what uh, sort of the end game is, uh, they will take the opportunity to, to get uh, vaccinated. And as Supervisor Kuehl said, we give them about five chances uh, to get vaccinated. So I'm hopeful that that will be uh, the direction many of the, the, the very fine men and women who work in this department choose to uh, take. So again, I, I'm going to support this. I think it's fair to the rest of our departments uh, who have complied uh, with the vaccine policy and who actually are even um, looking to let go uh, some of their employees who have not uh, complied with this. Um, and I just don't think we can make an exception. It would really be unfair and insulting, I think, to the other um, uh, county departments and all the employees in our in our county that have, have uh, complied with this. And again, I suppose the Kuehl said it, but I just wanted to remind everybody that the, the number one cause of death in law enforcement uh, has been COVID. And, and we know that vaccinations save lives. Uh, they protect our employees and our county residents. I just got notifi notified, many of you probably already did too, just a few hours ago, uh, that the Sheriff's Department lost another uh, employee this morning to COVID. So it is real and um, I'm gonna support it, but I do think we might look at the opportunity to find ways to make sure that the staffing levels in the Sheriff's Department do meet 
uh, the demands of, of our residents. Thank you, Madam Chair. Supervisor Hahn, do you want a response from Ms. Davenport now on that or no? What, what's your desire? No, I, I think okay. that it's going to be, I, I think it, it'll be a matter of discussions that, that we all have with her going forward. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisor Solis. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and a big thank you to Supervisor Kuhl and to you for bringing the motion forward. As you recall, last summer, when I was chair of the board, I issued the executive order to put this vaccination policy in place. Uh, I did so not only to protect the workforce, but more importantly, all the vulnerable residents that we all serve. And we heard much debate about that today during the presentation earlier uh, that Dr. Ferrer gave in terms of the impacted communities that continue to uh, be impacted by COVID and the loss of life in and of itself. Um, every day, I think I, I reflect on how far we've come. And I am very proud of many of our department heads, the majority of them, quite frankly, that have been able to get their employees uh, to come to the table, to sign up, to register, to get va vaccinated and boosted. I mean, it's no small task to say that 89% of our county employees are either fully vaccinated or semi-vaccinated and with the exception of the sheriff's department. I mean, that tells you something. Um, I think that we owe it to the rest of our employees that we represent, that we provide fairness. And I think that this motion will help us address that today so that we treat everyone fairly. This was a very time consuming, laborious process that the board went through before we even implemented the policy. And we made definitely sure that our CEO and our labor management group met with our unions and there was a lot of buy-in, I have to say, from the leadership. And they said that they knew that this would be a tough row, but they were on with us. And I congratulate them for that. So here, we're not trying to punish anyone necessarily. I don't think it's that. They're still going to have a way to have their scully hearing. They're still going to have a due process hearing. In fact, they're given 45 days until we really start to talk to them. So, I mean, some people may take that seriously. Some may not. But in my opinion, we, we have people that are counting on services. And when they need to call 911 or they need to uh, find out that they need a, a public safety officer on hand because there's a, a dispute going on in their neighborhood, we certainly want our, our staff, our employees to show up and be there. And part of the question for me is, if they're not getting vaccinated and they're home sick, well, we told you so. So work with us. If we're not gonna penalize you, it's not about that. It's about just trying to provide a standard of, of evaluation and support for all of our employees. So I, I think this is a, a reasonable request and I support it. So thank you very much, uh, Supervisor Kuhl and Chairwoman uh, Mitchell for bringing it forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Supervisor Sleese. I think I would just add a, a few things. Um, as has been stated, county workers are um, frontline essential workers. And I think this board has stepped up from the very beginning before I joined you all to provide resources and support to them um, because the county continued to provide services. We had some callers in public comment asking us to come back in person. Well, you know, the reality is this board continued to meet during the peak of the pandemic. Unlike many other elected bodies that went on recess, I think this board missed two, maybe three meetings, immediately went to electronic. So this notion that you know, the county isn't working is, is false. The board is working and county departments and services are now back being provided to a county comprised of residents who need that support the most. You know, this board um, supported COVID appreciation bonus and COVID heroes pay to DHS employees as a sign of our commitment and an acknowledgement to the risk they're taking. So these actions that the board has already taken um, through the executive order initiated by then Chair Solis and today's action is an extension of our effort to continue to provide the safest work environment possible. It's also really important that every department um, comprised of county employees receives the same fair treatment and, and, and as a result should be expected and held to the same high standard of accountability. You know, as we talk about attrition, I think it's important to know, quite frankly, that the Sheriff's Department, if you look at our employee count report, colleagues, um, in the Sheriff's Department, they've had an average um, attrition rate of 3%. 
and that decrease, decrease is primarily due to attrition. And so it's not completely out of whack compared to other county departments. I think it's important that we continue to have the conversation raised by um, Supervisor Hahn, but we should really look at that department in, in the full context of all county departments. With that, seeing no other hands raised, And hearing no other comments, item 18 is before us. It is moved by Supervisor Kuehl, seconded by Supervisor Mitchell to approve the item. Executive officer, please call the roll. Item 18 is before you. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. I'm gonna abstain. Supervisor Barger abstains. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries four to zero with one abstention. Thank you. Item 58, report on the expansion of the first responder protocol and advocacy services for commercially sexually exploited children, which was held by Supervisor Kuehl. Supervisor. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I just wanted to go through this quickly because often we accept this a report and we don't really talk about it and I kind of wanted to lift it up because they're doing extraordinary work. Um, the, uh, um, the work that uh, Michelle Guyman, for instance, is doing and all the people working with her um, has resulted in this report from the Commercially Sexually Exploited Children Integrated Leadership Team. Their membership includes probation, sheriff, and DCFS. And this um, integrated leadership team consistently produces really fine reports and has had excellent success in recovering, in housing, and supporting our commercially uh, sexually exploited youth. Today's report covers four topics. Law enforcement's first responder protocol, safe youth zones, advocacy services and engagement activities, and housing for children and youth impacted by commercially sexual exploitation. Um, I had asked Michelle if she would stand by and give a report, but I think given the lateness of the hour and my deepest apologies, Michelle, to you, because I, I think uh, we have heard about uh, many of the items on the report and I think we'll need to kind of move forward. But I thank you so much for the work. Of course, if anyone has questions, um, about highlights, we can go to you. But this first responder protocol focuses on tools that law enforcement follow during the first 72 hours of interacting with a CSEC youth. Since implementation of the protocol in 2014, uh, looking through just the end of December last year, there have been a total of uh, 1,076 CSEC recoveries, 29 of which were recovered since the last report in October. Safe, safe youth zones, very important, are being expanded to include more fire departments, DPSS offices, schools, and the larger medical and public health community at which CSEC youth can go and seek protection. The expansion is a result of a motion brought by Supervisor Hahn and then a Supervisor Mark Ridley Thomas. As for advocacy services, DCFS awarded two contracts to Saving Innocence and Zoe International. Uh, the contracts were expedited thanks to a motion with you and Supervisor Barger. So thank you twice for that and thanks to Catherine as well. In terms of housing, there are three strategies underway to expand housing options. Two new CSEC requests for statement of qualifications for foster family agency emergency shelter care beds and the available short-term residential therapeutic programs, um, STRTP beds. In September of 2020, um, you and Supervisor Barger also moved that OCP, in collaboration with DCFS and probation, conduct an expedited so, uh, solicitation to vendors with known CSEC experience to increase the number of home-based placement options called intensive services foster care. Uh, the date for the release of the request for statement of qualifications been pushed back a little bit. 
Uh, there's a small chance that maybe Supervisor Berger will raise this, I don't know, uh, but it's a great housing option for CSEC youth to live in a family setting. And uh, the delay is somewhat, I think, understandable. So um, if you have any questions for Michelle, I hope you'll ask her because she's been hanging with us. Uh, but I wanted to simply present this because I'm so proud of the work that they've done and kind of lift it up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Of course, and thank you. Uh, Supervisor Barger, Supervisor Hahn, any questions or comments since she referenced your past motions? No? Okay, Supervisor Solis? All right, Supervisor Kuehl, thank you for elevating the issue around the work, the county's work, the county's leadership around CSEC. There was an op-ed in one of our dailies last week that called into question elected bodies' focus on sexual um, exploitation and sex trafficking focused around um, big sporting events. And my concern when reading that op-ed is that the general public would buy, you know, buy into that and again stop looking for or ways to help the, the tens of thousands we know here in LA County who are CSEC victims. So I appreciate you elevating this report to make sure it stays front and center on our minds and the general public that we do have a child sex trafficking problem in LA County that must, when we must remain vigilant in protecting them. Seeing no further questions or comments, um, this report is received and filed, and such will be the order. Thank you again, Supervisor Kuehl. Item 69C, report on AT&T technical issues experienced during our January 25th, 2022 board meeting, uh, which I held. I wanted to make sure that we had the opportunity to hear directly from um, our executive officer about in short, what happened and what we're going to do to make sure it doesn't happen again. You know, uh, we were told that AT&T believes that this is the first time that such a glitch like this happened. Um, and uh, the executive office and our own internal services department has worked tirelessly in collaboration with AT&T to really try to diagnose the issue and make sure that if any kind of quote unquote glitch were to occur, that we have appropriate fallback protocols in place that we could pivot immediately to not alter the public's ability to access this. But with that, um, I'd like to offer uh, an opportunity for the executive officer to give us a report. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good afternoon, supervisors. Um, during the 20, January 25th board meeting, AT&T had technical issues on the call-in line for the regular agenda items that could not be read, read many in real time. Some members of the public wanting, uh, waiting in the queue to address the board were unable to hear the audio broadcast of the meeting that is generally piped into the teleconference. These constituents were unaware when it was their turn to speak, causing delays. Additionally, for those who choose to listen to the meeting on a secondary device, an echo resulted when it was their turn to speak and their line was unmuted. My office has been in constant contact with AT&T since the January 25th meeting to identify the root cause of the audio issue. After extensive review, it has been determined that the audio issues caused by a rare software detected in AT&T network and were not related to any county operations or system. AT&T has developed a code to fix these issues, which would be fully developed. Additionally, AT&T has provided a standby line, which will be activated in the main line if it calls fails. Callers on the failing line will be redirected to call in to the standby line. This will require a brief recess to allow callers to call the new line and for AT&T to recover the speaker cues. In the event uh, we have to utilize the standby line, instructions for callers will be announced to speak in the queue posted on our website, social media, and live stream. We will also provide the new telephone uh, number to each of your office in case you receive calls from members of the public. Um, your board has also requested that my office provides measures to clearly distinguish public hearing items and regular agenda items to alleviate the confusion expressed by the members of the public wishing to address these items. To address this confusion, moving forward, we will spell out set matter as opposed to abbreviating. For example, on today's agenda, S1 is now set matter one. Also, we will 
number items after the uh, set matter sequentially. For example, following the set matter one and set matter two, the next item or public hearing item will be listed as agenda item number three, as seen in today's agenda. Um, lastly, we will move the special district agendas to the back of the regular agenda to further distinguish items. For additional clarification, we will have two distinct call-in numbers, one for the regular agenda items and one for the public hearing items with two separate access code. This will be published in the agenda and posted online. Phone lines will be open 15 minutes earlier and callers will be able to speak in the speaker queue immediately beginning at 9 a.m. Further, at and T will announce instructions to the speaker queue more frequently. We hope by putting these above measures in place, we will help enhance our constituent engagement with the board meetings. My office will continue to review and enhance our board meeting process to ensure a, a more seamless process so that members of the public are able to fully participate in the board meetings. Thank you. I want to thank the executive officer and uh, your team in the internal services department for doing that work. Any questions of board meeting members? Okay, seeing none, again, this report is received and filed and such will be the Chair, order. I, I didn't raise my hand soon enough. I just want to oh. say thank you for this. And I was just thinking sitting here, you know, we've been doing this now for a while. And overall, you know, I, I think we've mostly done a good job accommodating um, our, our uh, public and it was unfortunate that this happened but I will say I think we've come a long way I remember there was a time when you know we weren't even being shown on camera and at least now we're doing that I mean I look forward to someday getting back in person but I will say it's been a yeoman's job really to virtually um, bring our meetings our discussions uh, our votes our public comment uh, you know, to make sure everybody feels welcome. And I do believe we've done that. And I always appreciate when we give extra time for public comment, I think that's right. And I, I just wanted to say, this is like the first time I remember something like going badly. And I appreciate all the work that has gone into uh, bringing our meetings uh, virtually to, to our public, so. Thank you, thank Supervisor you. Hahn. I couldn't agree with you more. Absolutely, thank you so much. Seeing no other hands, I don't know why my boxes of you all got so tiny. Let me make it bigger. Okay, great. We'll now move uh, into specials, um, and I'd like to read in two motions, colleague. The first is a report back on conditions at Juvenile Hall. The Probation Oversight Commission's recent facility inspections report sheds light on the poor conditions at the county's juvenile halls. Given the county's obligation to ensure safe and healthy living conditions for the youth in our care, the board really should hear an update on the probation department's efforts to address these issues. With that, I'd like to read in the motion that places a briefing on the board's February 15th meeting agenda. I therefore move that the Board of Supervisors instruct the Chief Probation Officer or his designee and the Executive Director of the Probation Oversight Commission to come before the Board of Supervisors at our next meeting, February 15th, to provide an update on the conditions at LA County's juvenile halls. In number two, it instructs the Chief Probation Officer in consultation with the Executive Director of the POC to report back in writing in 30 days with an update on efforts to address the issues identified in the POC's annual facility inspection for 2021 pertaining to conditions in juvenile halls. This item is before us. And so there's no vote necessary. Yes, I skip down. All right, are there any other comments or questions around this read-in? There's no objection, this item will be placed on the next board agenda. Thank you, colleagues. The second read-in motion um, is dealing with a bomb threat at one of our very own institutions. Today, I bring forward an offer 
of two rewards in two separate bomb threat incidents targeting the campus community of Charles R. Drew University. These threats are part of a deeply disturbing national trend of threats of violence against historically black colleges and universities, referred to as HBCUs. It has forced members of these campus communities, students, educators, visitors, employees, all innocent people, to live in fear for their safety at work or school. I urge anyone with information on these horrific crimes to come forward. And with that, I'd like to read in the following directive. Therefore, move that the Board of Supervisors establish the offer of a reward in the amount of $20,000 in exchange for information leading to the apprehension and or conviction of the persons responsible for the heinous bomb threat directed toward Charles R. Drew University, located on East 120th Street in the unincorporated area of Willowbrook on January 11, 2022. Number two, establish the offer of a reward in the amount of $20,000 in exchange for information leading to the apprehension or convic conviction of persons responsible for the heinous bomb threat directed towards Charles R. Drew University, 1731 East 120th Street in the unincorporated area of Willowbrook on January 31st, 2022 at approximately 11.45 p.m. Are there any questions or comments about this read-in? Seeing none, I'll move and ask that it be seconded by Supervisor Hahn to approve this item. Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 71A, the established re a reward offered in the bomb threats at Charles Drew University is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. At this time, colleagues, it would be appropriate to hear adjournments in memory. We will begin with Supervisor Hahn, and the order today will be Supervisorial Districts 4, 5, 1. I have none for today, and we will end with District 3, beginning with District 4. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam uh, Chair. I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of Marie Katnick, a uh, longtime resident of San Pedro who was 91 when she passed away. Marie was a member of San Pedro Cancer Guild, Toberman, Little Sisters of the Poor, and the Assistance League of San Pedro. She will be remembered for uh, showering those around her with love, faith, and wisdom. Marie was preceded in death by her husband, Roy, and three sons. She was survived by her remaining three sons, 13 grandchildren, 24 great-grandchildren, and five great-great-grandchildren. Um, Marie was Terry Katnick's stepmother, uh, and we here in San Pedro uh, know and love Terry uh, very much, and we send uh, him our deepest condolences. Uh, also move that when we adjourn, adjourn today, we adjourn the memory of Michael Wainwright, who was a longtime uh, resident of Watts. And I didn't know Supervisor Mitchell if you wanted to join me on this. Uh, I, I knew Michael for all my years uh, when I served, uh, when I represented Watts, uh, both in the city council and in Congress. He, he was a longtime resident. He was 73 when he passed away. He served the Watts community for many years and was the founder of the Neighborhood Youth Achievers Jobs Program. He was truly dedicated to the youth and was a mentor, a friend. He was a confidant to many. He'll be remembered for his leadership and commitment to provide summer jobs for the youth in the community um, every single year. And for you know, a lot of people, uh, we all grew up taking summer jobs as sort of a rite of passage. Like there was always summer jobs that were available. Well, they became scarce. Uh, you know, about 20 years ago, and uh, it became a big issue for uh, the city of Los Angeles, particularly, to try and get uh, money and different uh, corporations to agree to providing opportunities for summer jobs for many of our young people. Michael was relentless when it came to summer jobs. He, you know, would follow me to my car after a meeting and just demand on where I was in the progress of getting more summer jobs for the young people in Watts. I worked with him when I was on the city council. 
uh, when I was in Congress, but particularly uh, as we served together with the Watts uh, Gang Task Force. Uh, he was such a, he was one of the founding members. Uh, he was also the one that uh, walked up to me on a Saturday in Watts after we'd had seven, uh, seven murders uh, in Watts one Christmas. And uh, that was the Christmas that, uh, that people would comment that many of the kids were not coming out of their house on Christmas Day to play with their new toys because the violence had been had increased so much. And Michael followed me out to my car again and said, what was I doing about it? And at that point, I didn't have a good answer. So I said, well, let's gather together the community. Let's gather together uh, the faith-based community, the school-based community, community members, uh, the our law enforcement partners, and let's pledge to meet once a week in my Watts uh, office, and let's see what we can do. The Watts Gang Task Force was formed. Michael was one of the founding members um, and was diligent in making sure that even when things got tense or when things, when people were misunderstanding each other, uh, he insisted that we stay in the room together and, and solve the problems of, of that great community. So he will be missed. He won't be forgotten. He leaves behind many many loved ones and friends and I consider myself one of those. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Hanan, for allowing me to, to join you in, in that. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, I also have a couple others. Um, I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of Roger Class, who was 82 when he passed away. He was a resident of Rancho Palos Verdes. He was the owner of Class Termite and Pest Control. Class Termite proudly serviced the South Bay for over 45 years. Roger loved sports and was a coach for the Palos Verdes Peninsula Girls Softball League, Bogdanovich Recreation Center Basketball League, and the Palos Verdes Basketball Association. Roger also participated in the annual New Year's, New Year's Day Cabrillo Beach Polar Bear Plunge, uh, which uh, I have been also uh, a tortured part of that event uh, for, uh, again, over 20 years. And um, it was something that he really was proud of and looked forward to. He's survived by his wife, Luana, daughter Kelly, and his brother, Ken. I also uh, move that when we adjourn, we adjourn in the memory of Terry Rogers, who was um, who passed away uh, this past Monday. Uh, he To say she was an active member of the Signal Hill community is an understatement. In addition to serving as Signal Hill Parks and Recreation Commissioner, Terry also volunteered her time on several other boards, including the Signal Hill Police Foundation, the Signal Hill Community Foundation, the Signal Hill Chamber of Commerce, where she was president from 2010 to 2015, the Signal Hill Historical Society, and Friends of the Signal Hill Library. Her community service also extended to the Signal Hill Rotary, the Salvation Army, and Rock for Vets Music is the Remedy. The city of Signal Hill released a statement on Terry's passing and called her a longtime champion of the city who gave so much of her time to the community. She will be dearly missed. Candlelight vigil will be held for Terry on Wednesday, February 23rd at the Signal Hill Amphitheater. She will be missed and made such a difference with the life that she lived. I also move that when we adjourn, we adjourn today in the memory of Tom Reese Sr., who was 83 when he passed away. Tom joined the Air Force right out of high school. And after completing his military service, he worked as an aeronautical engineer for Northrop Grumman. He was a man of deep faith who volunteered his time helping serve those in need through the Christian service program at St. Margaret Mary Catholic Church in Lomita. He survived by his sons, Thomas, Michael, Paul, and Dominic, his daughter, Sister Bernadette, Mary, and seven grandchildren. And I also move, when we adjourn, we adjourn the memory of Antonio Ringor. Tony was a longtime resident of San Pedro. He was 89 when he passed away. Another beloved, beloved community leader. He served the Harbor Area community for decades, volunteering his time to organizations such as the San Pedro Community Garden, the LA Maritime Institute, Friends of Danny's Landing and the Wilmington Neighborhood Council. He was a lifetime member of the Filipino community of the Los Angeles Harbor area and was a member of the San Pedro and Peninsula Chambers of Commerce 
and the Association of Filipino American Arts and Culture. I worked closely with Tony uh, from, again, from my days on the city council uh, uh, and his wife, Angelita, uh, for, for so, so many years. He will be greatly missed by our community. He also, uh, in my opinion, was one of my dear friends and uh, lived such an incredible life. He's survived by his wife, Angelita, and his son, Tony Jr. Thank you, Madam Chair. Those are my adjournments. Thank you very much, Supervisor Hahn. Our esteemed chair uh, had to leave, and so I'm taking over uh, just for these last few minutes. It's nice that we can always say Madam Chair, no matter which one of us takes over. I know it's always Madam Chair. So, Madam Supervisor Barger, you're next. Thank you. I move that when we adjourn today, we do so in memory of Mario Ernest Aquilakni, a longtime resident of New Hall who passed away on December 9, 2021, just four days short of his 99th birthday. He was born in Abruzzi, Italy in 1922. He immigrated with his family as a toddler to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where he grew up. He enlisted in the United States Army Air Corps at the age of 17 and at the start of World War II. He served as an air operations specialist. He received an honorable discharge in November of 1945. He returned to Philadelphia to earn his high school diploma and work on, in his parents' deli grocery store. He moved to Northridge, California and worked in the meat department in a local supermarket. With his third wife, he relocated to New Hall and together they enjoyed their love of music and dance at the Santa Clarita Senior Center. Mario was survived by his wife, Mercedes, his two daughters, Alicia and Linda, and a stepson, Eric. Also, I move that we adjourn in memory of Warren R. Brooks III, a local dentist and the husband of KABC anchor, Giovanna Lara, who recently passed away after a battle with cancer. Randy, as he was affectionately known, completed his undergraduate studies at USC and then received his doctor of dental surgery from Howard University. He completed his general practice and oral surgery residency program at Martin Luther King Jr. Harbor Hospital. Randy was his engaged and supportive father that did everything from coaching soccer to leading Boy Scout meetings and helping his kids with their school projects. He was a joyous figure and a staple in the community who was known for his Halloween decorations and his passion for the LA Lakers. Randy survived by his wife, Giovanna, and their four children. Also that we adjourn in memory of Martine Collette, who passed away on January 23rd at the age of 79 after a battle with lung cancer. Born in France, she was the daughter of a Belgian diplomat and lived most of her childhood in Nairobi, Nairobi, Kenya. She later worked in trapping camps where lions and other exotic animals were taken before being shipped off to zoos. She said she was appalled at the conditions the animals were forced to endure. She moved to Los Angeles to pursue a career as a Hollywood costume designer, but her personal interest in animals followed her to Los Angeles. Martine first rescued a mountain lion confined to a small cage at an animal show at the old Pan Pacific Auditorium in Los Angeles. Soon she had a yard full of animals, spurring her to move to Little Tahunga Canyon Road, where she opened the Wildlife Way Station in 1976. Her first residents were a young chimpanzee whose parents had been confined to a research lab. A lion born at the way station after the rescue of 27 lions and tigers from a compound in Idaho where the animals lived in misery and a baby chimp who roamed freely in her house. Under her vision, the 160 acre sanctuary stood as a model for rescuing exotic animals abandoned by impetuous owners, traveling roadside attractions and research labs. While she was it's one woman tour de force, and we all know that. And I know, Sheila, you're going to say something. Leading rescue missions and charming Hollywood celebrities into supporting her cause. She became a commanding voice for more robust legislation to regulate exotic animal ownership, particularly those inclined to bring in animals from the wild for their personal collections. The sanctuary has been credited with saving more than 70,000 animals. Martine was named 
a designated animal expert for the city of Los Angeles, as was and was honored by the California Department of Fish and Wild Game and the California State Assembly for her years of service. When her facility closed in 2019, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife stepped in to oversee the care and relocation of more than 470 animals, including lions, tigers, wolves, owls, alligators, and the chimps. Now only two hybrid wolf dogs and 16 chimps are waiting for new homes at the sanctuary with the support of California Fish and Game. She will be remembered as an enthusiastic evangelist for wild animals who was strong-willed and sometimes a bit stubborn. She said her lone interest was improving the lives of animals. She passed away surrounded by friends. And one of her final remarks was, soon I will be walking with the tigers. Supervisor Kill, you wanted to say something? Uh, thank you very much. I think we uh, had a tussle over now that we've got slightly different districts whose district she lived in. So, and it's worth fighting over because what an extraordinary woman. Um, you really nailed it, um, Catherine, because she was uh, one of a kind. And there are very few people, you know, it's kind of easy to say, I'm, you know, I'm taking care of stray cats and I'm taking care of stray dogs. And there's a lot of great work being done. But a lot of people didn't really understand how it was that she was so devoted to these animals. And yet when she would explain how they would be mistreated, you know, treated as though they were some kind of uh, a fancy circus show or whatever, um, it was very compelling. She really, really did um, such amazing work with them. And, and uh, it's gonna be very hard to fill all the, all the jobs really that she undertook. So bless her heart and bless her memory. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, well said. And last but not least, I move that when we adjourn today, we do so in memory of Dorothy Marie Hall, who passed away on January 27th at the age of 96. Dorothy was a longtime resident of Monrovia and the mother of Monrovia Arcadia Dwarty Town Council President David Hall. She was born on February 19th, 1925 in Hines County, Mississippi. She was the second oldest of five children. She was an excellent student who progressed through school quickly. By the age of 16, she was attending Jackson State University. It was at Jackson State where she met the one college student who would become the love of her life. Dorothy and Ambrose Milton Hall were married on May 29, 1943 and had six children. In June of 1949, the family moved to Monrovia. Over the next three decades, Dorothy and Reverend Hall would immerse themselves in the fight for civil rights, voters' rights, and the end of racial inequities that plagued their community. She worked side by side with her husband as he took on the role of president of the Monrovia Dwarty chapter of the NAACP. Dorothy embraced and spearheaded many roles within the community and even organized voting booth locations at her own home and within the homes of other community leaders during the 60s to make sure that every resident had voting access. Because of her activism, she didn't think twice before accepting employment within the Monrovia Unified School District as a Title IV program liaison in the 1970s, the Title IV program in the 1970s. The Title IV program was developed as a conduit to help mend racial issues within the city and the surrounding communities. It wasn't until Reverend, the Reverend's death in January of 1986 that Dorothy decided to retire from the community activism. But it wasn't unusual for her to find a front seat at a school board meeting or other community action event where she would voice her thoughts and her opinions well into her 90s. She enjoyed spending time with her family. She especially loved visits from her grandchildren and whenever possible, she would be right in the mix of any graduation ceremony, birthday celebration, wedding, or other milestone being celebrated by her loved ones. Dorothy found great joy in participating in the church until her death, or sorry, until her health prevented her from attending in person. She spent her last years worshiping at the All Saints Seventh-day Adventist Church in Monrovia. Dorothy survived by her children, David Hall, Linda Smith, Adrian Marie Hall, sister Pearl White, 18 grandchildren, 38 great-grandchildren, 
15 great-great-grandchildren, and a host of beloved nieces, nephews, cousins, and friends. She will be dearly missed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, next is Supervisor Solis. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Congressman Esteban E. Torres. He was born in Miami, Arizona, and eventually moved with his family to East Los Angeles, where he attended local schools, proudly graduating from Garfield High School in 1949. Following high school, he enlisted in the U.S. Army during the Korean War and was honorably discharged with the rank of Sergeant First Class. In the late 1950s, he began working as an assembly line worker at the Chrysler plant in Maywood, California, and became an active member of the United Auto Workers UAW Union. And in 1958, he was elected as Chief Steward of UAW Local 230. He then rose through the ranks of UAW, serving as an organizer for the Western region of the United States, then as UAW International Representative in Washington, D.C. And from 1964 to 1968, he was UAW's Inter-American Bureau for Caribbean and Latin American Affairs. And then in 1977, President Jimmy Carter appointed Torres as the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization known as UNESCO in Paris. And from 1979 until 1981, Torres served as White House Special Assistant for Hispanic Affairs under President Carter. And at the same time that I was interning with him in his office, I served as editor-in-chief of the White House Office for Hispanic Affairs and later as a full-time staff assistant. He has endorsed and supported me in every single race for public office dating back to 1984. From my first campaign at Rio Hondo College, Board of Trustees, to the State Assembly, to the State Senate, and Congress. And I know he was very proud when I was appointed by President Barack Obama as the Labor Secretary, something that he often sought of for himself. I, of course, would have the honor of representing many of the same communities that he represented. He was known as a fierce advocate for working class families and veterans. Amongst his proudest accomplishments was being one of the founders of La Plaza de Cultura y Artes, a world-renowned museum honoring the past, inspiring the future and recognizing the cultural influence of Mexicans, Mexican Americans, and all Latinos in greater Los Angeles County. He also was an accomplished artist. His art was featured in the Washingtonian magazine at numerous galleries throughout Los Angeles and admired by his colleagues in Congress, friends, and family. He's survived by his lovely wife, Arcy, and their five children, 12 grandchildren and seven great-grandchildren. May he rest in peace. Um, Supervisor Solis, I would like to join you on that one for Esteban. Me too. I think um, he had a just very distinguished career. Uh, Supervisor Barger, do you think, would it be all read if it was all of us? The four of us? Okay. Thank yes, you. please. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And lastly, Madam Chair, I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Consuelo Hermosillo. She was one of the original plaintiffs in the Madrigal versus Killian lawsuit which attempted to garner justice for the women who were coerced and forced into sterilization at the LAC USC Medical Center between 1968 and 1974. The women's cases were very similar. Each had an emergency cesarean section and each said she was either unaware that she signed for a tubal leg legation or was told by medical professional staff that not signing one could mean death of her or her unborn child. The tremendous physical and emotional emotional harm to Consuelo and other women and their families in our communities will never fade. And while no amount of money will ever fully be enough to account for the terrible experiences these women endured, I authored a motion last year urging state leaders to provide reparations to survivors, helping to ease financial burdens that they may be experiencing. A civic artwork now stands at LEC USC campus that will remind current and future generations of the past injustice that will be unveiled this year. Today, we'll remember and honor the life of Consuelo and the many other women affected by this tragedy. May she rest in peace. Thank you, Madam Chair. That concludes my adjournments. Thank you, Supervisor Solis. I'm sorry. I thought I heard somebody talk. Uh, thank you very much. Um,
I think Holly said she didn't have any uh, adjournments, so I'll just move to the third district. Um, and I have three. Uh, I ask that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Richard Close, a lawyer and San Fernando Valley community leader who died on January 24th. After graduating from Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania and Boston University's School of Law, he moved to LA to practice law. His practice focused on all aspects of land use entitlement, administrative and regulatory law, project development and financing, manufactured housing communities and governmental relations and advocacy. He was a leader in the legal, political and business communities recognized in each of those areas for creating opportunities and uh, exercising astute judgment as well as his shrewd negotiating skills. His unique multifaceted career enveloped his insight for the benefits of his clients. Outside of his legal career, he was an influential community leader in, in the San Fernando Valley. He joined the Sherman Oaks Homeowners Association in the 1970s and began working closely to pass Prop 13. Needless to say, we did not agree at the time, but that ballot initiative that limited property tax increases got its start in the Valley. After Howard Jarvis, the initiative's chief sponsor, attended a Sherman Oaks Homeowners Association meeting in 1977. Richard became president of the Sherman Oaks Homeowners, where he held the position for more than 40 years. Under his leadership, it became one of the most influential homeowner groups in Los Angeles, pushing anti-tax and anti-density initiatives that helped retain the suburban character of the Valley's neighborhoods. He also supported Proposition U, a ballot measure passed in 1986 that slowed development and targeted commercial boulevards in the South San Fernando Valley and the West Side. Nobody could question his love for his community and the San Fernando Valley, and that allowed him to become instrumental in advancing the interests of the Valley in efforts to obtain more governmental services from the city of LA. He helped turn the Sherman Oaks neighborhood group into a necessary stop for politicians and candidates. At the forums, politicians were quizzed by members on everything from potholes to pension reform. A free dinner, perhaps spaghetti, also came with the questions. Richard will, will be remembered by a whole panoply of LA politicians on both sides of the political party aisle as a leader who helped them understand that the San Fernando Valley felt marginalized and left out of a lot of political decisions. Tall and unassuming, he was unafraid to speak candidly about an LA politician's shortcomings, either to a newspaper reporter or in the Sherman Oaks Homeowner Association newsletter. In an interview with the Jewish, Jewish Journal, he said, political party affiliation is not important to me, it's issues that are important to me, and I've never been involved with political parties. Um, I had the benefit of <clears throat> serving with him off and on at LAFCO. I think others uh, did as well because we've sort of taken turns on LAFCO and he was definitely a force and a gentleman. Uh, he survived by his wife, Sally, and their two children, Matthew and Abby. Uh, Can we on that? Would that be okay? Can we join you, Sheila? Yeah, absolutely, everybody wanna join in? Yes, I served with him on LAFCO. We were yeah. on different sides on the secession issue, but uh, I did serve with him for several years on LAFCO. So absolutely, I'd like to join you. All right, nice job. Let's make it all four of us. Hilda. Were yeah, you good. No, no, I just I just thought he was a gentleman and uh, always very kind uh, to everyone and respectful, and that's something that stands out these days. So yes, thank you. Yeah, it was a fine man, really. All right, then all of us will join in. <clears throat> adjourning for Richard Close. And I also move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Rosalind Block, who died on February 3rd. She was born to Russian immigrants in Boston, started quite an interesting life at an early age. At the age of 15, she became the youngest student ever admitted to Brandeis University. She went on to finish her BA and her MSW at Berkeley, and then received her doctorate in social work at SC in 1974. 
She had a rich and productive career in social work and mental health, often sought after as a skilled psychotherapist, consultant, professor, writer, and speaker. A leader in her field, she broke the glass ceiling in 1975 by becoming the first female director of Jewish Family Services in Los Angeles. She taught at the UCLA School of Social Welfare, the USC School of Social Work, Hebrew Union College, the Wright Institute, the LA Institute and Society for Psychoanalytic Studies, and the California Graduate Institute, where she was voted Teacher of the Year in 1995. She was a pioneering teacher and researcher on the impact of climate change on a person's and a society's mental health. And she presented her work in this area at national and international conferences. As a highly regarded psychotherapist, she continued to practice and help families and couples and individual patients all the way through to last year. She published many papers in professional journals and edited volumes of scholarly work. Best known for the book she co-wrote with her husband, who was a Holocaust survivor, called Unfree Associations, a psychoanalytic, uh, a psychoanalyst recollects the Holocaust. Throughout her long and dynamic career, she continued to advocate for strong social and mental health services. She consulted professionally at many agencies, including the VA's Psychiatric Hospital in Brentwood, Jewish Family and Children's Services, St. Joseph's Seminary in Camarillo, and Airport Marina Counseling Service in LA. She also represented the Academy for Jewish Religion and interviewed prospective students looking to become rabbinical candidates and cantors. She was active on, on several boards, most recently the advisory committee of the UCLA Division of Internal Geriatric Medicine. She survived by her husband, John. And finally, uh, colleagues, I ask that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Sigmund Burke, who died on February 2nd. He was a proud Holocaust survivor, an accomplished structural engineer, a self-taught violinist, and a deep lover of history and current events, an intelligent and articulate man who had quite a gift for storytelling and for teaching. He was married to his wife, Edith, for 47 years. They were both Holocaust survivors from Hungary who met in Sweden post-war, made a rich lives, life for themselves and their families, despite all the horrors they had experienced. He'll be remembered as a caring father and grandfather who modeled a life of decency, honesty, and diligence. He's survived by his three children, Bob, David, and Robin. Those are my adjournments. Um, Colleagues will take all of the uh, motions for adjournment as seconded and approved unanimously. That will be the action. And I believe that brings our business today to a close. We have no closed session. Uh, the next regular meeting of this board will be um, the next Tuesday, uh, February 25th. February, uh, February 15th. 15th, sorry. See, I don't have anything written down because I didn't know I was chairing. February 15th. Uh, at 9.30. Thank you very, very much. Thanks to all of our staff. And we'll see you next Tuesday. We are- Feliz cumpleaños. Enjoy, enjoy the whole week though. Milk it all week. Hey, it's Sheila. Extra. Absolutely, Sheila must. Everybody yeah. celebrate. <laughs> Feliz cumpleaños. Thank you so much. Good care. Right. Happy birthday, Supervisor. Thank you Bye. all. Bye-bye.